Good evening. This is Kathleen Causey, Chairwoman of the Board of Education. I now call to order the Board of Education of Baltimore County meeting for Tuesday, October 13th, 2020. Please rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance alongside of two BCPS students, Tatum and Simon. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Tatum and Simon. And now we're going to take a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served Baltimore County. Good evening. In accordance with the mandated uh, direction of the uh, state superintendent, the Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public for, non, for essential staff in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting in its, <clears throat> excuse me, that a board meeting or a board committee meeting may be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members subject to the establishment of a mechanism that it would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present. And that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held remotely and it is broadcast through live stream on the BCPS website and on the Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making a motion or in bringing up items of discussion. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the October 13th agenda. And I would like to uh, request a motion to add agenda item 02, board consideration of amended resolution COVID-19 in order to hold hybrid meetings. Is there a motion? Ms. Causey, I'll second, I'll make that move. And I'll Thank second. You. Who's the second? Ms. Head. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Excuse me, Mr. Mahunta? Mr. Mahunta? Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jones? <laughs> Ms. Jones? Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Mahomza in? Ms. Jones? Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries in accordance with board policy 8314, where there needs to be a majority vote of the board to add or remove an item from the agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any other additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Excuse me, this is Ms. Scott. Can you hear me okay? We just now can, yes. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I didn't hear a response from Dr. Williams, but um, I wanted to see if we could add, or I wanted to make a motion that we set and confirm 
the Board of Education agenda before the announcements for approximately five minutes at each board meeting, um, beginning with today's board meeting and um, each board meeting thereafter. I'm Second. sorry, Scott, could you, could you state that again, please? Yes, um, I move that we set and confirm the Board of Education agenda that we do setting at each board meeting right before announcements for five minutes and um, that we do that each board meeting starting with this board meeting um, and each one thereafter. I'm sorry to do this, Ms. Scott, but you did fade out in the very beginning. Oh, I faded out? I'm sorry. I, yes, I'm sorry. I could not hear the beginning of your statement. Okay. Um, I'll repeat it again. I just moved that we do agenda setting at each board meeting, at each full board meeting and open session for five minutes uh, before the announcements at um, towards the end of each board meeting um, for this board meeting and each one thereafter. Point of order. Point of order, Ms. Causey, the motion is contrary to established and approved board agenda setting policy. I don't have the policy number off the top of my head, but we can't make motions to change policy. It has to go through the policy setting process. Well, um, I have, I've been reading Robert's rules and I saw that we can do proposed agenda setting at a full board meeting. It's um, If you have a Robert's rules of orders in brief, it's on page 120, question number four. Thank Robert's you for rules that, also Ms. says that our policies override Robert's rules, and this is a policy that we have that overrides Robert's rules. What is so, the name? Excuse me, Miss Scott. Excuse me, Miss Scott. Excuse me, Miss Scott, and and Miss Rowe. So um, we are uh, starting our meeting um, behind, and we also have a full agenda, notwithstanding that. Uh, we do also have um, Miss Scott, as you know as a member of the uh, policy review committee that we are currently revising and reviewing board policy 8314 and 8311, which speak to calling meetings and setting agendas for meetings. So I think um, rather than try and make a, uh, uh, a change this evening, as Ms. Rowe points out, um, that is not consistent with policy, um, I think if you could just restate your motion to have it be for this meeting, and then in the policy review committee, you could bring up the suggestion of adding that to the standard items for agenda. So I would I, I would ask uh, I would ask you to restate your motion. Certainly, and I would ask which policy is it that we are referencing that I have that is um, superseding Robert's rules. Ms. Policy eighty three fourteen. Eighty three fourteen. Okay. And then uh, yes. And, and that's the uh, agenda setting an open session. Excuse me? That policy po states that we do. That the we policies do speak to the specific standing agenda items. But I would believe so that's what, Rose, that there is a point of order that we do not do um, policy or, uh, excuse me, agenda setting an open session. And so I was wondering which policy okay. specifically spoke to that. So what, you, what the motion of you saying that you want to add an agenda item to this meeting and to all meetings moving forward um, is in contradiction to what is currently in the policy for standard agenda setting. So I think that if you want to um, have something for this meeting and then in policy review committee, you can bring up adding that item to policy 8314 for the long term, uh, that that would be the proper way to do this. We are now 50 minutes into our agenda. So I would suggest making that, I, that that's my suggestion. Okay. I'm seconding Ms. Scott's motion to add to the agenda. This is okay. Molly. So Ms. Scott, if you would like to restate your motion. Certainly, um, I will restate my motion that we do agenda setting. I move that we set and confirm the agenda um, for the next Board of Education meeting um, right before the announcements for five minutes at the end of this board meeting, October 13th. 
This is Kazi, you're on mute. Thank you. Ms. Joes, were you the second? Yes, I seconded that motion. Okay, so you agree with that language? Yes. Thank you. Board members, is there any discussion? I would yeah. like, um, Ms. Kazi, I would like to add to it since I had my hand up. You know, one of the first orders of business when this board came in on December 2018 was to revise policy H314 that a board member can add or amend the agenda by a majority of the vote. Until then, it was unanimous. So this works both ways. When certain members of the board feel that their voices are being silenced, it's important that um, they get this voice to add to the agenda item. And there has been precedents where, uh, you know, certain members have asked to add things to the agenda and it's been ignored. Also, you have the Open Meeting Act's violation when you ask things in email. So I think what Ms. Scott's motion does is it simply adds, uh, well, to this meeting as well, and as a standing item maybe that needs to revise policy, is that we can have a five-minute agenda setting to every meeting. So every, it goes around the dais and everybody gets a voice. And I think that's just fair. We are a body of 12, not just one and two. And she is correct in that Robert's rules is clear that the chair or vice chair don't set the agenda. They simply facilitate it. It has to be voice of 12 people. And um, I, for one, I know want to make this agenda more about children and less about uh, things that are not about children. So uh, other board members, Ms. Hen? Ms. Hen, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. Thank you. I was going to ask Dr. Williams to comment. Sorry, I'm getting an echo if somebody can go on mute if they're not speaking. I was going to ask Dr. Williams to chime in here as far as the logistics because superintendent staff prepare a draft agenda um, for each meeting which they bring to board officers, which we discuss and take into consideration all board members' requests. In fact, um, all board members' requests are considered and most of them honored at each meeting. So the fact that um, Ms. Joes commented that board members' requests aren't considered, that is not true. Um, we do factor those in and by and large, those requests are honored um, where there is time. We honor requests that are brought to the floor when no advance notice is given. And it is the rare exception that requests are not honored. So um, those are the facts. Those are the truth. And the okay. well, I'll tell you the truth. Excuse too, Ms. Hen, since you're addressing me. Excuse me, Ms. Jones, it's not your turn. Ms. Hen, the floor. And I would ask Dr. Williams to comment on the logistics of agenda planning because a lot of work goes into that and staff prepare a draft agenda, which the officers do consider. But we take into um, consideration all board members' requests when we do so. So it is not just the officers providing input. Thank you. Well, Dr. on the Williams, record, since Ms. Hen has addressed me, I will address that to her directly since she likes to grandstand. I have asked. the meeting what I can't hear the meeting what happened I can't hear anything sorry so Miss Hen is grand so I'm excuse gonna respond me, to no, her excuse me excuse me Miss Joes you do not have the floor Dr. Williams has the floor Dr. Williams would you like to respond to uh, Miss Hen's comments please so if i was following what was being shared there is an agenda setting session that we have where uh, we receive input from board members we also look at certain events that happen that are routine or annually that the board needs to uh, discuss and we plan that accordingly however um, when we get to this section and there are additions, you know, the staff will do its best to be prepared. Um, as you recall, that has happened several times. And so we are happy to do what's necessary for the entire, whatever the full board wants us to do, we can do. 
Um, so I'm, I just want to clarify, there is an agenda setting. We do set an agenda. We do keep a, a list of topics that board members want to discuss. We kind of make a decision whether it's, it should go through the committee first, then to the full board. However, it's, it's whatever the full board wants us to do that we will accommodate. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And then we have Ms. Mack, Ms. Scott, and then back to Ms. Joes. And I would just ask the board members to please be mindful because we'll take the vote and that will uh, determine. Uh, Ms. Mack, quickly then. We can't hear you. Did I would not support this motion. We as a board cannot do anything in five minutes as evidenced by the fact that we're almost an hour late starting this meeting. Um, I have submitted items um, that have not gotten put on the board agenda and I've submitted them again. And I actually provided input that I did not believe we as board members should, we should limit the number of times that we bring up surprise uh, items for meet uh, meetings because it puts staff at a disadvantage. It puts board members at a disadvantage because the meeting goes even longer and people are not prepared to discuss topics. So I would never support this. Ms. Scott. Thank you for that. Um, and I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I yes. appreciate everyone's great. I appreciate everyone's feedback um, and a robust debate on um, the subject. My intention with bringing this up was to make sure that all board members feel included. And I feel that there have been times when I've heard from board members who felt that their voices were not heard and that they were not included. And I feel that in the interest of transparency, we as a board should be more transparent, not less transparent. So as a um, uh, sort of a solution to that, I thought that it was something that we could explore and vote on having agenda setting in um, at our meetings at the uh, towards the end of the meeting that members could um, make suggestions on what they would like to see added to the um, next agenda and do that in the public so that our, our public uh, students our teachers everyone could see what we what our focus is how we are planning the agenda and open transparent and I don't think that it's too much to ask of board members to be able to think on their feet and to speak succinctly and clearly and suggest something for the agenda and I don't think it's too much to ask for staff to be able to then in turn prepare that for the next board meeting that would be several days later. So that is where the motion is coming from, and it's in the spirit of transparency, inclusion, making sure that all 12 members feel like they have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Scott. And with that, we have heard from everyone at least once. No, here we go. Miss, uh, excuse me, Dr. Hager, please. I just wanted to say that I think it's worth trying today because it's before we change the policy, we can see how it goes, and so I will vote for it because I figure it's worth worth a shot today to see how it goes and then we can see whether it's worth incorporating into policy in the future. Thank you for that input. Ms. Gover, can I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Uh, Kathleen, I was, Kathy, I was muted when I was talking. So I believe this is the kind of stuff Ms. Scott and I have been talking about, women of color in particular being muted, not allowed our voice. I was addressing Ms. Hen, who attacked me personally saying, this is not how board members do Things. You know what, Ms. Hen, I have asked for things to be added to the agenda item for the past two years, as is Ms. Scott, and it has been continually ignored. This has been happening for years. So don't sit there and grandstand and tell me that we are not following protocol. On September 22nd, I asked for lead in the school waters, which is an important public health issue, to be added. I haven't heard back from the chair. Um, I believe if it is being added to the next October meeting, a courtesy email that it is being added would have been nice to know. I didn't get that. Mr. McMillian recently asked for a NOVID contract that was going out to be added to the agenda item. And Ms. Halsey and you did not add that. And he had to ask time and again twice in open session to add it to the agenda, which I'm glad he did because that was violation of procurement laws. So no, you don't get to grandstand and say, no, you don't get to silence me either, Kathleen. We have, women of color have been silenced for hundreds of years. 
So as when I sit on this board, I am going to use my voice. I'm going to speak for the children that I represent, all 115,000 children of it. The agenda will be set at, according to all 12 members of the board and not what to what you and Julie Hen think is important. Thank you. So I will just comment briefly and then uh, I see a hand that we have not heard, so we will hear from a member that has not yet spoken. And I appreciate Ms. Makita Scott's motion in terms of considering, but the agenda setting item, which is the first item at, at, on the board, is not the time to uh, have full board discussion around an issue that has not been vetted. Policy Review Committee, on which Ms. Scott sits, is right now reviewing the policy where this should be evaluated. So while I certainly do appreciate, and in fact, it was Ms. Hen and I who encouraged the board to change policy 8314 at our very, uh, it was first, second meeting, um, in order to allow board members the opportunity that uh, was not previously available to them. So Ms. Pasteur, you're gonna have the final word and then we're going to vote on adding this agenda item, which will be at this point at midnight or 1230. Ms. Pasture? I'm just asking for clarification. Um, Ms. Scott, is Ms. Scott's motion that at the beginning we have five minutes of time where board members who have things they'd like to be added to the agenda, not necessarily for the current agenda, but to put it out there for the next one, so that when the three of you meet, you will address them. I'm now confused. So Ms. Scott's motion has to do with five minutes at the end of this meeting. Um, as Dr. Hager pointed out, uh, would, would be a new thing, an experiment, um, before the final announcements to, to take five minutes and have board members uh, bring forward items they would like to be on the agenda for a future meeting. Okay, this is at the end then, just yes. for your thinking, so you know what we're thinking about when you plan the agenda. Got it. Yes. Thank you, and thank yep. you, Ms. Thank you. All right, so uh, we have heard from everyone at least once. So, Ms. Gover, if you can uh, call the roll, please. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Mr. Mahomza? Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Scover, what is the roll call? What is the? Favor of seven. Favor of seven, thank you. So we will add agenda item S, five minutes for future agenda setting, and then our current Agenda item S, announcements, will be relabeled T. So the motion, excuse me, so the agenda stands as revised. The next item on the agenda is minutes of the closed session. Early, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. And eight, to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The minutes of our closed session and informational summary can be found on our website, www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on our agenda is item D, new business, personal matters. And for that, we bring forward Ms. Lowry. 
Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, recognition of deceased, certificated appointments, and the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council appointments. Thank you. And Ms. Lowry, I'm going to separate out resignations. So if I could have a motion to approve items. Item one. Excuse me, items D1, D3, D4, D5, and D6. So moved, Offerman. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hanger? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. Tester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Mahomta? Ms. Causey, I think he's muted. He's having trouble uh, responding. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you, the motion carries. May I have a motion to approve item D2 resignations? So moved, Mac. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Ms. Han? Yes. Ms. Causey? Recuse. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Yes. yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item E, new business, administrative appointments. And for that, we call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, board, Madam Chair. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments, assistant principal at Honeygo Elementary School and assistant principal at Elm, Elmwood Elementary School. Board members, may I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments in item we E1? So moved, Matt. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Gober, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Fester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Josh? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Okay, our first appointed candidate is Melissa Adler, assistant principal at Honeygo Elementary School. Uh, she is coming to us with 22.1 years of service in Baltimore County. Uh, currently, she's the uh, kindergarten teacher at Franklin Elementary School. Uh, previously, she was a stat teacher, a resource teacher, pre-K kindergarten teacher at Newtown, kindergarten teacher at Newtown, and classroom teacher at Colgate Elementary. So congratulations, Ms. Adler. 
And our second appointed candidate is Laura Rode, assistant principal at Elmwood Elementary. Uh, she brings to us 8.1 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the acting assistant principal at Elmwood Elementary. Previously, she was a teacher, stack teacher at Elmwood. She served as a classroom teacher at Seven Oaks Elementary and Dogwood Elementary. She also has five years of service in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Congratulations, Ms. Rowe. That concludes the appointments. I want to thank the Department of Human Resources and our community superintendents and our principals for their hard work in filling these vacancies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who register to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. While we encourage public input on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you hear the bell. The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at www.bcps org slash board slash participation. I will now call on our stakeholder group leaders to speak. And first we have this evening, Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I speak tonight on two topics. First, the safe and sustainable return of students and educators to schools and work sites. Educators want to be back at their work sites. Well, we want those decisions to be made around the science. That means using the CDC indicators and thresholds for risk of introduction and transmission of COVID-19 in schools as the starting point. The science needs to guide the decisions. We want our return to be safe and sustainable. Distance learning is reaching and teaching our students. They are showing up to classes and participating. The BCPS reopening plan dated September 16th, 2020, is approved by MSDE. Let's work with that plan, and more importantly, let's be sure the plans being created for when we can return safely are fully developed in continued collaboration with the educators, support staff, all the bargaining units of BCPS. We know this is an extremely uncertain situation where information changes frequently. Our goal must put the health and safety of our stakeholders first. My second topic is the funding of EDAs. I have heard from many educators who have been told there is no funding for the EDAs they sponsor. These are the exact activities that engage our students. The activities that give our students opportunities they may not have access to anywhere else. Also, many of these activities do help our students' social and emotional health and well-being. Students do them because they are fun and they are a chance for students to interact with their peers often in a non-academic setting. This is where many students thrive. They need these clubs and groups to show they shine in ways that we often don't see in the classroom. Students count on these activities and look forward to them. Please do not take these opportunities away from our students. We know and realize the challenges and opportunities facing us all during this pandemic. Seemingly no decision we make is the right one. I know you hear from stakeholders on all sides of every topic. So do I. Let's work together to find a place where and how we can best support our students and staff 
while we navigate all we face during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Our next stakeholder for this evening is Megan Stewart Sicking from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Council Group. Good evening. Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board, good evening to all of you. The CCAC October meeting was focused on updates and Q&A with the Department of Special Education. I would like to thank Dr. Pirandozzi for her work preparing for the meeting, Dr. Adams for presenting that night, and for all of the special education staff who presented and attended. We recognize that staff members are working very hard to make our current situation tolerable and to design reentry possibilities. The fact remains, though, that there are gaps in problem solving at the school level. We hope to be in continued conversation with the Department of Special Ed about providing guidance, ideas, and best practices to improve virtual learning. At the same time, however, many of the accommodations available on a daily basis simply can't be provided online. Sometimes there is a substitute that can work or at least get us by. Often, there is no substitute accommodation. Parents are telling us stories of overwhelm and meltdown. We hear parents use words like devastating or heartbreaking when they talk about watching their children. We hear from parents who must be next to their kids for every class and from those who have hired their own aid to be with their child all day. While we certainly understand that some students benefit virtually and that some families will choose not to return due to medical issues, we still hear constant begging for a return to schools for IEP students. We understand that returning IEP students without their typical peers can sometimes create legal issues such as questions about least restrictive environment. However, there are additional groups of students who are not learning virtually. Consider homeless students or those with unreliable internet access. We believe there is a significant subgroup of students who do not benefit from online classes. If these students are also included in an early group to return, then students are returning not just based on a category, such as having an IEP, but based on their inability to access online instruction adequately. This is a possible way for the reopening plan to address students who cannot access virtual learning and consider how they might have an option to return earlier. In addition, when gen ed students return in larger numbers, we request that the reopening plan specifically states that teams should decide how much time individual students need in the building on a case-by-case -case basis. If a child cannot return for medical reasons, virtual or in-home options must be examined. For those who do plan to return, if a student is not benefiting from virtual learning, a hybrid model could be devastating. It destroys routines for kids who need it, and it keeps them in a failure cycle through more virtual learning. Perhaps these students should attend consistently rather than on a rotation. Teams must be empowered to make individualized decisions about where students should learn when the time comes. We encourage the board, the superintendent, and the reopening team to seriously consider IEP students at every level of the reopening planning. We look forward to further discussion with you about this issue. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will hear from our public speakers. We have. Can people put their mute on? I am hearing an echo, please. The first public speaker for this evening is Yara Sheikh. Ms. Kazi, I don't see her on the phone call. Thank you. We will move on to the next, and if she calls in, we'll do that at the end. So the next public speaker is Dr. Bosch Farron. Ms. Gover, can... Um, he is on the call. He's just muted. He has to unmute. Dr. Farone, we cannot hear you, so if you can please unmute yourself. He probably doesn't know how. Dr. 
Dr. Ferrone. We are still not hearing you. you, so if you can unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, very good. Good evening, Ms. Causey and board members. BCPS and USA are struggling to deal with the COVID-19. Many teachers ask not to return to face-to-face -face classes unless it is safe. Some leaders have made the mask a political statement instead of what it is, an instrument to prevent infection. For our BCPS to succeed, we must embrace science over political ideology. We also must teach ethical behavior at all levels. Today, I choose to highlight my favorite scientist doctor, Ibn Sina, or Abi Sina, as is known in the West. Ibn Sina is a Muslim scientist of the 10th century. He has an important place in the history of Iran and the world. Modern medicine is laid upon the infrastructure of Ibn Sina medicine. Many scholars concluded that during the 11th to the 17th century, the scientific and educational activities of medicine in the world were moving in the pivot of Ibn Sina medicine. Ibn Sina was known as the universal scientist. He wrote the famous work of Al Canon of medicine. Al Canon overrid Hippocrates in Galen. Al Canon shined in both the, the East and the West. Ibn Sina work was translated to many languages in the West and was adopted by most universities in Europe. Masks have been used for millennia to dispel, dispel dust and lately germs. In 1867, a British surgeon, Joseph Lister, and the French physician, Louis Pasteur, pointed to the mask as a tool to prevent the spread of germs. However, it took until 1935 for the masks to be believed in and to be popular. Our BCPS must keep science and facts in the making of its decisions. Science and facts are our guide to graduate knowledgeable future leaders. Masks are tools like gloves and scalpels. Masks are common sense, just like covering the mouth when sneezing, just like hand washing. I thank you very much for listening to me and for your work. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is Ms. Amy Adams. Ms. Adams, can you unmute? Ms. Adams, if you are speaking, we do not hear you. If you can check the unmute. We still are not able to hear anything. <clears throat> Ms. Adams, if you dial star six, it might unmute you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. There you go. Great. Thank you. I was unmuted, but thank you for the assistance. Okay. Good evening, and thank you, Dr. Williams and board members, for allowing me time to speak. I am a parent of a high school, a middle school, and an elementary school BCPS parent, student. I know that we are living through extremely complicated situation, and I recognize there are many sides and feelings about how we live safely during this pandemic. I want to express my gratitude to the teachers, principals, and staff who are working extremely hard right now teaching virtually. They are developing engaging lessons over the only platform option they have been given. They are dealing with connectivity and technology interruptions. Many teachers are also balancing supervising their own children's virtual school experience. 
My frustration is with the leadership of our school system. I'm very anxious and worried that no clear plan for a hybrid model or reentry plan has been developed and published to the stakeholders. I've been listening to board meetings since this summer and written to the board to ask for plans to be shared. I have reached out to the teachers union and asked that they share specific criteria they are requiring to support the teachers return to school. If we agree that children learn better in person, what are we doing to make this happen? The virus is still present and needs to be taken seriously, but waiting for it to completely be gone is not realistic. Waiting for a vaccine that will be available for all U.S. citizens could take months or even years, and I'm not willing to have our kids locked out of school for that long. I believe teachers are essential workers. Ever since the start of this pandemic, we have required our essential workers to perform their jobs. Teachers should be given the option to return to school or present a valid excuse to continue to work virtually. I would request the board investigates models that public systems within our state have opened and had success. Model the plans published by other school systems in the country that have been in person since August with no recorded outbreak, major outbreak. I am not asking for a one-size-fits-all plan. I simply want the choice to send my kids to school and allow others to have a choice to keep theirs virtual. Maybe Dr. Williams and the board members are unaware of how virtual school is affecting our kids. I know my own kids are experiencing computer fatigue and apathy towards school. They do not normally have attention issues, but are having increased difficulty staying focused and engaged in learning. They are dealing with anxiety about missing content if they have technical difficulties getting into a meet. I have heard from other parents about their kids being in tears or berating themselves for being dumb and not able to keep up or submit assignments successfully. Older kids are dealing with isolation and depression. I am greatly worried about the social and emotional well-being of our school-aged children and lasting effects this prolonged shutdown will have on them. It's heartbreaking for our students to watch other kids have the opportunity to attend in school person, in person and try to understand why they cannot go safely also. I strongly implore Baltimore County Schools to, and the superintendent to work with the union and publish a detailed hybrid and reopening plan. By keeping our students locked out of school, we are increasing the educational divide within our society. It's on the agenda for tonight to discuss the equity committee data. This data, which was gathered starting before the pandemic, identifies that there is already a great gap for certain populations of students. I know many families that have chosen to leave the public school. Thank you, and the time is up, and certainly everyone can send any comments to the BOE at bcps.org. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Diana Bergman. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Good evening. Buenas tardes. I would like to start off by saying that BCPS has a reopening plan. It has been revised multiple times, actually and it's not classified information or being hidden from parents. It's publicly available at www.bcps.org. Quiero pasar por decir que BCPS, el condado de, de escuela de, Pobre, de Baltimore County, tiene un plan como vamos a abrir la escuela. Ese plan se ha hecho más de una vez y está eh, puesto en el website de la escuela. The reopening plan is not ideal, and it's not everybody's, and not everybody's thrilled about it. However, we can learn a lot from each other. El plan para abrir las escuelas no es algo que todo el mundo está conforme, pero algo con esta experiencia es que vamos a aprender todo el mundo junto. Here's the thing, and we're talking about this experience we have to figure out how to work together as a team. Team BCPS, together everybody achieves more, and we must be able to include and communicate everybody. Esto es la cosa. Para poder hacer las cosas bien hechas, tenemos que trabajar todo el mundo junto. Los padres, las maestras, la escuela completa, todo el mundo tiene que ser parte de esa conversación. We have to consider that we have to create a virtual learning experience that involves everybody in the conversation. Students, parents, teachers, every single person. And we have to be able to provide that. So what I'm recommending is that we provide on BCPS helpful tips to improve the virtual learning experience until we gradually re-enter into the schoolhouse when it's safe to do so. 
Entonces, lo que yo estoy proponiendo es que, por favor, que esta escuela, el sistema pueda poner información para que todo el mundo pueda participar y darle esa oportunidad. Um, I'm not sure if my time's up because I heard a beep and I'm trying to interpret this information because, as you know, BCPS live stream is not available in multiple languages. We have a lot of Hispanic families that have every single right to understand during this process how we plan to reopen. And our board meetings are not equitable and it's not available in multiple languages for those families, and they're in a disadvantage. No sé si se me terminó el tiempo. Estoy tratando de hacer el esfuerzo para poder comunicar esta información para los padres en español porque nuestro condado de board um, no tiene la oportunidad para darle este permiso a, a la familia en español. Eh, para que sepan lo que está pasando cuando vamos a hablar a la escuela y en cuál manera. So I think my time is up. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Dr. Mohamed Jamil. Dr. Jamil, if you are speaking, we do not hear you. If you can unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you? We did hear you, but now we do not hear you. Can you try the star six and see if that will allow you to be heard? We do not hear you, Dr. Jamil. Hear me now? Yes, yes sir. there you are. Okay, thank you for that technical adjustment there. Appreciate it. Uh, peace and blessings, Chairwoman Ms. Causey, Dr. Williams, members of the board, and everyone at this virtual meeting. I've been a citizen in Baltimore County since nearly 50 years. Well, there has been a serious confusion in some circles about global warming and now about COVID-19. This has impelled me to speak about science. The Webster's Dictionary defines it as knowledge as distinguished from ignorance and misunderstanding. So my first profession was serving on board ships for about eight years in Pakistan. We would have public tours of the ship whenever we traveled to foreign countries. On such one such visit, a high school student asked the question, how come the whole ship and its superstructure are all made of steel? and it floats because steel is very heavy and wood is light. Obviously, he did not know the principles of flotation. It reflected limitation of his knowledge about science. The education systems all over the world have been teaching science since eons, but believing in it has been lost. We cannot have our students today to go to an orchard and have them sit under apple trees to wait for an apple to fall on their heads to discuss and prove the laws of gravity. They have to trust and believe in science, period, if the, if the society has to move forward. Our planet is in danger. There are multitudes of factors that threaten the very existence of life on it. You are well aware of many educated persons and public leaders that are in denial of climatic and environmental causes of the increase in the frequency and intensity of hurricanes, floods, droughts, fires, and rising sea levels. Such persons and leaders do not believe in science and sway the public opinion differently. Therefore, it has become imperative, in my humble opinion, 
that the educators not only teach various disciplines of science, but also teach the importance of science. I implore DCPS to enrich the future citizens and future leaders by teaching why science exists. They will then be able to guide the humanity on the righteous path. God bless you all, and be well. Everybody be safe. Thank you. Our next public speaker for the evening is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Ms. Seroff, you hear cannot me? Hear. There you are. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I tried that little fix. It seems that everybody's having the same problem. Um, and thank you very much, uh, board chair and uh, board members and uh, Dr. Williams for letting me speak this evening. Um, there was a report last night on Fox 45 that parents want our schools to open. And as you know from people who have spoken this evening, uh, a lot of the parents of special needs kids feel it's imperative for our schools to open because our students are simply not learning very well on the virtual environment. We also know that students are not going to return because there are some of us who cannot return due to pre-existing conditions. Um, therefore, we need to find a way to improve the virtual learning environment. One of the ways that I'm suggesting that we, we do that is making sure that every school has clear rules. The patchwork of do your own thing because we can't do the one size fits all, that's not working. There are schools that don't know whether or not they can record instruction. And there are students that desperately need to have that content recorded so that they can not miss out on instruction when they are absent from the class. We have to make sure that all students and all parents and all teachers keep, know whether or not they have to keep the cameras on because there are classes where the cameras are not being kept on and we don't know what the students are doing. We have parents who are saying, my child is not even in the class and they're missing content and the school then saying, but they're doing fine in class when they're really not even there. We need consistency. We need, as I said, we need rules. And we need a way forward so that when we go back, the virtual learning environment is going to work for everybody. Because it's not working now. And we have to fix it. I'm willing to fix it. I'm willing to help fix it. I have fixed it for several of my clients in IEP meetings, and I know that it's working. But there are thousands of other students that it's not. Thank you. Our next public speaker for the evening is Ms. Anita Bass. Ms. Bass, if you are speaking, we cannot hear you. You might try star six. Ms. Cosney, I don't see her number, Dalton. Okay, then we can move on to Ms. Ashley Bohr.
Is Ms. Bohr connected? I'm sorry, I don't see her number dialed in as well. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Megan Heath. Can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Good evening, Baltimore County Board of Ed members, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, and Superintendent Williams. I am a special educator for Baltimore County Public Schools. I am happy to speak with you all tonight and appreciate this opportunity. I know that at the end of the day, we as BCPS want what is best for our students and staff. And finding the middle ground amidst a pandemic is challenging. We know our kids need to get back into classrooms. And the question continues to be, when can we safely do that? The difference in opinion within the answer to that question is what is causing such disarray. As a teacher, I can't help but feel that people in the state of Maryland see me now as the enemy. I've heard that we as teachers are being too cautious, that we never want to return into buildings, and that we are being selfish and just want to work from home. I assure you that these comments couldn't be farther from the truth. We as teachers are constantly working and evolving to make virtual instruction appropriate for our students. Most of us began the school year weeks early in order to prepare and to get creative. Some days come with extra long hours or working on weekends in order to learn new programs, adapt materials, and make connections with our students and their families. I know teachers who give up planning periods just to offer additional one-on-one -on -one and small group sessions to help best service our students. I don't share all of this in a defensive way. I share it so that you know a teacher's truth, so that you know my truth. I have also learned so much about our families during this time, and I'm incredibly grateful that they have welcomed my classroom into their home. I wanna thank the parents who are juggling their hectic schedules to be present during instruction. Please know that we, as teachers, appreciate you. Unfortunately, whether the consensus is to remain virtual or return to in-person instruction, someone is going to be unhappy. I know with certainty that if we continue to always think first about what is best for the students, then our compass is aimed in the right direction. I know that as leaders within the county, you agree with me on that point and are standing side by side as my ally. With that being said, I feel our county needs to continue improvement in the area of communication. I encourage us to move away from making decisions first and a plan of action second. I think we can be more thoughtful about our delivery of information to our stakeholders. I ask that you please continue to involve teachers in your discussion. I appreciate the committees that have been formed in order to help plan for reentry and the diversity within those committees that everyone has a voice. I hope that we can continue to work hand in hand to find the best solution to support our students and their learning. Again, thank you for your time and for listening. Stay safe. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Jeffrey Friedman. Ms. Causey, this is the comment on the calendar. Board members, I'm a teacher representing a number of my colleagues and students who are asking you to again approve a post-Labor Day calendar for the 2021-22 school year. You must consider what the public wants in a calendar, and after reading hundreds of comments online, I can tell you definitively that it is the following. To begin after Labor Day, religious equity, a full week spring break, a planned end date in mid-June, enough teacher professional development time, and safe schools. Only in the calendar beginning post-Labor Day can we do all of this. And then you may ask, why is this so important in the middle of a pandemic? Well, the most important reason is that provided we are returning for in-person instruction, you need to ensure that all of your educators, staff, and students feel safe upon this return. Beginning after Labor Day, we'll give our building services staff an extra one and a half weeks to ensure that our buildings are properly sanitized over the summer, and we'll give BCPS additional time to secure PPE and all of the resources needed for the beginning of the school year, which is extremely important for our safety. This calendar also includes an extra professional development day before students arrive, which will allow educators additional time to learn and prepare for COVID-19 protocols to ensure the safety of staff and students. In addition, there has been an ongoing concern over the schools that still do not have air conditioning or appropriate ventilation in classrooms or on buses. By beginning of September, 
Temperatures are likely to be cooler, and there will be more time to address those concerns over the summer. It will be very inequitable to begin earlier and just hope for the best. Beginning the school year one week before Labor Day will not solve any problems. That unpopular plan would begin the frustrating pushback into August again that educators, families, and the community have been fighting to stop. That plan would also bring students back one week early to go directly into a disruptive four-day weekend following, followed by another restart. That plan would cancel the possibility of students participating in summer learning activities that take place in the days leading up to Labor Day that they already had to forfeit in summer 2020 due to the pandemic. And data has shown that that plan will not improve educational outcomes, nor will it reduce learning loss, which is actually the result of the pandemic. This past year, every county in Central Maryland voted to begin after Labor Day, and most have already released plans to do so again next year. We need to keep consistent with them by doing the same. Please keep what is working well and do not push us back into August. I should also note that there is a new community petition which is gaining traction to start BCPS schools after Labor Day next year. Please remember, as our board members, you represent us. We are asking you to show that you value our health and well-being and make the choice for the safety of all staff and students in our buildings by allowing the final week of summer to get this right. Please stay consistent, allow us to have a full summer, and vote to begin school after Labor Day. Thank you. And our next public speaker on the calendar is Dr. Bosch Barone. Uh, good evening. The minutes of the calendar committee on 831 2020 stated Billy Burke replied in response to Dr. Ferron's email that the board did not want the professional dates for the Jewish and the Muslim holidays to ever be converted back to school opening days for the students. It is of note that the website calendar 2021 says these readjustments may include the redesignation of holidays as student days. Mr. Duke told the Board of Education on 929, with regard to the holidays, it is a little bit difficult with the Muslim holidays. We can make a change upon confirmation that indeed it is May 2nd versus May 3rd. He also told in past deliberations, decided and indicated that if we were to need a convert days to make up for school closure, that we would not convert those professional development days into student days. I am concerned that if these statements by Mr. Duke and Mr. Burke are not accepted by the, by the board, then the Muslim holiday slash professional day in a crunch may be converted to a full school day. I request that the Board of Education would approve that the holiday slash professional day will not be sacrificed to compensate for emergency closures. Why does our community ask for that clarification? It is an essential part of relevancy and integrity of the calendar. The BCPS administration should follow the moonsighting.com for the Muslim holidays. It will make the task of making calendar easier. For any questions, please call on me for help. This clarification shall fill a void of information in the past and provide specificity for the future. The school calendar is our billboard and articulates our core belief in equity and equality for all. All our children need their physical and emotional health. All families need to be included and be engaged. I do appreciate that the Board of Education uh, would provide equality uh, for example, in the distribution of electronic devices. And in that, I asked the Board of Education also to con consider the same thing in relation to the professional days slash uh, Muslim and Jewish holidays, to treat them equally at all times. I thank you for listening to me, and I thank you for your work and your patience. Thank you. Our next speaker on the school year calendar for the year 2021-2022 is Ms. Diana Bergman. 
Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Ahora estamos hablando del calendario para el próximo año. El condado de Baltimore County, de las escuelas públicas, está oyendo de diferentes gente que vive en el condado para hablar sobre el próximo año, cómo abrimos la escuela. Yo lo que estoy pidiendo es que, por favor, que piensen hacer el calendario de la escuela más largo, más largo para poder recuperar las horas que perdimos con la situación. Good afternoon. We're talking about the calendar, and I would like to start off by saying that BCPS should strongly consider a year-long calendar instead of the traditional calendar. During the pandemic, we don't know what lies ahead of us. We don't know where we started, when we go back. We have so many unanswered questions. But we do know that our children need to get back into a routine and be able to recuperate hours of missed instruction. So I'm proposing, instead of thinking about holidays, if we start after Labor Day, to extend the school year to provide some consistency. I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate with all the complications that we're seeing in our school system and that we're thinking on how to do things traditionally, how we've done in the past, when we all know when these kids return back in school in person, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be completely different. That classroom learning environment will never look like it once did. And we have to start acknowledging that and considering that. And that goes with the calendar, how we provide instruction for students in the best possible manner. You want to know what I said in Spanish? I suggest you get an interpreter for these meetings. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a step back to public comment uh, where one of our um, commenters was had a technical difficulty but is with us now. So we will hear from Ms. Ashley Bohr under general public comments. Good evening. Ms. Bohr, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. You can try star six. We still do not hear you. Ms. Cosby, do you want to go into the next public comment for calendar and I'll try and get her on the line? Yes. Thank you. So going back to public comment on the school calendar, we have Dr. Muhammad Jamil. Can you hear me now? Yes. A peace and blessings to everyone. Uh, I appreciate all your efforts in trying to accommodate everyone. Well, the first time the board was made aware of Muslim holidays was during Superintendent Dr. Dubelstein in the 1980s. My children were enrolled in elementary, secondary, and high school of BCPS. By the grace of God, they are very successful exemplary citizens today. Two of them have also become parents themselves of teenagers in high school. Four superintendents and about 80 members have been replaced since that time. My community has had many requests and pleas for equal treatment and inclusion of Muslim students in the policy of closing of schools on high holidays. We had to inform and re-educate for many every time new superintendent and new members join the board. Many reasons and justifications were presented. The negative effects to and hardship of Muslim students were explained. Denial of justice and equality were explained. Decades of explanations were finally understood by you. We are grateful. I think that all of you received my presentation in the last meeting. It is very disheartening that apparently the explanations, the purpose, the importance, 
and the rationale for scheduling the professional day on the Eid al-Fitr are being negated. Now, this Muslim holiday is in the crosshairs of ECPS. The date with an asterisk and a footnote appears in the proposed 2021-2022 calendar for the professional day. It's targeted to be sacrificed and converted into a full school day to make up for a snow day. I had suggested an alternative with at least five different options to achieve your goal. I sincerely hope and pray that this day is not sacrificed. My community should not have to litigate again for the legitimacy of having that day off. I hope that the board reconsiders the proposed calendar and treat the one Muslim holiday as sacred to the Muslim students, equal to the sacredness of holidays of students of other Abrahamic faiths. God bless you all. Be safe. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Our next speaker on the calendar is Clary Fustin. Thank you. Um, I'm actually talking about returning to school. Um, I'm not sure why I got that under calendar, but I'll, can, I'll start. Raising okay. the bar, closing the gap, and preparing for the future. This is the Baltimore County Schools motto. This is what I believe in and I want for all children enrolled in Baltimore County Public Schools. And it's not happening. Our teachers are going above and beyond to raise the bar, but it is heavy and they cannot do it alone. The gaps are only getting larger. When will the students in Baltimore County Public Schools be given the chance to start closing them? And the future for our children? That depends on a plan, and we don't have that yet either. The Board of Education has known since May 2020 that students would not return for the start of the 2020 school year in person. That is nearly five months to make a plan to give parents and caregivers an option and nothing. The survey sent out in June gave clear numbers. 64% of parents, 73% of students, and over 57% of teachers supported an in-person or hybrid plan. How can we get these numbers and not listen to them? Where is the plan? The union says we can reopen when it's safe, but won't share their definition of safe. Fox 45 and parents have reached out and got zero response when they were asked by TAPCO to define what is safe for them. Do you need help defining what is safe? I will call Hopkins tomorrow and get the data from their epidemiologist. Does safe include PPE? I will go out and source that for you. Do you need someone to search other school systems what they're doing? I will do that too as a volunteer because my children and the children of the Baltimore County public school systems need to be back in school. This is not a one-size-fits-all situation, and I would never presume to think that what is right for my children is right for another family. But I do know that we all deserve a choice. But without a plan, how do we have a choice? Children's academic interest is at stake, but I argue more importantly, their social and emotional well-being is the most significant issue. On a daily basis, we are witnessing firsthand stories about younger children who are in tears. They can't do their assignments. Why is this acceptable by the unions and the school leadership? There are elementary age students who should have pencil and paper in hand, not computers. The American Academy of Pediatrics states for this age group, the recommended screen time is 1.5 hours a day. Our children spend six hours a day on a computer, four times more than they should. What effects does this have on them long term? No one can say. Our children deserve better. We must do better. The Board of Education must do better. I want schools to reopen safely, but we have to stop sitting on our hands and debating what that means and finally take action. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to uh, reconnect with Ashley Bohr, commenting, a public commenter. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. I apologize. I will speak now, and I promise I, I will not be lost. 
I appreciate the opportunity to speak in this forum to enlighten the Board of Education about the concerns that are felt in the four special schools as we gear up to return to school. Students require hand-over-hand -hand assistance for all activities of daily living. Our students, the ones in the special schools, cannot adhere to CDC guidelines. They require hand-over-hand -hand assistance for eating, toileting, hygiene procedures such as washing hands changing clothes and communicating with peers and staff. In the absence of a parent, our, student need, our students need our support and we can't provide that to them six feet away. Students haven't seen staff in over seven months and won't understand why they can't hug us, shake our hands, or even give us a high five like they used to. The staff will be wearing masks, which will help to protect the students from illness. Our students will not wear masks and most likely will pull off our masks and cause contamination. The clear mask we are receiving from BCPS is a great idea. However, our students will not adjust well to this change. Many students will be confused, while others will be scared as they have personal trauma revolving around hospital visits due to illness. Hygiene is a practice that is addressed daily, promoting, prom promoting proper technique while the students are in school. But this is completed hand over hand. When our students cough or sneeze, they do not understand to cover their mouth or nose to, to contain fluids leaving their bodies. We continue to teach students to cover with a tissue or use the elbow to contain a sneeze or cough. These measures are reactive, and we use coughing and sneezing as teachable moments to remind students what they should do. Remember, once body fluid droplets are in the air, we can't protect the students from breathing them in if they are not wearing a mask. Teachers have yet to receive protocols to follow when re-entering the schools. We are sure that education we that the education we provide will be different. Our students thrive on routine. They have established one with virtual learning as they will when we re-enter the building as we are tasked to. When will teachers and staff learn about cleaning procedures to deter the spread of illness, bus procedures to keep our students safe and well, health procedures that make sure we are able to determine when a student needs to be put into quarantine or in isolation and then picked up from parents if we are not using the temperature as the, or the fever as the number one reason to put a child into quarantine. We have a lack of defense for our students and ourselves. Staff and students have remained in isolation for, long, for at least seven months, seeing a decrease in illness and hospital visits for those comprom with compromised immune systems, lung functions, and medical conditions. As we re-enter school, we are entering with immune systems that are not equipped to fight. We have, we have to worry about students contracting flu. Thank you. Ms. Gober, is there anyone else on the line? I believe she was our last speaker. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is item G, the superintendent's report. And for that, we call on Dr. Williams. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I'm going to keep my comments brief because of the time, um, but I just want to say good evening and happy Principals Month to each of our Team BCPS school leaders. Uh, of course, this year presents new challenges due to the COVID-19 crisis and our principals are meeting those challenges with steady leadership and a focus on both instructional excellence and the determination to meet the social and emotional needs of our students and staff. Congratulations to Jacksonville Elementary School that was named a 2020 National Blue Ribbon School by the U.S. Department of Education. Kudos to Principal Miller and her team and the school community for this outstanding accomplishments and kudos to our students there. Uh, as you heard, uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month, Buenos Dias, muchas gracias a las familias y a los estudiantes para trabajando Cone Estudiando in BCPS. This is National Hispanic Nas uh, Heritage Month. 
It began on September 15th and continues through October 15th. So please check out our blog. A lot of great information uh, where we're highlighting uh, students and staff. Uh, academic support centers uh, have begun providing child care for students uh, participating in virtual learning. I appreciate the work of the partners in Baltimore County government for identifying providers and establishing a child care subsidy based on income. Our three schools, new schools, uh, deal with uh, renovations, Berkshire, Chadwood, and Colgate. Uh, as of this week, uh, the staff will be moving into the new Berkshire Elementary School. I want to commend our uh, school and central office leaders for completing these projects despite the crisis. Uh, Education Foundation, again, just want a big shout out to them for their tireless work to support families, educators uh, during this crucial time. Uh, they've raised several thousands of dollars to support uh, students and families uh, they made donations um, where we uh, were able to uh, provide learning toolkits, book bundles, or technology. A shout out to the staff of the mill distribution sites. I had the pleasure to visit the site at Pandonia Elementary School, Principal Pizzo. It was great talking to him. And one of our neighborhoods where the staff uh, from Food and Nutrition Services and Transportation shared success stories and showed their pride regarding their work and all those positive relationships they built with families and students. A special shout out to a student uh, that I met uh, who attends Cockeysville Middle School and his grandmother. And then finally, uh, the 2020-2021 Maryland Teacher of the Year virtual event was held uh, by MSDE this past Thursday, and our own Robert Runk at Parkville Middle School was recognized along with the other 23 honorees. So again, congratulations to our Teacher of the Year, Mr. Robert Runk. And then finally, I sent a letter out to staff, and a letter will be going out to the community giving an update, thanks to our design team and our COVID-19 uh, team, where we talked about um, where we are right now with um, looking at preparing for gradual return of students and staff. Uh, but I just want to highlight that we prioritize health and safety of all of our students and staff. I just want to thank the team for working through the many situations. Communication is critical to our work during this pandemic, and we're committed to engaging the voices of our community in the upcoming weeks. Uh, through surveys, multi-stakeholder focus groups, coordination with the scientific community as we implement a safe phase in return to small group in-person instruction. So just some highlights, and this will be coming out uh, later this week. The Office of Health Services has ordered job-appropriate PPE for staff. Uh, as you well know, staff and students are will be expected to wear face coverings. Uh, we will have extras on hand, buses in schools in case face covering is soil or damage. Clear face shields have been ordered for instructional staff. Uh, in addition to PPE provisions, hand sanitizer stations have been placed outside of cafeterias and in main offices. If you want to look at the mitigation strategies, please um, look at our reopening plan, Appendix A, that talks about the screening of symptoms at home prior to working, six-foot distance, face coverings, uh, sh shared items, facility cleaning, sanitation, organization, and the response to any positive COVID-19 cases. Dr. Gregory Branch from the Baltimore County Health Department, he is our Baltimore County Health Officer, has been a great resource, and we continue to work with him and get his advice. Um, in terms of working with our stakeholders, uh, we are working with TAFCO and, and ESPBC as requested to talk about work conditions in order to provide a safe environment for students and staff. And then finally, the as I shared earlier, the design team and COVID-19 task force will be providing some updates um, regarding where we are as a system, specifically around uh, instructional delivery, facilities, facilities organization, and providing communications to Team DCPS. So with that, I thank you for this time, Ms. Causey. 
and board members. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And I just want to, in the interest of time, ditto everything that Dr. Williams said. And also, I wanted to um, make these additional comments. It's been five weeks since school started, and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the tremendous and creative effort of our teachers, our principals during this special recognition month, um, all of the staff, our parents, our stakeholders, and our communities for doing all that they have been doing to make education available to our students during a pandemic. I also want to especially congratulate Jacksonville Elementary School and Principal Deb Miller on becoming a national Blue Ribbon School. We know that as a system and a board, we must do better with proactive communications, addressing urgent needs, uh, such as Dr. Williams mentioned, updating the reentry plan that provides that detail to alleviate concerns about the health and safety of students and staff. Giving uh, one of the uh, things that's a new announcement today is giving BCPS students an opportunity to take the SATs, and the board is pleased with the press release today that shares the details of BCPS College Board SAT Test Day coming Saturday, December 5th. Please see our website or have your student connect with their guidance counselor for details. Also, there's a way to apply for fee, wa fee waivers if there's a financial need for students. We also need to ensure to take into account the social, emotional needs and health of our students while ensuring their academic needs are met. And this includes providing those clubs and activities, even if they are virtual. And it also includes continuing to evaluate how to allow students to participate in sports. I would like to congratulate, as we're talking about social, emotional health, Silvana Al Samadi, Elementary School Counselor of the Year from Chapel Hill Elementary School, Robin Taylor Chadwick, Middle School Counselor of the Year from Sparrows Point Middle School, and Stephanie Campbell, High School Counselor of the Year at Lock Raven High School and Perry Hall High School. We also want to give a shout out to Dr. Amalio Nieve as the School Counseling Advocate of the Year. I was encouraged to hear recently from a number of teachers that the curriculum being produced by Curriculum and Instruction and the support that they are receiving from Curriculum and Instruction Office recently is the best it's been in 10 years. We know that this is the focus that we have on our new strategic plan, the Compass. We know that teachers have spent countless hours preparing to deliver that curriculum, provide it as effectively as possible in this virtual environment, and we commend them again. As you can imagine, there are many moving parts involved with the work required to reopen schools. The board is anticipating the review of updated version of the superintendent's reopening plan, and we appreciate the partnership of Dr. Branch, the director of the Baltimore County Health Department, as he works with Dr. Williams and his teams to reopen our schools safely. In addition to addressing the changing landscape caused by the pandemic, the board continues its work to strengthen governance, increase transparency and accountability, and work that you will be hearing about later from our equity committee and also other standing committee updates. Additionally, this week, several board members will be attending the virtual Maryland Association Boards of Education Conference, which will be an opportunity to hear from our colleagues around the state, innovations, best practices, and subject matter experts on education. Please note that we do value your input, and while we cannot respond to every email we receive, we do read it, we take it seriously, we forwarded it to the superintendent and his design team, and if there are specific issues, we ask the superintendent and his team to address those with you. With that, that is the end of my chair report, and I call on our student member of the board, Mr. Josh Muhamza. Good evening, uh, Chair Causey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Due to, due to uh, tonight's uh, extensive uh, agenda and uh, uh, the time, I will keep my report relatively short. Over the last month, I was honored to attend various events, uh, meetings, and workshops uh, hosted by our Baltimore County Student Councils and its committees. From, piv from the pivot event to uh, the executive board and BCS, BCSC executive, uh, uh, BCSC committee meetings, our student leaders re-engage with one another and continue to do their work uh, digitally. 
Special recognition to the BCSC interim president and the rest of the officer team for their diligent work over the course of the last three uh, months to ensure the continuity of, the, of our county student councils and for planning multiple events during our virtual learning uh, semester. Thank you to Dr. Williams and other staff members who attended th these events. Uh, our two uh, students were tr uh, truly appreciative of that. Uh, with public uh, comments being uh, available now, I, I anticipate that the board will now get a more in-depth presentation on the work that this group has been doing and the events uh, they, that they have planned uh, the next couple of months. Tonight, I wanted to emphasize the importance of the, BCS, uh, B, the BCPS's uh, Mind of Matter uh, campaign, which aims to destigmatize uh, the issue of mental health. Each month has specific themes uh, ranging from bullying, uh, bullying prevention month, uh, pride month, and of course, uh, my, uh, kindness over matters uh, month, which is uh, next month. Mental health has plagued our schools for many years. Every student and adult experiences their own struggles. That's why we have to uh, take every opportunity uh, to speak on this issue and support our school system by providing the necessary supports needed to combat it. I look forward to the, uh, continuing to meet with uh, the organizers of this campaign, our chief of school climate, and other, individual, and other individuals who have been advocating for solutions related to this issue. I'll continue to update the board and our stakeholders on uh, everything that occurs uh, with the Mind of Matters campaign. Lastly, I want to uh, thank Dr. Williams and the staff for their continued work over the la uh, last couple of months, uh, especially with uh, things related to the SAT um, and getting our students back uh, to school in some fashion and making sure that everybody's safe in the school building. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is uh, J, new business action taken in closed session. We do not have anything to consider there, so we will move on to item K, report on equity. And for that, we call on Mr. Burke and Dr. Lisa Williams. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to continue our discussion on equity. The last time we met, Dr. Lisa Williams led us through a discussion of BCPS performance data that revealed disparities for groups of students. Those disparities showed up in predictable patterns. Tonight, we would like to add to that discussion by examining the intersection of data for students that are represented in more than one student group. I'll be joined tonight by Dr. Lisa Williams, Dr. Mary Boswell McComas, and Dr. Melissa Wistead. Dr. Williams, at this time, I'll turn things over to you. Good evening, board members. Next slide, please. The objectives for this evening's presentation include follow-up from the desk audit of the equity presentation presented to the board committee, examination of intersectional issues of equity associated with larger trends in student achievement patterns using an ableist lens, and identification of next steps in responding to known patterns in the data. Next slide, please. Setting the context, Policy 0100 defines educational equity as access to opportunities, resources, and educational rigor that students need access to in order to succeed. The Board of Education's Equity Committee's mission includes supporting the district in removing structural, cultural, and systemic barriers. As we analyze the data, there were four predictable findings across student data sets. Those included racial predictability, class predictability, ableist predictability, and linguistic predictability. Tonight, in drill, drilling down into the data um, in deeper to a deeper level, we're going to take a look at ableist patterns found in the data. Next slide, please. And to use that, we're going to, to view that rather, we're going to talk about the construct of special education. But first, I'd like to offer a definition for ableism to focus our discussion. According to the Center for Disability Rights, ableism is a set of beliefs or practices that devalue and discriminate against people with physical, intellectual, 
with psychiatric disabilities and often rests on the assumption that disabled people need to be fixed in, in one form or another. In education, there's considerable evidence that unquestioned ableist assumptions are harming disabled students and contributing to unequal outcomes. School time devoted on activities that focus on changing disability may take time away from that time that is needed to provide access for learning academic materials. In Baltimore County Public Schools, 13% of our students or 17 uh, 17,000 students participate in special education services. According to the 2014 report by the National Center for Learning Disabilities, 66% of students with learning disabilities spend 80% or more of their time in the general education uh, setting. This statistic is important because the overwhelming majority of students identified for participation in special education will be expected to participate in the mainstream. Hence, they may learn differently, but the research would suggest that these differences are not so acute as to prohibit them from access to high academic achievement. This context should be considered as you consider the presentation of data that is to follow. So with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Boswell McComas to lead us into an examination of the trends around performance and achievement of our students with disabilities. Dr. McComas. Yes, good evening and thank you. You know, as we know, we are in a diverse community, which is reflected in our schools. And as board members, you naturally want our children to fully contribute to and to benefit from that diversity. And you may be wondering how exactly are we evolving to create a more equitable environment responsive to that growing diversity. And this evening, we will continue to explore more deeply uh, for your benefit in understanding our current state and share our forward movement to support continuous improvement. We will begin by reviewing our macro level trends using the metaphor of a lens and what happens when we use a series of intersecting lenses. First, we will look broadly at achievement using math as an example, comparing our students with disabilities to their non-disabled peers adding in a lens to view race, followed by a lens to view free and reduced meal status, and a lens uh, to view gender. More specifically, when using math achievement as captured in our measures of academic performance instrument and on the SAT, we see at the elementary grades a gap of 61% um, between our students with disabilities compared to their non-disabled peers. When we layer in a lens of race, we further see that black or African-American students with disabilities perform 16% lower compared to their non-black peers. Likewise, at the middle school grades, we see a gap of 15% between our students with disabilities and their non-disabled peers. Um, and when we layer in a lens to look at race, we further see that black and African-American students with disabilities perform 6.5% lower compared to non-black peers. And likewise, at the high school level, on the SAT, we see a gap of 20% existing between students with disabilities compared to their non-disabled peers. And when we look through the lens of race, we further see that black and African-American students with disabilities perform 5.2% lower compared to their non-black peers. We should note the exact same patterns persist along racial lines and that we replicate the overall student population data, including zone-specific patterns. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next, we will discuss the intersectionality of students with disabilities with uh, economics and students with disabilities with gender. What we see in Baltimore County school data is that our students with disabilities who are eligible for free and reduced meals performed 8% lower compared to their non-disabled peers um, in K-8 math. And likewise, even into high school, we see that students with disabilities who are eligible for free and reduced meal support perform 12 points lower compared to their non-disabled peers on the SHT. Furthermore, once again, when we consider gender and disability, we see that male students with disabilities perform 25% lower compared to their male non-disabled peers in overall performance and our female students with disabilities perform 28% lower compared to their female non-disabled peers in overall performance. 
on um, as measured on maps. Moreover, the persistent and predictable patterns exist across economic and gender. Next slide, please. In order to discuss our patterns and identification, first allow me to explain that we work within the state performance plan, which is the MSDE monitoring document for special education and local school systems across our state. It's important that, that I wanna build your understanding around indicator nine in the state performance plan. This indicator relates specifically to disproportionate representation relative to race and ethnicity. What you see on the screen before you is the definition, uh, and I'd like to take a moment to um, specify that. So disproportionality is defined as having students in a particular racial or ethnic group being at a considerably greater or lesser risk of being identified as eligible for special education and related services than all other racial or ethnic groups enrolled either in the local school system or across the state. And so next we need to introduce the concept of risk ratio. In an ideal setting, a risk ratio of 1.0 means a student has, has an equal likelihood of being identified in need of a service. Therefore, if the risk ratio of a student moves above 1.0, there is an increasing likelihood of being identified in need of services. We know that the ideal is 1.0 indicating a one-to-one -one likelihood. Therefore, we have to monitor and track closely any student group that reflects an increase or trends in increases in their risk ratio. A risk ratio of 2.0 is the state threshold and a review of three-year trend data reflects in Baltimore County, the risk ratio of 1.28 um, exists for black African-American students with disabilities. While at the same time we see um, an, a risk ratio trend of students of two or more races also increasing. And um, in contrast, at the same time we see a decreasing risk ratio trend for their white peers. Next slide, please. This slide talks more about the risk ratio where indicator 10 monitors the risk ratio for specific disability categories. Over the last three years, our first formal citation from MSDE of disproportionality was last year, where it reported that our black African-American student group for the category of intellectual disability. There was a three-year trend. However, it yielded the same patterns with much of our data. The black African-American student group were more likely to be identified in the areas of intellectual disability, emotional disability, other health impairment, and specific learning disability. The risk ratios received a call for a deeper dive into our systematic patterns based on the large increases, such as 0.3 and 0.5 in the areas which at times indicated consistency concerns, leading to a need for a substantial root cause analysis. Next slide, please. Our indicators 4A and B address the suspension and expulsion data and the risk ratio for our students overall within a student group by race and ethnicity. Around exclusionary discipline practices, the data once again mirrored the reported data indicated 4A, we look through a lens of comparing students with disabilities and their non-disabled peers in regards to suspensions. Specifically, we see multiple suspensions of greater than or equal to 10 days of students with disabilities, meaning students with disabilities are 3.35 times more likely to be suspended than their neurotypical peers. Also, students with disabilities Abilities experience single suspensions at a rate two times more likely than their neurotypical peers. With indicator 4B, we layer in the lens of race. We see that over the past three years, we've exceeded the state threshold. This is where we see that our black African-American students with disabilities, as identified by the state, are more than three and a half times more likely to be suspended than their non-black peers. The data comparison is in this last year's report that the black African-American student group comparison 
to the white student group, it's critical to note that while black students are three and a half more likely to be suspended, white students are two thirds less likely to be suspended. This data in the slides supports and confirms that the persistent and predictable patterns exist, including and specifically among our ableist population. Students with the most academic and behavioral support needs are being excluded from instruction. Black students are being excluded from instruction more than their peers. Black ableist students are being excluded from instruction more than their same aged peers. Next slide, please. Clearly, the persistent and predictable patterns we've been examining and reflecting on this evening illustrate the need to interrogate and influence the implicit bias. It is compelling and requires us to rigorously examine our practices and to actively reconstruct our approach to create a more equitable and context for a different outcome. To that end, Previously, we have worked to develop capacity through professional learning for teachers, special educators, and school administrators on topics ranging from compliance to instruction to equity. We have also actively been anal analyzing our curriculum to improve the cultural responsiveness. And we have established cross-functional teams at multiple levels of the organization to examine those practices. Next slide, please. A more focused approach to interrupting the identified and pers persistent predictable patterns is needed. Changing a system approach requires dedication to a common understanding, a commitment to embedded practices, processes, plans, and procedures to support and service students with a true equity lens grounded in an understanding and most importantly, monitored for the implementation with fidelity which includes accountability. In our multi-tiered systems of support, or MTSS, we focus on early intervention prior to identification. The use of early intervention and understanding the need for differentiated instruction to meet the needs of all students in the general education setting is key. There is no longer just one way to educate students. We incorporate a variety of instructional strategies to maximize student learning. The goal is to do this without applying a label to a student. An effective MTSS process can support students in the general education setting while obtaining their instruction from the content expert. Developing an understanding of the needs and the why for the root cause is their academic or behavioral deficit, which can occur during the MTSS process. This MTSS process and supporting students in general education before labeling them is a crucial piece to the interruption of the pattern as it relates directly to the removal of our ableist student population from core instruction and starting, and which will be the starting point for what appears to be an unintended outcome of support, which is now exclusion. Patterns in suspension should also be addressed. We cannot talk about this as though children being suspended just happens. Someone is making this happen. People are suspending students with IEPs and black students with IEPs at a high rate. Disrupting the pattern begins with building the capacity of staff, awareness, understanding, root cause, cultural and implicit bias, structural racism, and the use of alternative methods of discipline. BCPS needs to implement defined processes and procedures towards a response to behavioral needs of students with IEPs. BCPS needs to identify and train the use of alternative methods of exclusionary discipline practices. And BCPS needs to expand the comprehensive coordinated early intervent intervening services or the CCEIS model, which is currently being implemented to improve disproportionality of the 36 targeted schools. Our next slide will be with Dr. Lisa Williams. So in concluding this discussion, um, there were four trends that were seen across the data, data sets. Um, evidence of race predictability, ableist predictability, class predictability, and linguistic predictability. And one of the high level ideas that we try to offer is that although those patterns are presented as though they're isolated, this is an example of how they intersect. 
special education as a service does not serve all students in the same way. All students don't experience the same vulnerability um, in the same way as a condition of participating in the service or even vulnerability in being identified for participation in special education as a service. And that needs to be understood as decisions are ultimately made. So hopefully this examination of the drill down of the intersecting data gives you an idea of the complexities associated with applying an equity lens across the work of the organization. And that now connecting this discussion back to the work of the newly formed equity committee, it is really important that we understand as, as a committee how the inequities that we just discussed tonight, and this was just one example, are codified in the systems and structures, um, such as how they are mechanized through policies and, and policy implementation. Further, it's important for us to think about this larger question of capacity of the team to apply an equity lens to policy construction, such that the policies that are put forth by the organization are responsive to the patterns and the trends, like the ones that we've examined tonight. And then lastly, why it becomes incumbent upon us to think about disrupting uh, disparities through creation of mechanisms that have impact across the entirety of the organization, certainly as policies, rules, and procedures do. Um, and so at this point, we will um, conclude the discussion of the formal presentation and invite comments or thoughts from the board. Dr. Lisa Williams, thank you. And thank you, um, Dr. McComas and Dr. Wisted and Mr. Burke for that presentation. Board members, uh, I will now look for hands for board members um, that would like to make comments. Um, and I see Ms. Pasteur first and then Ms. Scott. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, Dr. McComas. Um, as always, the information is exemplary and it certainly uh, gives us food for thought. Uh, I am sure by now the two of you know where I'm getting ready to go. So we have this information, incredible information, and I know that like parents and educators, my question goes right to um, how we now take that deep dive and make some changes. We have the compass. Um, so I want to know what those next steps are. Early in this presentation, I saw that um, in it, that we need to now be having some serious conversations and thoughts about how we're going to change this paradigm for our children with special needs. How, we, how are we going to, what are we doing, not how, what are we doing or getting ready to do? What do our timelines look like that help us to really look at our um, African-American students and separate out those things that um, have happened as cultural barriers and those things that are educational barriers so that um, our children and our parents, because we know Dr. Williams, you know bo both Dr. Williams, that in the African American communities, we are often um, worried about um, labeling our children um, as have, uh, having IEPs and being disabled because for so long they were categorized as that just as a way of. Um, and putting them in a place and underserving them. And so I really want to get to what it is we as a system will be getting ready to do to or doing and doing, and I hope the, the part of it is doing, to fashion this new paradigm, this new instructional way so that we are going to change those numbers so that not even in a year from now are we still looking at those numbers in the same way. How are we preparing ourselves 
so that we, and especially in, in light of COVID, to tackle this and not have to see Dr. Williams give this presentation again and again and again. So I, I really would like someone to address that before you go, Ms. Causey, to another question. Have Missed, uh, well, Dr. Williams, do you, do you think go ahead, Lisa Williams? Well, no, um, would you go first and then I'll follow you, if you don't mind? And my pleasure. Um, so um, good evening, Ms. Pasture, and thank you as always for compelling questions. Um, I, I would first and foremost say, and, and you know, um, as a school instructional leader, um, that this work is multidimensional. And so it is really a multi-pronged approach. You spoke very specifically about the need to simultaneously um, address cultural proficiency as well as academic uh, capacity um, and the nuances of the interplay between the two. And so therefore, it, it, to answer your question, it, everything that we do has to be a, 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 a multi-tiered approach in that um, we have and continue to work explicitly around equity and understanding implicit bias um, because you know the implicit biases is, is something that um, left unexamined people don't even realize there's not malintent um, but it's um, an unexamined understanding so it's important to do that aspect of the work uh, with our professionals it's important to critically analyze the resources that we use and we discussed some of that in our curriculum committee the the analysis that we're actively working through to make sure that there's cultural representation. And, um, and then in addition, we have some um, technical mechanisms. So for example, one of the things that we have done as part of our compass and um, strategic plan is really revisited our school um, progress plan and using uh, data stories to help school communities understand and unpack what are the, what does the evidence of our data help us understand more fully about um, our practices? And then how do we begin to um, reconstruct practices that yield um, improved equitable outcomes for students? And so I know that that's a broad answer, Ms. Pastor, but it is truly, um, as you spoke to, multidimensional and interconnected between cultural proficiency and the uh, teaching and learning practices. So I'll mm -hmm. hand that over to Dr. Lisa Williams. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And, and um, to your point, what I was going to talk about is the, the hard conversations that we have to have, uh, the conversations that are not comfortable. Because if you dig further into the data, what you can see is that those indicators that are more subjective, which, you know, uh, depend on how we see things, you see kids of color at greater vulnerability for identification versus um, white students, right? And those are not the easiest conversations to have. But the reality is when you juxtapose the demographic and the continuing shift um, uh, in terms of our student population, these things are no longer luxuries that we can afford to take or leave. So to extend on what Dr. McComb has talked about, we have mechanisms around building cultural competency and race equity um, as embedded structures within really good practices that are in place. We have to have accountability around it because these are the ways in which we will most optimally serve the population that we have, not the population that we used to have, not the population maybe that we want, but the population that we have and the population that is to come. And so what we really are talking about is a transformation of our relationship as professionals to the students in the community that we serve. And that is where we are. And you know, change is hard and it's challenging, but my extension to what Dr. McComb has offered is that there is um, an opportunity for us to codify what we know is best practice when we center the students that we have, and quite frankly, to put accountability and supports in place so that we can continue to be more responsive as the population continues to shift. Mm -hmm. And and if I, I, I may jump back in on that, that, just to round that out, is yes, we, we have to be responsible. Um, and if Dr. McComas doesn't mind, it'll be too late because I'm getting ready to say it anyway. Um, after the last curriculum meeting, we had a conversation. Well, in fact, it started. Remember, at the meeting, I asked a question, and I, I asked later that you process um, with your team 
that, that I tend to ask the same kind of question. Ms. Mack asked the same kinds of questions. And so in presentation, if you sort of jump in front of us and put those things out there um, before, because you now know how we think, how all of us think, then we we do that. And, and Dr. McComas jumped right on it and, and knew exactly about what I was speaking. So it's sometimes, as Dr. Lisa Williams said, having those tough conversations and receiving them as Dr. McComas did, not as a criticism, but just as an open door, because it would never be that. But to say, wow, I, I, I see it. Um, I, I get it. And again, to use the name, because I think it's important to tell the truth and shame the devil, as the saying goes, um, Miss Edelman, who's Miss Goodman now, and she won't mind me putting her out there. She's a Baltimore County teacher. But when she came to us at Randallstown, she was a newbie. And at the beginning of the next year, she said, and it was tough. She had a tough year, and her location in the building was tough. But at the beat, but the children loved her. And again, Dr. Williams, and you pointed to this. She didn't look like the children by race, but they loved her, and 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 she got a lot out of them. But at the beginning of the next year, she said, "I made a list of all of the things that I did right my first year." And all of the, she said, I sat down to write a list of all the things I did right and all the things that the children um, um, did. And I realized that my side didn't have anything on it, that the children were on point. And I, pro I processed what I needed to learn about the children I was teaching rather than trying to make them the children I wanted them to be or expected them to be by my race and my experiences. And she moved them, and they never stopped moving. Um, and, and it is tough. It's putting that mirror in front of all of us. What is the work um, that needs to be done? So thank you. That was long, but I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much, both of you. And I'm looking forward, Dr. Darrell Williams, to that compass just opening the doors and the windows for new ways we're going to teach and respond to our children. Thank you. I'm done. Ms. Scott? Yes, hi. Thank you so much for that. And um, thank you both for this um, presentation. It was very... Um, enlightening and I um, learned a, a great deal. Um, I had a question I wanted to know, and I believe you already said this, you, uh, sorry, there's a little feedback, um, but you showed it sounds like the student body population in terms of um, able-bodiedness or, or um, disabilities that you spoke to the most, it looks like the, 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 the population that we are failing the most, it sounds like you're saying are African-American students. Um, across the system. And what I wanted to know was considering that, and when you spoke about suspensions, I wanted to know if our teachers, administrators, staff, if they are currently participating or receiving any sensitivity or cultural competency training or professional development. And if so, has it been updated since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? So um, I can speak to that question. We've been providing equity training across the organization for in a in a systemic way for at least seven years or so. Um, and certainly what the Department of Equity is doing now is really trying to understand all of the different ways in which this pandemic is impacting us. And so certainly you can appreciate that we are in a learning posture. Um, and some of our schools and some of our offices, uh, and I, as I'm sure you all are aware, are doing some really um, inventive things around taking what they've learned and, and putting that work into practice. Um, where we are now is at that hard place of bridging the knowing doing gap. 
Um, we, we know better. We have a sense of the difference that differences make, but we're talking about fundamentally behaving in ways that are sometimes um, they feel very uncertain for us. There are questions about who has the right to what conversation. Um, how do I get read if I say a certain thing? Will the community push back if I advance certain discussions? And so how we navigate um, this terrain of getting to the other side of we know that there are different ways that we need to be engaging through the lens of cultural competence racial equity, um, anti, um, using a, a, um, an inclusive lens to ensure that our students with disabilities have full access um, to supports that they need to thrive, that, that is where we are. Um, and so I think that's this is one of the reasons why um, it, it heartens, it certainly heartens me that the board has such interest because it's going to take some capital in order for us to, to push through to the other side of this. So I hope that answers your question because the Dr. short response is yes, we are engaging in that training. Dr. Okay. Williams, could you speak I, just a second to the yes. training that you prepared around COVID-19 and, and for new and for new teachers entering the system? Yeah, so um, when the pandemic um, started, that was the first thing we did was raise the specter of the ways in which um, we understood that the pandemic was disproportionately impacting the school district. And in very similar ways to the data patterns that are shown, you know, the most vulnerable populations in Baltimore County were ex experiencing the most disproportionate impacts. And so over the course of the shutdown, we've been holding conversations to, to have discussions about what we are finding as best practices and being able to engage families that are experiencing separations for all different kinds of reasons. And the one thing that I will say um, is that we should be prepared for different groups of folks to fall into the gap because of different impacts, some of which we know, some of which is yet to be known. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. That's very important. And um, to that, and based on your report, I would move that this board direct uh, Dr. Daryl Williams to bring to this board a plan uh, with an equity lens to show us how the system plans to address the higher suspension rate of black students with IEPs, because that sounded like something that was very stark that stood out in your report. So um, uh, that's a motion that, that I would make for him to bring to us at um, the first board meeting in November. Second. Ms. Jones is a second. Thank you. So first I would ask Dr. Williams to um, clarify for us um, his response or to get more information from you. Dr. Williams. So uh, thank you, Ms. Causey, and thank you, uh, Mr. Burke, Dr. Uh, McCombs, Dr. Wistead, and Dr. Williams for the presentation. Uh, I shared with the board a sample um, <clears throat> during the weekly update, but I'll be happy to provide the work that the system is trying to do, even during this pandemic, um, where we are showing each of the focus areas. As you know, there's five, and then one that you raised, Ms. Scott, is focusing around the safe and supportive environment. So for each of the focus areas, I will be showing to the board and to the community just the alignment of what are those uh, goals that we're trying to establish for each one of those focus areas, the equity commitment, looking through an equity, equity lens, and then how we're doing the work across the system. So there's big picture work related to our divisions where they have their initiatives, they have their division goals, they have their action steps. That's the system. We have our local school, as you heard earlier, around our school progress plans, where there are questions that are asked related to what steps are being done to improve the student outcome in literacy or in math. What's the culture that you're trying to create for success for students? And then as we're looking at the school and progress plan, we're asking how are we raising the bar and closing the gap? So there's some very specific data that schools will be looking at for kids who may not have achieved over a period of time. Um, I will just reference um, every, uh, there are the SLOs that staff members must have, but I will show to you the work of the division and then the work at the school. And then a new concept that we've created 
is called the System Improvement Team. This is, as I shared, a, a focus of 11 areas. Suspension is one of them to determine what are the what is the charge. We want to look at the number of kids going into algebra, for an example. We want to look at the suspension rate and then drill down to talk about the barriers, the challenges, and look at what are those best practices that may be happening in some of our schools, but not across the whole district. How do we replicate some of those best practices? Or to look at things outside of the system. So we have 11 system improvement teams. So you're asked for the suspension. Um, each focus team has probably met once or twice at this point. We can talk about the charge of the system we can talk about the work of that division, the school climate and safety. Uh, we can talk about the deliverables um, and what we're trying to do. And as it was said, you know, we are working in the midst of the pandemic, but we're still trying to do the heavy lifting in spite of, in, in terms of what we know at this point. Again, these groups will be fluid in terms of looking at other data points and some of the challenges. But I just want to elevate that to the board that there is this through line from the school base all the way to central office to get us to move the data, but looking at each of the focus areas uh, with the equity lens and commitment and looking at specific goals that we're wanted to, we want to accomplish uh, each year within this compass. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And I guess I would just say that um, I understand that looking at it, uh, evaluating it, um, working on it, but I think with this motion, what I was looking at are tangible things that the system is doing to address this issue that was highlighted in the report. Um, a higher rate of students being suspended with IEPs is, is alarming. And I want to know what we are doing. I would like the motion that I brought up is a plan. What plan if there's not one in the works, what plan are we creating or can we create to address this issue? And I want to just make sure that that's what, um, it's clear that that's what my motion is, to address this issue, to work to resolve it. Not what has been done, but what steps, what innovative measures are we doing? What forward steps are we taking as a system so that we can address um, this issue of, uh, from what I heard, a, a higher rate of students with IEPs, predominantly black students with IEPs, being suspended. Ms. Scott, so to clarify, uh, I believe you asked for a presentation at the first meeting in November? A plan, yes. Okay, so Dr. Williams, the, my question to you is, um, is that a uh, realistic deliverable that if the board votes for this, that that's um, that that. I'm not that's sure why realistic. that would not be. We're these are professionals, and this is what they do all day, every day. So I'm not sure why that wouldn't be a realistic deliverable. I'm asking Dr. Williams for his input. We can present a plan um, based on what was shared today. Um, and based on the work that we are embarking this year and to identify the through line as to what's happening school level all the way up to a central office, big picture. We can provide that overview. Thank you. Thank you. So um, other board discussion of this motion and who was the second? It was me, Ms. Um, Jones. Oh, I, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, so board members, is there uh, other comments or questions or discussion before we take a vote on this motion? Yes, um, I have one connected to that motion. Yes, Ms. Pasture. All right, um, Dr. Williams, uh, Darrell Williams, and, um, and, and maybe uh, Dr. Wistead, um, you'll decide who the folks are. I, I'd like for you, inclusive of that, to be thinking about the areas of dyslexia and dysgraphia. Um, I'm of the impressions over many years that 
where African-American children are concerned, somehow we don't process those two with them, but we tend to see um, their disabilities in other lights, and we don't we don't embrace the fullness of dyslexia and dysgraphia. I'd, I'd like included in that some sort of discussion about that because it seems to me we that gets missed um, too often uh, for children of color. So, uh, Ms. Pesher, this is Melissa Wisted. Um, we. Uh, for as far as being able to discriminate out which students have dyslexia or dysgraphia, the, that's not a coding that we use. Um, you know, it's not recognized by the state specifically. It, it typically falls under something else, as you were stating before, like a specific learning disability or other health impairment. Um, but we can work with. Um, our school psychologist, perhaps, and, and Dr. Piran Dozi to see um, what information we can bring to you on that. And 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 let me be clear, Dr. Wistead, I understand that, um, but I'm sure you know that where parents are concerned, and um, often even where educators are concerned in the general population, because there there's not a, they don't know a lot about it. So there are some areas that parents, for example, can watch their children and, and have an understanding and say, well, maybe it's this, that, or the other. But they might not recognize that. And because too often, because of the history of labeling, they may be reticent in asking, what do you think? So some of what I'm looking for is how do we impart information, particularly in communities where that is not uh, predominant uh, uh, a discussion point, if you will. It's an information thing. I think there needs to be more information about it, uh, more education about it, and I just like to see in the discussion. It's not necessarily something that we're doing now, as Ms. Scott pointed out, but where can we go in making sure that we are doing better in terms of the conversation? And if at some point between now and the next meeting, you would, and I, I can have that conversation so I can even clarify more. And Ms. Scott might want to join us in that conversation. I'd be more than happy to do that because over my years, that has been a battle, getting um, African-American parents to understand what they are, what it means, what to look for, how to articulate that when talking about their children. Thank you, Ms. Fesher. So, Ms. Pastor, is that, is that an amendment that you wanted to make to Ms. Scott's motion, or is, is that a separate issue? Because I would like to process Ms. Scott's motion. No, no, I don't. No, 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 no. Uh, Ms. Scott's um, question was fine. I just wanted to make sure that that's included in the discussion, because if we were in another world, that would have been included in our thinking. But it's not. So I just wanted to throw that out. I don't want to. Um, what she said is fine. That ought to be included. In okay, thank you. So we have Miss Scott's motion with a second, and there are hands up uh, for the equity committee. I mean, for the equity presentation. So if there are any board members with any discussion related to Miss Scott's motion, uh, please just make your comment. Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, Ms. Gover? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Mr. <coughs> yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? 
Yes. Mr. McMillian? He appears to be on the call. He's just muted. Thank you. The motion carries. So I'm going to, um, so Dr. Williams, thank you for making those arrangements for the board. Uh, I'm going to go back to the board members that uh, had comments or questions related to the presentation. And next up is Mr. Kuhn, then Dr. Hager, then Ms. Rowe, um, and then Ms. Joes. Well, thank you, Ms. Clausey. Thank you for this presentation. I appreciate it. I was looking to expand and understand better what it is we do here. And um, part of my concern is that um, this presentation wasn't made available before uh, the meeting uh, because I would have loved to have reviewed it. And, um, uh, you know, it's kind of difficult to follow and ask questions um, now that we're <laughs> 30 minutes past the actual discussion. Um, I do have a few questions and um, I'll try and make them quick because I know that we are now officially one hour behind schedule. Um, during the conversation, uh, Dr. Wistead, you, you mentioned 36 targeted schools. Could you please expand on that as to what that means? And are there 36 sure. specific schools in BCPS that we're focused on? So there was something that the Maryland State Department of Education designated BCPS um, because of the indicator that we did not meet. Uh, we were targeted for the disproportionality, as, as we were saying before, and the CCIS, the Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervening Services, is the title of what the Maryland State Department of Education calls it. We targeted 36 schools. This was beginning last school year in which um, reviewing their data, we were working with them with professional learning so that they would have a reduced gap in their suspensions based on race as well as the second layer of students with disabilities. So that is already happening. It happened last school year and it is happening this school year. I mean, that could certainly be part of the more detailed presentation next month um, to explain to the public and, and the board what that effort is. But that is specific because of the targeted disproportionality we had for students who are Afri African American and identified as needing an IEP. All right, thank you. I would I just, appreciate it. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you. And I just would like to add um, for you, Mr. Kinnan, for everyone, um, just as we said at the beginning of the report that the state does um, help, help us monitor uh, our data and um, help us identify what are thresholds that really warrant uh, additional support. So I just hope that everyone understands the expression targeted is, is really to help us clarify our focus to make sure that we're driving supports and services so that students um, in the long run are benefiting from our very focused continuous improvement efforts in alignment with um, the state. So I just wanted to add a little bit more context to that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I would, I just want to follow on that a little, a little bit more. Um, and in this presentation, does this presentation based on a report that, that we have somewhere any, anyone can answer that if you'd like. So, so the, oh, go oh, ahead, Lisa. No worries. Um, the presentation is a, this presentation was a follow up to the presentation that was offered to the um, board equity committee and the larger board. Uh, I think it was the session before last. So this was a follow up to that discussion. 
I understand that we were going to have an equity presentation. I guess my question is, this is a presentation. I'm wondering, and and you you spoke multiple times about data sets that we have, and I am curious about the data sets. I'm curious about the 36 targeted schools that we're focused on, and I'm I'm curious uh, about. Um, school-specific data being provided to board members and to the public so that we can see what's happening. So um, what I'm, I'm hopeful for and what I expect to see is um, another a report. I believe you, you provided a report that is actually attached to board docs, but it seems to be um, out of date because I believe it's associated with the data that we saw and was discussed briefly um, at the last meeting. So I'm just trying to make sense of what's in front of me, and there's no discussion in the the report that was attached to board docs for the public's viewing, and um, anything to do with uh, students with disabilities. So, um, I would like uh, that to be provided, and perhaps it can be updated and or shared um, to the board, but also for the public by the next time that we meet. Uh, to, to discuss this further because it's it's a very important topic. So thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, as Dr. Lisa Williams shared, this was a follow-up, but as was just announced about a presentation in November, uh, we can definitely follow up to uh, what Dr. Whitstead expressed and the work that the schools and the school system are doing to address uh, this topic related to suspension. So we'll have that for the next board meeting. And oh, not the next board meeting, the meeting in November as requested. Great. I appreciate that. Yep. Um, just to, to uh, follow on uh, with that uh, a little bit further, um, the the data that has been provided is very valuable. And, and, and my um, purpose for asking these questions is to to create further understanding and share it in a public setting. And I want to make sure that it's available to folks. Uh, so one thing that would be very valuable um, is to understand the feedback that the state has given to us. And they have, um, they have um, highlighted specific areas for us to, to focus on so that um, uh, we can we can address the issue that's been found. Is there information that the state has shared? Is it online somewhere? Um, is it made available to the public somewhere? Uh, can we add a link to it on board docs or at least share it internally um, and, and put it out there so that folks um, can take a look at this themselves to fully understand what we're dealing with here and, and what the data actually says? Dr. Williams is yes. Is, let let the team, Mr. Kuhn, uh, let the team and I follow up with that request. And as as you shared before, when we are presenting, we will have information uh, on in board docs. Um, just absent of it, without an explanation, may not be helpful for the public. So allow us to spend some time to work on what you're requesting. Thank you very much. I have nothing okay. to at this time. Okay, and Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you. Actually, my, my questions are very similar to Mr. Kuhn, so they build off of those nicely. I do want to thank you for the presentation. Um, talking about intersectionalities is something that's really, really important in this line of work. Um, and sharing the statistics on relative risks, and you, you guys described this very well, which was really nice. Um, but I, I guess, similar to what Mr. King was asking, if, if we're reporting this data to MSDE, then and MSDE came back and said that we had an issue and that we needed to resolve it, and we had to implement these uh, CCES uh, protocols in these 36 schools. Like, th so that tells me this was done about two years ago, that these data were analyzed presented to MSD in some sort of a report which led to 
the requirement that we implement an intervention starting last year. And so I was wondering if someone could talk a little bit more about that process and if this data that we've been sharing with MSDE that led to led to the intervention that was required is only for the intersection with ableism or if there's an overall kind of equity report that has been shared in the past with the State Department of Education. Well, so, Dr. Haker, I'll start and we'll ask others to join in, but um, again, if, if I think what's what's needed next step is to talk about how suspension is reported to the state. And there's discretionary and there's non-discretionary. Um, this has been a concern for many areas, many districts. I won't name start naming them, but I will just say, I think we got to provide a little bit more of that context and what we have been doing uh, with with schools based on the feedback from MSDE. Um, but there's an there 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 are the categories of what is discretionary and non-discretionary, and it gets back to what Dr. Lisa Williams and and Dr. Whitstead and Dr. McComas talked about, just looking at what we're doing at our schools, working with our adults working with our families and our kids. Um, but I'll, I'll pause to see if um, anyone else wants to add to that. So, Dr. Williams, I can just jump in that um, very basic information is shared with the Maryland State Department of Ed Education. For instance, we share the numbers of students with IEPs. We share the categories in which those students are identified. We also share suspension information with them. So then the Maryland State Department of Education comes back to us with a formula in which they have used to share with us that we're not meeting their criteria. So if that helps, that's just a very basic way that um, to, to initially answer that question. Again, we can get into more details, um, you know, in a, in a future report, but that's the uh, initial information that goes to them. So if I could jump in for a minute. So to Mr. Kuhn and Dr. Hager's point, I think um, the key is having that data that ties to the presentation um, in board docs in the same location. So is there a link of what Dr. Hager is referencing? Is that a report that's on the website or is it in a dashboard um, so that she can, you know, analyze those we side by side? With the Department of Research Accountability and Assessment to see what could be made available. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just had one follow-up question, and that is whether the um, CCES approach, is that something that was also mandated by the state, or is that something that Baltimore County came up with as a, an approach to address this concern? That is mandated by the state. So it's an evidence-based program that they feel is the right approach to address this? Or? Well, the... Um I will share that they uh, require that we put something together um, and then different districts do it in different ways. We've collaborated with other districts um, to understand, you know, which, which districts were doing uh, what mechanisms. So uh, it is tailored to BCPS. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. Next is Ms. Rowe. So I have a couple questions. One of my questions is, did the state, when they had these findings, publish any kind of a report or give the school system any kind of a report with these findings? And can we have a copy of that report? We can work with the, the Department of Research Accountability and Assessment to share data. Um, the Maryland State Department of Education sends a, a memo, uh, a type of letter to the superintendent uh, annually for different items to share what our status is in the different categories. Okay, so presumably we could see that memo. Uh, well, I 
we'll leave that up to the superintendent and uh, you, know, you know the senior leaders to decide what could be shared with you in um, perhaps like a weekly update of some kind. Okay. Um, so yes, we can we can share the information again. I think for the presentation, upcoming presentation, to provide the context, the the big picture, and what happens, and then drilling down to those action items. I think that's important. So yes, we okay. can share. Um, I heard in the presentation very briefly mentioned the words root cause analysis. And I wanted to know, have we ever done a root cause analysis? Are we planning to do one? And um, in the process of that root cause analysis, I also hear a certain kind of dissidence. But on the one hand, the data implies that certain student groups are over-identified for special education. But on the other hand, special ed advocates complain that these same student groups may be under-identified, in particularly the things Ms. Pasteur mentioned with different reading disabilities. And how do you reconcile these two seemingly opposite results? So maybe that's two questions, actually. So Ms. Rowe, I will um, begin to address your question. So we, we do engage in root cause analysis. It is part of our annual school um, reflection and progress planning um, process. You know, earlier I had mentioned how um, part of our SPP process is understanding our data and understanding the data story, um, which then, of course, helps you identify where to begin that root cause analysis. I think that um, these are complex challenges, and so it takes... Um, ongoing effort to understand the root cause, um, to identify those things that we have control over, those things that we do not have control over, um, so that we can understand very clearly what are the systems that may um, unintentionally be creating um, disproportional um, outcomes or unintentionally not helping us um, really clarify and understand what a, a learning challenge is or, or what a student may be struggling with um, in being successful. And so um, your you know, simple answer is yes, we do that, um, but it's not as simple as just a one time you do it and that is that. Um, and then I, forgive me, Ms. Um, Bird, but I can't remember the second part of your question. Oh, I think it was around why are perhaps some students not identified, they may be, um, categorized uh, well, so the data, than, so. Yeah, the data that we just heard suggests that um, there's a disproportionality in identifying, yeah. for instance, African-Americans in that they're, they may be being over-identified, but at the same time, we hear special ed advocates and different people bring up that that same student group is under-identified for special education. So to me, those seem like two very different things. And I would be looking to a root cause analysis to try to understand why we're getting what appears to be conflicting information. And so I, I'm concerned that we could spend all day speculating on a myriad of reasons, but I would like to see this studied and have actual data come forward to explain precisely the reasons why we're seeing these things. So, um, Ms. Rowe, with, I won't speak to the root cause piece because I think Dr. boswell McComas just did that, but I think the question that Ms. Pasteur asked sort of illuminates how it could be that a student group could be over-identified and under-identified at the same time. So, as an example, if we don't have good ways to identify dyslexic students or dysgraphic students, if they all are just categorized as learning disabled, um, then that could very easily obscure the um, occurrence of either one of those disorders within that construct. So in that way, unless parents had the resources to get their kids outside assessments, you could see under identification um, when we think about how often those kinds of things occur in the population. Similarly speaking, um, at the same time, that same student group, and I'm thinking about black students because that was the example Ms. Pastor gave us. If we look at emotional disturbance, we look at those that same student group 
as over-identified when you look at the occurrence of what we expect in terms of that phenomenology in the population. So it is true that by category, a group of students could be both over-identified and under-identified at the same time. That would require us to parse through the ways in which we identify students to see those variances. So hopefully that provides some clarification. It does. I guess what I'm hoping to see um, upcoming in the near future is some recommendations from you on what we need to do to begin to move forward on these issues, because it sounds like what you're saying is that we need more precision in how we do things. And um, I would like to hear what changes can be made to create that precision. Ms. Rowe, this is Melissa Wistead again. Um, something that was mentioned in one of the later slides, that multi-tiered system of support, or in BCPS we call it our student support team. Um, I, I was stating some ways in which uh, we should be supporting children and exposing them to items that they need prior to identification. So, you know, we believe if there's a strong multi-tiered system of support in place academically and behaviorally for students, we may see less identification happening. I mean, we can also share statistics on how there are children that jump right to IEP team to be evaluated and identified who have never had a student support team or the, the school team perhaps did not um, spend months or even, you know, several months providing interventions prior to going to IEP team. So that's just one example of um, where the over identification is coming from. And again, those are things we could share perhaps in a future presentation. Thank you, that's all my questions for the moment. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Williams, for that presentation and Dr. McComas. A lot of my comments were um, addressed by Ms. Scott. So my question to um, whoever is willing to answer this, and it's gonna be hard is, what are your thoughts on the very fact that the whole idea of achievement gap, and this is something I read, is rooted on a very racial stereotype um, that black and brown children have to face because it is based on um, a race-based race racial hierarchy, which could you could say is rooted in bigoted intelligence because you know there's a very a concept that somebody that cannot achieve a, a standardized test does not mean they're not intelligent. Um, so where, what are your thoughts on that? And secondly, you know, I see, I, I've always heard about the black suspension rates that are higher, but to see that in terms of um, numbers, it is very numbing. And I do data, so I can talk about data all day long, but this is not just a data analysis. It's I believe you gave us a report and a lot of that, what you presented today is based on that report. Is that correct? Uh, Dr. Yes. Yes. Right. So you've divulged from a, um, you know, a high point to a granular data. And that's what I thought I saw in this presentation, which was well done. So when I'm looking at this problem and, you know, to Dr. Daryl Williams, I want to see a plan and I'm glad Ms. Scott made that motion to close this opportunity gap, which I think it exists among our students. And, and that's the first step in what we can do to be proactive. If we have the suspension rate of black female students are being disproportionately suspended because they're seen as mouthy or because you know they, are, they have a attitude problem, that's something we need to address in a more uh, robust way. And, and yes, like Dr. Lisa Williams said, some of that conversations may be difficult. And, um, might make people move around in their seats, but that is not the issue we are trying to solve. Um, for far too long, people of color in this country have been uncomfortable. So we have to address this and we have to do this right because this is this one chance we are getting to address it. So 
I'm going to push you, Dr. Daryl Williams, to close that achievement gap, that opportunity gap that should not exist. And what could the board do to support you in this endeavor? Because when somebody comes in and establishes a bullying task force, that to me is a reactive, um, you're reacting to something. To me, something would be proactive, would be seeing why do we have a bullying task? Why do we need a bullying task force? What could we do to address the kids that are bullying? And what could we do to, to stop that from happening instead of condemning those kids that are bullying that often are subject to bullying at home and elsewhere. So for me, this this is going to lead to some very hard conversations. That is one of the reasons why I pushed for Ms. Scott to establish the equity committee. And I'm glad she's doing a great job. So kudos to her and to all of the uh, members from the staff that help in the equity committee. So um, again, my question is to Dr. Daryl Williams. What kind of um, action items are we going to see from you? Well, that's the work, Ms. Joes. Um, it's more than just the system, as you as it was pr presented earlier today, is re-examining our policies, re-examining our practices, as Dr. Lisa Williams talked about, having those conversations, um, those tough conversations, looking at the work that we can do as a system, looking at the work that we can do at individual schools, and then partnering with our families as well. Um, because to your point, um, this is one data point and there's several other data points that definitely uh, we are analyzing because we wanna see a change. Uh, for this one, uh, it's, gonna take, it's gonna take some work. It's gonna take a, a collaborative effort. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's going to be the work that we all have to participate. And as it was shared from the presentation, um, what we're gonna need is uh, building each other's capacity around equity and what that looks like and feels like, and then seeing it in action. Um, so there's gonna require some learning, a lot of learning, some tough conversations, looking at our practices, looking at what we do. Um, and so I would just offer, yes, we're committed as a, as a district system leaders. We have to drill down entirely into every school and even to our communities. And I must, I must say, you know, our principals are having those conversations. We've had several of our principals to come to the table and talk about the work that they're doing. Um, but they always say it's challenging and it's a learning opportunity for them as well. Um, so uh, I appreciate your comments and um, we'll, we'll be prepared to start most of this conversation uh, in November, but I'm pretty sure we'll be having these conversations around equity and around the work that we're doing um, as a system. The challenge is the current state that we're in um, I must must edify that as well, but that's that that's just causing us a, a different way of going about the work um, while we're in this virtual learning environment. So I thank you, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And yes, I have seen a lot of principals and teachers engage in this um, work, and I'm very impressed by BCPS's um, principals and teachers that are actually. Uh, quite frankly, leading a lot of that uh, conversations, which I have heard. And um, so I want to thank them as well for actually leading me to be an advocate for this. Ms. Mack? Yes, I, I think this was a comment that um, Dr. Wistead made, and I wanted a clarification. It's my understanding that the state got involved when we looked at the intersectionality of African-American students with an IEP who were also suspended. Is that a true statement? Correct. They have been monitoring, and they do this for every school system, they monitor if there is a disproportionate number. Well, there's multiple indicators, but the ones we shared tonight talked about the indicator where there was a disproportionate number of students being suspended with IEPs. And in our case, that was African-American students who had IEPs. There was also an indicator in which 
um, you know, we have an overrepresentation in the different disability categories, which was reviewed tonight as well. Does the state also look at um, academic achievement data and the gaps there and get involved? For example, 37.3% uh, of our students read on grade level in third grade, but um, 24, only 24.3% of African Americans, 24.9% of Hispanic. And then when you overlay the intersectionality of arms, which is another 22.4%, have we gotten a report from the state on a topic such as that? Well, I can share, I believe that uh, our Department of Research Accountability and Assessment gets that for every category, but um, as far as in special education, yes, academic achievement is also an indicator. And, and our, so our, the our, state would point out would point out to us that we have those gaps when those conditions exist and they, expect us to address that, is that correct? Yes, for special education particularly, I can answer yes. And do you know if it's also uh, reported out for non-special education students? Because it's a very alarming gap. And when you think about up until the third grade, you learn to read and from the third grade on, you read to learn. And with so few children being on grade level in reading and even fewer children of color, that's very concerning to me. And I would hope the state would hold us accountable for that. Well, I mean, there's a, a history of the state holding school systems accountable for their academic achievement. Um, so, yes, that is something that annually happens. Um, you know, I, I can just share personally, when I was a principal, I was a part of a school that was in improvement. So yes, there are ratings and there are accountability measures through the state um, for schools overall and school systems overall. And I believe that's reported out, um, you know, when the Department of Research Accountability and Assessment shares data and, and does board reports as well. They, they share where our um, achievement is. Thank you, Dr. Wistet. I appreciate the input. Ms. Pasture, I see your hand. Was that from before or did you have uh, another comment? No, no I, do, I do have a, a comment. Um, and I wanna just go back to the challenge that was given to um, Dr. Williams. I'm, I'm hoping that we're all clear. I'm a 71-year-old woman who's been in this storm way too long and seen this evolution. This is not going to happen overnight. Dr. Williams might not even be still superintendent of Baltimore County when all of this um, in our heads comes to fruition because it did not happen overnight. It did not happen from one superintendent or two or three or four. So when I asked the question about the dyslexia, dysgraphia, and talked about communication, Dr. Williams said parenting, this is big, 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 big. It means changing paradigms in terms of how we relate to our parents. This is about how we do professional development. So even when Ms. Ms. Scott asked about the five minutes at the end, it might be that one of us say every minute, meeting, I want to hear about such and such that deals with this equity issue. And that might be a piece that's going to be tagged on to every meeting for as long as we're on the board. So I really don't, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm the first one that said about three board meetings ago, I want to see a plan. But I didn't mean I want to see the plan. And once we get to the bottom of the plan, we will have hit the panacea and all the children will be equal and all will be well. This didn't happen overnight. This has a term to it. It has terminology to it. So let's just get real with that, that has become endemic. And so it's not gonna be fixed overnight. So Dr. Williams, I'm not asking to see at the next meeting um, that, that report that's gonna be the panacea. But what I am asking, and I'm encouraging all of us to process 
is that this is ongoing, but it is specific. It is taking a look at every particular little thing that anyone brings up and says, you know, we maybe maybe we need to consider this and this and this and this. This is not an easy task on which we are embarking. This is big. This is about the world in which we're existing and the people and their attitudes in it. And that's why I said we all, all of us, brown people, black people, white people, we all need to take a look in that mirror before we start pointing fingers because we all, including myself, have a part in, in why this looks like it looks. It is not about something we can really easily put on paper. I just needed to say that as the old woman on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pesture. And I see uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillips. Would you like to make some comments? Yes, I would. And thank you so much, Ms. Kazi, and members of the board. You know, as we're listening to the conversation, I have members of my team on and they're listening and we're actually communicating back and forth in terms of what type of data we have and what data would be available to help support the work. And I certainly concur that it's more than just the numbers, it's really the action around it. And Dr. Williams has talked about specific charges that he's given us as staff members, members of cabinet, as well as members of his um, executive team to really begin to take a look at the disproportionality, but not just look at it in terms of students receiving special education services, but looking across the board in terms of students across different races, looking at students receiving specific services, but also looking at students for whom may be experiencing homelessness. So in terms of the data, our team stands ready to help. I'm not sure that we have all the data that we were that was just assigned as us having, but we certainly will be working with um, our colleagues and also working um, collaboratively to really work to meet the, the requests of the board. But I think it's so much more than just the numbers. It's really looking at the action steps that have been identified. And under his leadership, he has a clear plan in terms of how we work, will work together across 11 different focus groups. They're very specific specific deliverables that are listed. There are very specific expectations that he shared in terms of how we will report our progress, but not just talk about it, what we're going to do, and also working with principals as part of that plan as well. So I just wanted to share that. It's so much more than just the numbers. It really is around the work that we're doing and the work that we will continue to do under his leadership, very specifically across a number of different areas. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lutley Phillips. And I'll just make the uh, last comment and then we'll move on to the next item. Um, I just really appreciate my board members' dedication to these issues. I've uh, been on the board for over five years and uh, the first three solid of them, we were getting um, information data about how well things were going and how well things were improving. And while these numbers are stark and disturbing and they hit us right here about where we want to see improvement for our children. The beginning is the truth of what the data shows and then digging deeper, like other people have said, what is the root cause analysis? What is the, the human uh, impact on why these things are happening and how can we change that? So I really appreciate uh, Dr. Williams working on this and uh, the rest of the board in the comments because we are committed to making work, not just having the courageous conversations, which needs to be there, but the, the as, as uh, Ms. Scott said, what is the plan? What, what are those actions that are gonna make a difference for our children? So thank you all very much. So and Ms. Causey, if I, if I just may add, I just want to Certainly. just highlight, this is not a one and done. And as several board members we're sharing data points. Um, it, it's going to take some time, as we all know, particularly in the conditions that we're in, but definitely it's going to take a concerted effort. This, particularly this data point, it is just not just the school, it's the system, the school, the board, our community. And you can look at each one of our data points and realize that it's a collective effort. So it's, you know, the more we present, the more questions that you will raise, we may not have the answer, but that won't stop us from trying to figure it out. That's what school improvement is about. That's what district improvement is about. It is not going to happen overnight, 
Um, so I just want to um, kind of make sure everyone has expectations. We don't have the bullet to say, here are the five steps, and therefore we're going to get results. We're a big system, but it's not going to stop us from doing our work. So, it, But it will take some time. These data points have been uh, reviewed, and I appreciate uh, Draw and Dr. Wheatley Phillips and her team for doing what they need to do. And so we are happy to come forth with a plan, uh, but it's not going to be the magic bullet to solve all of this. It's going to show us how we're trying to move in this direction, and we're going to do that with many of our data points. So I just want to just kind of manage expectations a little bit about what may be coming down the road. Okay, thank you very much. So our next item is item L, new business contract awards. And for that, I call on Building and Contracts Committee Chair, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening. Items L1 through L7 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Ms. Hen, I did want to um, ask some questions about item uh, one. So is it, um, I'm going to separate that out if that's okay. Do I have a motion to approve items L6 through L7? So moved, Ro. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any Ms. discussion? Did you yes. just say six? Did you say L6 through L7? Or two through seven? Did you mean to say two through seven? I apologize. I haven't eaten all of my Snickers yet, so. Um, <laughs> um, items L2 through L7. So, Ms. Rowe, you made the so motion. Moved. Thank you. And the second? No second is needed. Oh, I'm sorry. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have oh, a- Kathleen, uh, sorry, I have my hand raised. This is Erin Hager. Yes, Dr. Sorry. Hager. Sorry. Um, I just had a quick question. The um, item with nursing and first aid supplies, I looked at the um, list. I just was wondering if that um, was related to any of the PPE that is going to be planned for potential school reopenings, or if that's just standard uh, materials that would have been purchased any other year? I can answer that for Dr. Hager. Um, we discussed it, hi, we discussed it in committee, and it was mentioned that that does include PPE. But Wonderful. if staff are available, great. they can address it in more detail if you like. I was just curious, thank you. Uh-huh. Other questions? Hi, this is Russ Kuhn. I'd like to follow on uh, Dr. Hager's question. Um, my understanding is that there was a, a CARES Act funding um, and that some of that funding could be used for these types of materials. Is that accurate? And are we spending CARES Act funding on these materials? Dr. Scriven or uh, Mr. Saris? Yeah, George, yeah, George is, is going George to Saris, respond. And um, we did discuss at the uh, Building and Contracts Committee that uh, approximately $900,000 in grant funding is included in this $1.15 million total. Uh, we've already uh, encumbered uh, about $770,000 in uh, related PPE and uh, nursing supplies related to school opening. And we still have some additional uh, spending capacity uh, it, as it's needed. Uh, Mr. Saris, uh, just to follow on, is this the only contract that that we're using to purchase PPE and, and um, safety supplies for schools? 
Um, let's see. We have uh, get to that vendor list. Um, I believe so that all of our everything that we have needed has been available from these uh, seven vendors. And this is a contract that was in place prior to COVID. Um, we also, uh, earlier in the year uh, in March, uh, participated in a uh, cooperative agreement with the Mid-Atlantic Purchasing Council of Metropolitan DC and Baltimore, and uh, were able to purchase uh, some materials for food and nutrition on that uh, separate contract. Thank you. You're welcome. Other board members may have a roll call vote on items L2 through L7. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. <clears throat> Mahansa? Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Han? Ms. Han? It appears that Ms. Hen is frozen. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Mr. McMillian? Ms. Mack? Yes, yes, yes. Ms. Scott? Ms. Rowe? Yes. That's seven Ms. in favor. Thank you, the motion carries. And the, um, on item L1, uh, Mr. Saris, I was uh, looking over the um, contract, the uh, recommendation form, and I had a couple questions. The first one is, this contract was approved by the board on Tuesday, May 19th, 2015. So was it a uh, RFP or what type of procurement was it back in 2015? Uh, let's see here. Yes, that was a, uh, a competitive request for proposal and um, nine vendors requested uh, the bid, the solicitation materials. Uh, two bids were received. Both were found to be, uh, to met the specifications and were awarded uh, this contract. Okay, thank you. And um, it's not on this list, but do you have the relative breakdown of between the um, procurement amount between those two companies? Um, let's see, I have a report. If I can do some quick math here, uh, let's see. I would say that um, the the majority, uh, significant majority of uh, purchases have been through 
uh, Menchi music. Um, I want to say about 15 or 20 percent have been uh, through um, our other vendor, uh, Music and Arts. Okay, great. And and I uh, appreciate the updates that you've made to the uh, form um, recommended by the Building and Contracts Committee. Um, and if you could just walk through those green, the prior fiscal year actual is 114,000, but this year is 325,000. And I read in the memo that that's related to additional cleaning of the instruments because of COVID. So um, we have uh, so far spent this year um, about $127,000 on both uh, cleaning and repairs. Um, last year, we spent $114,000. That's FY20. Um, the average is $108,000. So uh, nothing in these green areas really indicates what we've spent this year. But the $326,000 uh, is really the lifetime uh, expenditures on the contract from 2015 through to present. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Board members, can I have a motion to approve item L1? So moved. So moved, Mac. Thank you. No second is needed because the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahonza? Yes. Ms. Penn? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jones? Mr. McMillian? I think Mr. McMillian is muted. He's having trouble. Ms. Pasture? Ms. Mack? Yes. 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 Ms. Scott? Ms. Rowe? Yes. We have eight in favor. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Um, and actually, you can all stay right there because the next item is the report on the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. And so we ask uh, Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit to lead that presentation. Thank you. Just a, a question for you, Madam Chair. Uh, I believe there potentially was an item prior to the multi-year improvement. Mr. Saris was going to give an update on the procurement process. Did you still want that to happen? Thank you, Dr. Scriven. We do want that to happen. So that yes, is item L8. So we will process that, which is the vendor selection process overview. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Saris. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Scriven and Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, review some of the basic uh, issues uh, when uh, soliciting uh, for uh, professional services uh, as distinguished from a commodity. Uh, we would do a request for a proposal and uh, the uh, criteria are not simply price alone, but rather a combination of factors uh, that consider the uh, quality and competence of the, of the bidders and their ability to perform under the contract, as well as the price that collectively uh, would give the board 
the best value. Um, the initial phase of an RFP would be to prepare a scope of work. That would be typically uh, written by the office uh, who is seeking the services with uh, the input, of course, from purchasing staff as needed. Uh, that scope of work uh, would describe the service, the specific service, um, whether it's billed hourly or by some other uh, unit of measurement, uh, where the services are to be performed and for how long, what are the specific deliverables that the office uh, is seeking, and possibly even a sample of the work product. Um, the uh, Within the request for proposal would also be contained the award criteria and and if there's a weighted formula or uh, another matrix by which to uh, value the various criteria, obviously price would be one, experience, uh, location, demonstrated understanding of the proposal, any necessary licensing, um, whether work is to be done on site, in which case, you know, the location of the, the resident location of the, the vendor would be important. Um, once uh, those um, criteria are established and the scope of work is established, uh, that information would be put together in the one of the standard templates that have already been uh, set up uh, and reviewed by the Office of Law, and the solicitation would be advertised on the BCPS website, as well as the eMaryland Marketplace, which reaches, reaches a much larger audience. Um, at this point, we would also consider any uh, suggested bidders with whom the uh, the managing office has had any prior experience. Uh, the Office of Purchasing would not contact those bidders, but we would suggest uh, that the managing office reach out just to let uh, any prospective bidders they're aware of uh, know that we have an advertisement that's been issued. Um, we would have a pre-bid meeting with any interested vendor who might be uh, contemplating a proposal and we'd answer questions and we'd respond to those questions uh, through addenda to the contract to the bid. Um, and once uh, that bid has been uh, issued and advertised, the managing office should have no contact uh, with the bidder apart from the uh, the schedule that's in place and managed by the Office of Purchasing so that we ensure uh, as much objectivity as possible. Um, the typical uh, timeline for from the point at which we can start to develop the scope of work and issue the bid and, and do the evaluation can be uh, up to six months. Um, we have uh, an opportunity to accelerate this time frame because the the only legal requirement is that the uh, solicitation be advertised for a minimum of two weeks. Now, oftentimes that will be extended in order to give vendors more time to uh, put together a proposal. But uh, if, uh, if the managing office and the vendors respond, um, sometimes this can be done in, in half the time or even as few as 11 or 12 weeks. Um, but it really takes a lot of uh, coordination and energy and effort on the part of, of, of both the purchasing staff and the office 
that's uh, managing this, uh, that's seeking the services, and for that matter, the vendors and their ability to respond. Uh, once we get the responses, a uh, an assigned purchasing agent will uh, review the documents to make sure that all of the forms have been submitted in proper uh, in proper order and with the proper signatures and evidence of insurance and so forth. And then once the purchasing office has made that determination, they'll identify however many of the bidders can move on to the next phase of the process. And of course, part of that vetting would be to make sure that uh, that all the bidders are in good standing with the State Department of Assessments and Taxations, uh, and that no other, that the federal government nor the state or any state agency have debarred them from participating in bids for a variety of reasons. Um, at that point, we begin the evaluation. Uh, there may be uh, a committee that consists entirely of members of the managing office who wants the services uh, and of course staff from the purchasing office typically participate unless for some reason that is inappropriate. I think uh, one at one point when we last did the executive search contract, uh, myself, and the purchasing manager were involved marginally, but we tried, uh, we were not involved in, in doing any evaluations or participating, but oftentimes that happens with a, a more typical circumstance. Um, and of course, we the evaluation is conducted exactly uh, around the criteria that were defined in the RFP. Um, and of course, after uh, this point, an award uh, would be recommended. A letter would go to the bidder saying that the board will consider the recommendation uh, at, at a future meeting. Um, and then uh, we would actually, in many cases, if it's a, a service, we would have to draft a contract uh, because it's not simply a function of how many units at what price, but um, you know, a more detailed type of service that would have particular milestones, benchmarks, uh, performance standards to be reached. And uh, and sometimes that can take a number of months and it can delay the process. Um, and then once that agreement between typically uh, purchasing in our law office and the vendors purchasing agents and their attorneys, uh, we would actually be able uh, to issue a purchase order, begin the work, um, and then the managing office would take over uh, reviewing invoices, approving invoices, making sure that, that the performance was satisfactory. And if not, um, they would typically work with the purchasing office to issue, uh, to, to arrange a meeting, uh, try and get the contract back on track. Uh, occasionally, uh, we would have to issue a formal notice to cure some deficiencies. And, and in very few cases, it becomes a matter for the law office to uh, litigate or settle. So um, those are the basic parameters involved uh, in an RFP, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And and prior to any questions, Madam Chair and members of the board, we will uh, forward this to you this week. So you have this as a reference, uh, because I know it's a lot of information. So you will have this, uh, these high level notes, uh, so that you can all again refer to. And if there's any questions or Dr. Williams, I'm not sure, or Madam Chair. Oh, 
uh, please feel free to jump in. Okay, thank you. Board members, are there any questions at this time? Okay, whoops, let me go check the list. Okay. Doc, right, thank wait. you, Dr. Scriven. Thank you, Mr. Sayers. Appreciate you all. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. So we'll be moving on then to item M, report on the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. And here we are again, Dr. Yes, Scriven <laughs> and joining Mr. Dixit. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So at, at this time, we uh, just appreciate the opportunity uh, to clarify any questions that you may have. I, I do want to just go ahead and jump right in and turn this over to Pete so he can introduce the guests that have uh, been with us throughout the evening um, who will go into more detail uh, with providing any clarity uh, and additional insight in terms of, of the scope of work that they've been charged to do. So, uh, Mr. Dixit, at this time, please feel free. Thank you, Dr. Scriven, and good evening, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As you know, uh, BCPS and Baltimore County have been collaborating in the development of a multi-year capital improvement program for all schools. And in the last board meeting of September 29th, uh, Mr. Mills from Canon Design made a presentation on the first phase of the program the presentation and all the detailed summary, detailed study has been posted on the website. Prior to his presentation, uh, we had provided two updates to board on March 10th and August 11th. And also uh, the key objective throughout the development of the program has been to be transparent, collaborative, equitable and inclusive. There have been numerous interactive presentations with focus groups and stakeholder sessions. So after the last presentation, several questions were forwarded to Dr. Williams. Uh, we have developed responses to that questions that will be posted uh, on the board doc tomorrow. In the meantime, Mr. Mills, uh, with his team member, Ms. Catherine Trinkler and Dr. David Lever, is here to continue that conversation. So with that, Mr. Mills, uh, we'd like to start the conversation. So it's all yours. Good evening, Board Chair Kazi, um, Vice Chair Hen, uh, Mr. Mahmoud, uh, Dr. Williams, and members of the board, appreciate the opportunity to present to you again. Um, really don't have much of a presentation and so understanding we're here to extend the conversation and be available for Q&A um, behind now that the board has an opportunity with detailed reports. I do want to introduce two important members of the team that are, are with me this evening and might address specifics on um, questions that are there. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Catherine Tinkler, or Kat as she goes by. She is a tremendous asset to the team, um, leads our educational assessment practice across the company and is the project manager on this project um, and is focused on all the details related to the, the facility condition assessments, the adequacy assessments, and um, really is a tremendous partner. I also want to introduce Dr. David Lever, uh, whom I mentioned during the presentation. And he is a sub-consultant to us and we know that his name precedes him, um, particularly with members of this board who have worked with him in multiple um, endeavors in the past, with his past working at the IAC with the state for 13 years, having served in the, as a facilities director with school districts within the um, state of Maryland, and as a private consultant, he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, his role in the project is side by side with me and others on the team to um, sort out the planning aspects as well as all of the state funding um, nuances relative to the state of Maryland. But the, um, thank you for the question that you mentioned. The, um, the, there is a written response that we, we helped 
produce um, answers to the questions. And just in summary, there were very thoughtful, well put together questions, and they touched on everything from um, the nature of the study and findings um, to the specifics and the recommendations that we later phased over time, as well as some questions about process. But um, I don't want to presume what is most important to you and only be valuable to you. So I'll let you um, address any sorts of questions and we'll do our best to um, respond. So good evening and welcome, uh, Mr. Mills. And we appreciate you bringing uh, your team member, Ms. Tinkler, and also uh, Dr. David Lever. I've had the um, opportunity to uh, meet with him at the IAC meetings back in the day uh, and also attend uh, work sessions that he provided to Maryland Association Board of Education conferences. So uh, definitely appreciate him being on the team. Um, I certainly have my questions, but I'm going to work through uh, the board members that have raised their hands first. And uh, we have Ms. Rowe. Hi, good evening. So Mr. Mills, my understanding is that you've worked with a lot of different school systems all over the country and I have shared my concerns that the intention of this multi-year facilities plan was to have a more stable plan that we would not have neighborhoods competing with each other on an annual basis with no idea of where things stand. Some schools get promised a renovation or a new school and then the next year they're not on the list anymore and there's no coherence as to why. And over time, I have been able to figure out that part of the reason that happens is because our county council code allows for development to be approved simply because the school system has a plan. And obviously, as a school system, we have no control over that. And I'm sure there are other jurisdictions in which the school system equally has had no control over municipal development laws or anything of that nature. And so I am curious um, from your point of view and from Dr. Lever's point of view of other jurisdictions in our state, um, how frequently has this resulted in um, open lottery zones and school systems being forced into getting rid of all school attendance boundaries simply because no amount of planning ends up solving the problem when building and overbuilding is happening faster than we can plan, get funding, and build schools. So if you could speak to that. Um, absolutely, and thanks for the very thoughtful question. And these are some of the layers we look through and lenses we look through as we approach planning. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, you're addressing um, community development and just suburban growth that you've experienced about the area. And we do know you have the APFO um, processes within the state of Maryland to throttle that or at least allow for mechanisms to um, do it in a way that's premeditated. In other areas we've worked, um, there are impact fees and other mechanisms that kind of require developers to come to the table of capital so that um, a community gets built that's comprehensive and not just for the sake of housing and then the community as a whole has to bear the brunt of all the costs. Um, relative to attendance boundaries, um, if you're referring to like removing boundaries, creating a lottery system or um, school choice or student choice um, sorts of policies, I've, I've seen it done well and I've seen it done um, with unintended consequences. Um, where there are school systems that you know, some of the people that were involved in pushing for um, more school choice, removing boundaries, um, actually had bits of regret relative to some of the challenges. Um, specifically, when you have programs that are exceedingly popular or in very advantageous geographical locations that have limited capacity, it creates a lottery scenario certain proportions coming from the outlaying um, uh, neighborhood around it. And at the end of the day, what winds up being choice, are, there's a few schools that wind up being everyone's first choice, second choice, 
Um, there are a lot of folks that wind up getting their third and fourth choice as part of the process, and there's a lot of disappointment. And the districts I've worked with that have those policies have um, staff dedicated year round to manage that process that starts during the fall to go through a springtime um, sort of initiation in its several FTEs of staff and overhead to manage that sort of process. So I, I do caution you, while there could be some benefits to it, there are a lot of challenges as well. I would point out as well that in your areas that are of high capacity impact, particularly the Southeast, Northeast, and the Southern parts of Central, there's no reasonably close capacity that using boundary lists or moving boundaries, et cetera, there's no way to avoid building a way to the problem because it's quite unlikely that um, families would want their students to go clear across town, whether they have to transport them or they're transported by the system. So there are a number of baked in challenges there. A long answer to probably a quicker question you might have had, but these are areas we look, but I do perceive based on the circumstances in Baltimore County, there are a lot of challenges to it. And uh, while I would invite any dialogue about it or exploration of it, that it be done with um, and the, you know, a commensurate amount of um, caution and concern of all the implications so you don't have unintended consequences. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lever to add on and give so it I guess answer. I just wanted to be clear. I'm not advocating for this. What I'm really asking is, do either of you see another tool in the school system's toolbox besides that one, which admittedly is undesirable, should this plan fail to solve overcrowding and facilities needs, or should the funding stream be far slower than development? If I could um, dive in here. Good evening. This is David Lever. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, sir, we can. Okay, good. Um, First of all, going back to your initial question, Ms. Rowe, um, there's a wide variety of enforcement, I think, of APFOs across the state. Uh, your neighbor, Harford County, has a very strict limitation at 115, 115%, and no development can move forward, and that actually is hurting them at this point. Um, other jurisdictions, um, Prince George's County, I'm not sure how it is now. It used to be that developers could simply buy their way out. And so development proceeded apace and resulted in overcrowding. And then in Anne Arundel County, if there's capacity of just sing a single seat, it opens up development and almost unrestricted development. And so that results in overcrowding too. So shaping the APFO is very important and enforcement of the APFO. Um, your question is about are there other solutions? I believe I understood that. Other solutions besides redistricting? Well, controlling growth, I think, is important. And keeping capital investment in tandem with the growth so that you can anticipate capacity and build capacity. But of course, the time frames are very different here. And it takes a long time to do even an addition project to plan it, design it, construct it, occupy it. And in the meantime, development can be occurring, which can result in overcrowding. So one possible approach is to master plan facilities in such a way that you build the capacity for expansion into them. You don't have to pay for the expense today, but when the time comes that you need that additional capacity and additional uh, seats, it's relatively less expensive and less time consuming to actually increase the size of the school. Um, but you still are looking at a capital solution to the overcrowding uh, issue. And I don't know if that responds to your question. It does, sir. It just seems to confirm what I'm saying, that should our municipal partners fail to take proactive solutions to solve problems that this board has no say over what they do. Yeah. What tools exist within the sole authority of our local school system 
to deal with these problems. And what I'm hearing you both say is nothing. We, there, are, there is no way that we can adequately solve this problem if our municipal partners fail to act. Is that correct? Well, and part of the limitation is that in the state of Maryland, uh, school districts, school systems do not have independent taxing authority. So they're fiscally dependent on both the state and the local government for capital improvements. And so really you can't move forward. No, no school system can move forward without the concurrence of the local government, uh, except for very small projects that can be done within the operating budget. And that, those are not the kinds of projects that address the capacity questions. Mm -hmm. So there is that need for the partnership. And we do find that that varies tremendously across the state as well. The degree of um, comity that you find between local government and the school board. Um, I think that as we understand it and as we've observed, there actually is a high degree of, of, of um, agreement uh, between the two entities now in this particular project in the um, multi-year improvement plan. Um, and there has been robust funding, but the question is, does that robust funding keep up with the need? And is the need itself being somehow controlled so that you don't exceed what the school system can provide over time? Sure. So because frequently what we've come across is that it's difficult to get funding approval from the state to overbuild a school based on your projected need for capacity. But in Baltimore County, mm -hmm. a developer can get approval simply because we have a project on the CIP that may not even take place for 10 years, but the minute we finish that project that's supposed to address overcrowding, the school is already overcrowded the day the doors open. Yes. In, in addition, you're dealing with the uncertainties of the enrollment projections themselves, um, which even with the very best people working on it, there's always an element of uncertainty. And you're dealing with the uncertainties of construction costs, of funding streams. Um, I think we're going to be seeing funding streams affected by the current COVID situation. So these are other factors that come into play. Uh, so uh, you're pointing to an important problem, I think. Um, now, the state does allow the core facilities to be built to a larger capacity. It may not pay for them now, but they will reimburse in the future along with additional seats if the need is justified in the future. So if a local jurisdiction is, is uh, willing to support that additional size of core facilities, especially the cafeteria, but other core facilities as well, uh, it can be done and can be reimbursed. Frederick County has been very good at this because they also anticipate, in the past they anticipated, and I think we're now anticipating in the future, considerable growth beyond what the state would pay for. So Dr. Lever, does the state consider a county's development goals and desire to allow development and expansion to continue to be a justified reason to expand core spaces and reimburse? Or are there limits on that? It does, as, not unless the procedure has changed. Uh, at the moment, or as I understand it, the um, funding is predicated on the seven-year enrollment projections of the subject school and the adjacent schools. Um, that's fairly strict. Uh, so they don't really look at either pipeline projects, housing projects that are potentially in the, in the pipeline but may or may not come to fruition. They're not looking at the development policy. Um, under the smart growth um, agenda, there was an effort to try and tie the two kind of policy aspects closer together, um, but it never came to any kind of serious fruition. So I would say that that is a void in the policy realm. The state does have the potential for its funding to both promote and to inhibit uh, development. 
if development is tied to capacity. The state has this authority or is it just the local jurisdiction? So it has the, it doesn't have the authority, but it has the capacity simply by what it funds and what it doesn't fund and how much it funds for any particular project. So if it does move, if there's ample funding and it does support a project, that project may open up an adequate public facility ordinance blockage and move development forward. If it isn't funded, that by itself can also inhibit the APFO. Um, so it's an indirect impact. And I don't think that there has been any study. It's something that uh, the funding entities, when I was there, it was something we were definitely aware of, but it didn't factor in to the um, calculation of whether a project should be funded or not. We were looking simply at the need for educational space, really, or for renovation and the other aspects that go into a major project. Thank you, sir, Dr. Lever. I could probably talk to you all night, but I'm going to allow some other people to go. Good to talk to you. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I, and uh, Ms. Causey, yeah. I'm back. You're back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Kuhn is next, and then Ms. Mack. Oh, thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, thanks for coming tonight. I know it's it's a bit later than we had. Uh, uh, scheduled but uh, thanks for staying staying on um, so hopefully this won't take all night but I do have a number of questions and um, I'm going to start uh, just trying to understand some of the the documents that were made available um, late in the week to us uh, they are on the website on BCPS on the um, uh, under the, the project, uh, and um, you, anyone online can click through and follow. So um, I live in Towson, so I'm looking at the Towson High School um, uh, calculations. And right now, I'm going to focus first on the educational adequacy and equity supporting data uh, for these schools. And I just I want to start with a basic question. <clears throat> Um, as I look and kind of roll through the different calculations on these pages, you know, um, I can do math and I can follow some of these things. Uh, at, and then there are places where I, I see a zero and then I, I see a measure score. And I'm trying to understand, and I'll, 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 I'll start here, um, science lab equipment and support space. Um, apparently, uh, Towson got a zero on that, and the standard is 100. Uh, but there's a measure score of 50, and it has a 50% weighting. So there's an actual 25 score there. So I'm trying to understand how, how the data here, which creates the scores that this is all based upon, um, how it works. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there are some notes that, that um, I'm not privy to, to to understand this. But I, I see it again under art equipment and support space. Uh, the value is zero. The standard's 100. The measured score is 50. Um, so if maybe maybe that's just there is no value and there's some type of a measured score. Is that accurate? Because I'm just trying to understand the document itself to determine what it is. Thank you, Board Member Kuhn, for a good question. Um, we know it's a it's a complicated formula that calculates all the summarized numbers that I shared you with you last time I presented. Um, and we worked hard to annotate each point, so it, it walked through the the thresholds and benchmarks in there to, to express the sorts of formulas that are beneath them. But really, it's a, it's a weighted rubric that compares what exists, what's reported, what's recorded versus um, what the standard would be. And in some cases, it's a binary yes, no sort of thing where you get full credit or none. In some cases, you get a fraction of it, et cetera. 
sitting right here in front of you. I can't remember the specific measures that you're asking about. We'd have to come back to you with um, a more thorough response. I'd hate to speculate and get it wrong off the top of my head. But um, what it basically does would, um, whether with, with the school reporting, um, whether they had 100%, 75%, whatever percent of um, their labs had adequate equipment or space, uh, ancillary space for science instruction is was the benchmark compared to um, kind of a, a, a prorated scale so that each facility could be measured and reported equitably. And by gap analysis, the sorts of facility projects that would be used to remedy those deficiencies would be required. All right, well, um, I'm guessing we're not going to get to the bottom of this here, and it, it might be a simple, it, as I said, I've, 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 it's a 200 page document, 200 plus page document, I think, that I'm going through. So there's significant amounts of information here, um, and I'm just trying to make sense of it. And I do see where if it's yes or no, it's a binary, and I understand that. But there are places where there seems to be a measure score, and I'm just curious as to where those measures may have come from. Um, and perhaps that could be answered at a later point in time. Uh, but I wanted to bring it to, to attention. All right, so uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is I want to go to the southeast side and talk about Sparrows Point High School. Um, the facility um, is actually a high school and a middle school. So I wanted to talk about how your approach to managing that is 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 it is it is it blind and it's just like well the facility is overcrowded and there's lots of kids there and um and based on space requirements and what the facility actually looks like uh those measures are are the same no matter what uh perhaps i, I don't know i'm kind of throwing that out there i would guess i would assume that that's the case um but I know that the solutions could be vastly different based on our, you know, what, what would be suggested for this school. Um, we could build a brand new middle school and then you would have a high school with a significant capacity, right? And then you'd have a brand new beautiful facility, hopefully for, for, you know, a large number of middle schoolers. Maybe you could take care of a lot of things by doing that. Right. But I, I guess I'm just trying to understand because that one stands out because it is the only non high school. It's not, it's not a pure high school in the County. Right. So how we approach that's important and understanding how we are going to evaluate that in the mix is, is important because you could do, you could build a middle school and then the high school would be immediately, you know, have tremendous capacity or, you know, or, or build a high school and, and, and vice versa. But I'm trying to understand the approach to going forward because you made specific recommendations on, you know, you know, we, we add on to this school, we add on to that school and what have you. And the Southeast was a, partic a particular concern with all of the overcrowding. So I'd like, I'd like to understand that. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, it really warms my heart to, to hear you digging into the details and um, understanding what we're doing. Um, very specific to and central to our recommendations at this midpoint of this process um, was that group three where we looked at the potential for the new relief schools in the Southeast and Northeast adjacent to the Southern part of Central um, as a potentiality. And given the tight timeline, the circumstances around COVID and it, um, the time required to do due diligence to look at land, we very intentionally recommended that group three be staggered by a year so that those mutually exclusive scenarios, which exactly as you put it, one solution to Sparrows Point Middle School and High School campus would be, let's get a new home for the middle schoolers, move them out, let the high schoolers actually occupy the whole facility, do renovations appropriate to bring it up to standards. Um, is one of those scenarios mutually exclusive to just continuing to add on to that campus that 
I don't recommend which to go with, but rather we need to take this up with the stakeholder. We need student voice, we need the community to be some part of it, and we need to know whether there's land available to, to do that middle school project. So very intentionally, we put that group three, the staggered start date on it so that with a wide range of costs as well, um, depending on the outcome of the rest of it. I'm not sure if I addressed your question, but I, I think I think we'll try. It it was it was helpful. I appreciate it. I'm sorry that there's some background noise. Um, I don't not sure. It looks like Mr. Lever may, may have some noise going on. Perhaps he can mute his phone. Um, the next question I have uh, is back to the central area, uh, and it has to do with um, uh, how. Um, you know, and, and it looks like we don't talk about it. I'm curious, but um, Carver Center is um, a pure magnet. It's what we call a pure magnet, right, in, in, um, in the county. So it draws from the entire county. And it is, um, according to um, the calculations here, it's, it's slightly underutilized, right? It's a brand new school beautiful school. It's there for um, um, arts and, um, and what have you. And one of my questions is, because you, you sat there and you look at the different zones, and with Carver High School, which is a pure magnet, in the central zone that's under underutilized in essence, I'm curious as to if you, you excluded Carver, because um, Unless, and, and I don't I don't believe that this would be the case, unless someone is proposing that we we remove it from being um, um, uh, the the pure magnet school that it is, um, then I'm I'm I have concerns about how um, we could utilize it in in any strategy going forward to manage um, um, like the over overpopulation in, in Towson High School at this point. And if if it's considered an adding to capacity in the central zone, then in essence, um, you know, I, I could be wrong, but it, it may be skewing numbers in a way that isn't, um, isn't going to be clear for folks to understand. Right. No. This is a great question. Um, we we don't just look at these planning areas in isolation. We do look at proximities for the schools that are on the borders and neighboring, and we do consider that that um, magnet schools are drawing from across the entire county. Um, we also looked at like the case of Hereford High School that um, is significantly further out, um, not towards town, and whether surplus capacity there can realistically be used to fill um, we looked at all these different through these different lenses in um, coming up with these preliminary scenarios, and um, um, the, um, the the notion of your magnets at at Carver, at Western Tech, Eastern Tech, etc. They do operate slightly lower than full capacity utilization, and some of it's by design, but also some of it's just have being able to staff at full capacity, real challenge for the types of programs. If they have the programs there, then they could fill the buildings. And there might be operational solutions to make those facilities operate a little more efficiently um, than the building possibly could be, um, could have right now. But um, we absolutely, you're, you're, you're thinking through all the, the mechanics that we do at the planning table. Um, in terms of how we can optimize your facility use. Did I address your question? Yeah, that was a good question. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I think um, the last question, because I'm sure other folks would like a chance to talk tonight, because um, I, 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 I could probably talk ad nauseum about this, uh, is really about the waiting. Uh, when you did the benchmarking and um, 
instead of equally weighting capacity, facility condition, and education, adequacy, and equity, and literally they're within, you know, just a few percentages of each other. Correct. Um, I'm just curious as to how exactly we calculated that um, instead of uh, an even weighting that we have 35, 32, and 33. How did how was that determined? It was derived from the community survey that 22,000 folks responded to in nine different languages from all schools in the system, including 2,500 students. Um, one of the questions we asked um, asked for the relative importance of various aspects. And very intentionally, we included those three among some others as well. But we wanted to see the relative um, measures and rating of importance that were given from all the members. We also cross-tabulated. There's another question that asked the relative strengths of BCPS at addressing those same issues. So we could see kind of a scatter plot of deed, but we extracted the relative percents on there that, as you observe, are really close to one third, one third, one third on the three pillars. It's like 35, 32, and 33. It's really close. And if you did it one third, one third, one third, it would have a negligible um, impact at all on the relative rankings of schools. But we wanted to leverage the instruments we had and the data we had at hand and to empower, you know, even unwittingly, the voice of your community to um, influence the measures that we used for to guide decision making. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and I always like to understand the why mm -hmm. and the what and how it works. Um, I would suggest, though, that these are not negligible because um, I spent some time uh, looking at some numbers uh, based on the scoring that was provided. And what I realized, um, because in your benchmarking, I'm looking at Sparrows Point, which is the number one school. And I'm looking at Towson, which is right behind it, which is the number two school. And I see that there's an aggregate need score of 64 for Sparrows Point. And there's an aggregate need score for Towson of 50, of 65. So they're one point apart, correct? It's really close. Well, if you don't round up when you do the calculations, it's even closer um, where you have uh, – you're, you're off by a few tenths or, or a half of a point. So it, it, gets, it can be – you know, depending on how scientific we're looking at this and with weightings and all of these measures that we have in place, we're trying to be a scientific or at least express things numerically as, as best we can, correct, to show the differences, right? Because we're trying to prioritize the spending of public money to address the needs across the entire system. So the weightings are important. Every measure is important. Getting it all right is, is important because when you have – one school, and I believe both of these schools are uh, need attention <laughs> in many different ways. Um, but when you're showing an aggregate need score that isn't tied because it's a point apart, when in reality it's less than half a point apart, when you do the actual math, you're you're conveying something to the public. And what we need to be is as clear as we can, because all of this that you have done is laying the groundwork for massive public investment in construction across the entire county, you know, with support from the state, hopefully big support from the state. Um, so I just wanted to to point that out so that folks are aware of it, and um, you know that that the details matter, especially when we're distilling down these facilities on three separate. Um, scales into one number and rating them from 1 to 24. So thank you for your time, and uh, I'll yield to other folks so they can start asking you some, some more difficult questions. Okay. So next up, next up we have uh, Mr. McMillian and then Ms. Mack. So Mr. McMillian, can you, can we hear you?
Mr. McMillian was having some technical difficulties. Ms. Causey, I'd be happy to start, and if Ms. Mr. McMillian gets on, I will cede to him. Fantastic. That was my next idea. Are you ready? Yes. Um, Mr. Mills, um, your recommendation um, included in the um, information that's been um, put on the website shows that you want to complete legacy projects like Lansdowne. Um, I'm in Lansdowne's in my district, so I'm obviously very happy to hear that. Um, but prior to Cannon being involved, the board was told, as Ms. Rock, okay. The board was told that um, when I asked the question, you know, when could we expect a new Lansdowne? Um, we were told best case scenario, five years, potentially seven years. So if that's the best case scenario for this one school that we as a system or you as a company say needs to be completed as a new school, as time goes on, as the five years or the seven years go on, the schools that are on your list for the secondary options of renovation or additions are only getting older. They're only becoming um, more in need of significant investment. And so my question is this, at what point do we look at your recommendations for renovations and or additions of schools that we know are in bad shape? What point does that become throwing good money after bad? Thank you, Board Member Mack, great question. Um, we do have some rule of thumb metrics that we look at in the data itself that would be a benchmark for like, an entire wholesale replacement versus doing surgery, um, doing repairs on the building or additions, et cetera. And there's kind of a common rule of thumb in K-12 planning I've seen around the country and pretty consistent, but more or less it's kind of the two thirds rule. When you get that 65, 66% of what it would, the investment it would take to wholesale replace it in doing fix it type stuff. Now, little wonky here but if you're doing additions on top of that you kind of have to put that in both the numerator and denominator to make it really adequate and apples to apples type comparison but that's kind of you know the, the analogy i like to use is you know my favorite old car was my 1984 volvo four-door that um thing would not die and just loved it and i just kept you know fond memories in it and put money into it put money into it and it just reached a point where with you know, air conditioning in the transmission it was like guess what time for a new car um the the data that you know we've seen from the assessments the costs related to the condition um, deficiencies that are projected out for seven years for adequacy sorts of improvements in the facilities that go beyond and transcend just doing roofs and paint and taking care of systems but really some dramatic alterations to the facilities that provide 21st century flexible spaces for project learning and more interactive instruction. Um, these sorts of things, there's, we look at the numbers and it's just hard just on the data alone to justify um, wholesale replacement, especially in light of the fact that you have acute looming capacity needs in the Southeast and Northeast and Central that can't be built, to, you have to build your way out of them. To spend money demolishing capacity, moving in the opposite direction where you need to go in the near term is just hard to justify with your limited finances. I guess my question is more like a time value of money question. Um, I, I know that you took an inventory of what our buildings look like today, what you gave them a score but does that have an incremental addition to it year after year? Because they're not going, so that is built into your recommendations. Yes. That seven to 10 the, years from now, those schools will be older and more money will be needed to be put into them. Right, I mean, the quick answer, and Catherine can give more detail to it, but um, we take a snapshot today, but we, we have architects and engineers that professionally look at these systems, they do this for a living. They can forecast out based on the age and the, the um, amount of you know the quality of maintenance, the expected life 
on all the systems. So we have a forecast that goes out many years, but we use the seven year planning horizon window um, for kind of the, the stuff that's coming down the pike. So we're not just looking in the rear view mirror, but really looking forward. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Board Member Mack. So we are going to try again with Mr. McMillian. We are not hearing you, Rod. If you're trying to speak, we're not hearing you. If you can do star six, maybe. We are still not hearing you, Rod. Um, Ms. Gover, if maybe you can connect him with uh, Mr. Corns to try and <clears throat> get back in. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to ask some questions, and if Mr. McMillian can chime in at any point, I will um, immediately turn it over to him. So, <clears throat> Mr. Mills and, and also Dr. Williams or Dr. Scriven, um, I just wanted to understand, you said that um, there are some additional questions and, and answers that you have provided. And I wanted to just lay out, instead of going through all of the questions, because I submitted uh, quite a bit because um, of community input and just um, my familiarity with these projects over the last uh, five and a half years or so. Um, we have on our website, bcps.org slash system slash M-Y-I-P-A-S. Um, and I just see a few um, a, a few items there, enrollment projections, capacity, educational adequacy. So is, that, is this the location where all of the answers and any other reports uh, will be posted? It's my understanding. The uh, website is... Baltimore County Public Schools and the county government to maintain and post, but my understanding is all documents will be posted on that one portal for transparency. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to add that all of the questions and responses will be posted on board doc also. Oh, thank you, Mr. Dixit. Mm -hmm. So they'll be on board docs and, and also on the uh, My iPass webpage. Yeah, yeah, it could be a link from... Uh, board doc to my iPads too. Okay, great. Um, and one of the, um, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, we're, t we're attempting to call Mr. McMillian instead of him trying to connect through the phone. So can you um, just um, hold tight for a sec? Certainly. I see the light over there blinking as if they're trying to connect. But um, in any case, we'll keep talking. And if he chimes in, we'll we'll yield the floor. So um, one of the things, and Mr. Kuhn referenced it, and uh, Dr. Mills, excuse me, Mr. Mills, you re referenced it also, is the community survey 22,000 folks. My understanding is that was supposed to be on the website. Is that coming? 
It is coming. Um, as you can imagine, it's a lot of data. We had it in raw format and some ad hoc visualizations to consume and use for planning purposes, but having the polish of a finished product. And we want it to be interactive so that your community can actually see it, read it, understand it, and even engage with the, the data. So that's in process, and we expect that that will be forthcoming over the next couple of weeks. Okay, great. And to um, other uh, folks, concerns around capacity, and Dr. Lever mentioned the uncertainty of enrollment projections, even if the best um, folks are working on it using modeling and so forth. Um, one of the questions that had been raised was what is the past accuracy of enrollment projections? And we have heard as um, a school system, the overall accuracy, but when we're talking about 24 high schools, what we really wanna know is how successful has have the numbers been in projecting? Because we're being asked as a board to make decisions based on those numbers. And you all are using those numbers for your calculations. So. Is there analysis that has been done that can be shared, or is that analysis that can be done? And I sent in a uh, spreadsheet that was provided by a community member that showed disparities of projections just from one year to the next year. So if we're, if we're being asked to make decisions five, seven years in the future, we really should have some level of confidence in those, in those numbers. Great question, Board Chair Causey. Um, we, in our scope of work, we were to receive, trust, and verify the, the, pro the provided data that came from staff with consultants um, outside of our team. But um, we did, and just we always do this when we're not in control of, um, we're doing a peer review. Um, we do validate and have a conversation around the methodologies. We spent, we invested. A, couple hours going through a lot of the data and how they use cohort survival, how they use generation rates among all the households, et cetera. And the, the methodology is sound. Um, also, you know, in my discretionary time, did read some um, reports and other things from the past and saw that the accuracy was consistent with industry standard. And overall for the district to do a spot on job, um, maybe one school to another, one boundary to another, one neighborhood to another, maybe there's some a little bit more vagaries, but the estimates that we've seen have been you know, suitable for the type of planning that we're doing. Now, it's not in our scope of work to do more than that. It's something we obviously would welcome and could bring to bear if an independent sort of audit or peer review um, were required, uh, or you could always find another vendor as well. So what I'm hearing is that no one has gone back and said five years ago when it was projected that Towson High School, Sparrows Point, Lansdowne, Catonsville, uh, you know, was projected to be X. Now we're at that year. What is the accuracy of that projection? So no one has actually done that work. Um, for my team, no. Okay. So... Dr. Williams, is that something that anyone from DRAW has done? Or there was the SAGE uh, report? So, Ms. Causey, I, I guess I, I, can, I can provide some perspective. We did engage in a contract with SAGE to provide us with um, projection report. Um, I don't have the report here with me. We certainly can... Um, review the information and provide the board with an update, you know, based on Dr. Williams' directive. But we have engaged with a partnership with SAGE for many years. And um, based on the projections that they have provided us, it really has been consistent over time. Um, we've taken a look at some ways within which we could make some adjustments, um, just because you think about the growing rate of BCPS and ways within which our school population is changing. And so the team has looked at those irregularities and worked to really adjust them so that we do have an accurate report. Um, but we can certainly um, circle back, you know, based on directive from Dr. Williams in terms of providing you with any additional information needed to help support that question and that inquiry. 
Okay, so I sent an email with this spreadsheet, uh, you know, whatever week, 10 days ago, whatever it was. And it has in it numbers from our student counts book that are eight to 10 months apart. And there are vastly different numbers for some of these very um, needy schools, the, the schools that are labeled the highest. But if we have projection differences from one year to another, swings of 100 students, 200 students, that's very concerning for the board to try and make uh, decisions about how we're going to use what is becoming tighter and tighter money given the economic crisis because of the pandemic. So, I mean, um, this, so that, that, that's a concern that that's a concern. And, and it's, it's a concern, not just of, of mine, but it's a concern of all of the community members that feel like they have been overcrowded, they've been overcrowded. And if someone says, oh, you're not gonna be overcrowded anymore, what is the rationale for them to have confidence in that? So we'll move on from that because, um, you know, there, the analysis has not been done. And so hopefully it can be done. Um, the other issue was related to, um, in terms of innovative ways to um, deal with capacity. Um, we and Mr. McMillian had pointed out that there was a piece of land that he wanted to show Mr. Mills. Um, also, um, recently, Baltimore County Public Schools opened Watershed Charter School. And the way that they did that is they leased a school that was a former school of, um, uh, of, a, of a church. So that was excess capacity by an external community member um, that we've been able to use. Um, so was there any analysis of that around the county? Because what we've seen in these projections is that the capacity goes up and then it trends down. So if we're talking about a certain amount of time, or even if we don't know the amount of time, if we can utilize facilities that are already available that are not being utilized, um, then that can help us in the short term, especially when we're talking about schools that are so severely overcrowded. Um, so was was there any looking into that? Uh, we asked general questions about the availability of other public lands or um, sorts of things uh, of the, the planning committee and none of those really surfaced that were viable for the 24 schools we were looking at. Now we're looking at 150 more here um, over the next couple of months. And um, certainly those sorts of, we want all the right people at the table so that we can bring out those nuggets uh, that could save tens of millions of dollars and be a better you know, community asset use. Um, we hope to find as much of that as we can for the balance of the schools. And plus also, as, as you know, we you need capacity right away at the high schools. And it's like group two immediately. Let's get some some capacity relief going. Meanwhile, group three, group four, et cetera, that some of that stuff goes downstream where um, there's more time to do that kind of due diligence and find those opportunities. Okay, and then, um, like I said, I had sent in a number of questions from community members. Um, one of them were around the designation of legacy project and, um, you know, what Ms. Rowe was talking about funding partners and uh, our municipalities and the decisions they make and how they affect the school system. So the Board of Education has a CIP plan that gets approved um, and moved forward. And from there, there was a project that was funded with $15 million for Lansdowne and only 500,000 for Towson and only 500,000 for Delaney. Um, so again, it's how much control does the board have when our funding partners or our municipality partners make decisions uh, that we don't have control over? Um, and that's a philosophical question that you don't need to answer. But the, the question that does need to be answered is that $500,000 was supposed to be spent on feasibility studies, particularly in the case of Towson High School, where it has an environmentally sensitive situation with a stream running through, as was pointed out by a, a community member, uh, a very small campus. So my question is, were any of the feasibility studies done for Towson or Delaney, and were those shared with your team, Mr. Mills? 
Um, I'll let Mr. Dixon address what work had been done prior to there. So there are two parts to that question. Let me try to answer that. Any work that we did out of that $500,000 that was allocated to Towson and Delaney was not part of the scope of work for my IPAS. The second thing is limited amount of pre-planning work was done for those two schools, and that also is on hold. So the funding approved for Delaney and Towson was not design funds. They were pre-designed or pre-planning funds, and limited about exploration work has been done, but nothing in the form of a formal report. So preliminary work was done, but nothing that would be in a report? That's true. What, what the architect and engineers have done, have looked at the site, have looked at the survey of that, that site, and see some of the issues that they will be dealing during the design stage if the design funds are provided. That's the kind of work that has been done. Okay. All right, so I see other hands, so I will uh, finish up, but I, 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 said, I emailed them all in, so I'll look forward to seeing them. So we have Ms. Hen and then Ms. Joes. Ms. Causey, Mr. McMillian's on the phone. Okay, we will have Mr. McMillian. Tracy, we're not hearing anything, so I'm going to have Ms. Hen continue. And I'm sorry, Ms. Causey, here you. I... Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Co you can hear me. Yes, we can. You yeah. have the floor. Okay. I'm, I'm so sorry for this mess. I'm going to throw this junk away. Uh, I got two quick questions. I, I, I submitted my five questions to be answered by the mail, but here's two. Very briefly. Just, Canon design people, you mentioned you mentioned very uh, uh, building moratorium. Very briefly, uh, when somebody was talking about tools in a toolbox. Now, obviously, we don't have Baltimore County Public Schools. We don't have that capability of of, of, of implementing a, a building moratorium. But would that be if if our county council, you know, got together, that would be a tool to deal with the overcrowding until we could play catch up and, and get caught up with it, wouldn't it? And, and this, I represent the Southeast area. So what, is that a tool that's possible if it was implemented through the county council? Um, thank you for the question. We, we did touch on this earlier with board member Rowe, um, Dr. Lever and I both. Um, indeed, if there were some policy decisions that could impact the amount of growth that's out there, um, that potentially could curb the growth that, that's projected and save off some of the, the capacity pain. Dr. Lieber, I'd like you to take the rest. Yeah, and I think... Um... Here's, here's my other point. I mentioned last time about the North Point Junior High School site, the old site on the corner of Merritt Boulevard and Wise Avenue, and it's a 27, 28-acre site. It's right now it's used as a as a government building, and there's rec programs in there, and I think the police are in there in one section. It, you know, can you look at that? Can you look at that now, and and see the impact that it would have on those on Dundalk High School that you're projecting to be 650 over 
Patabs go 250 over, and then Spares Point. If if those boundaries, if that if a, if that building was renovated or a new building built on that corner, and those boundaries adjusted, it might affect overcrowding in all of those schools. And if you took three or four hundred out of the high school at Spares Point, and then and Patabsco and Dundalk, then the middle school situation, to a degree, has has been remedied. Remedied. What do you let think me, about let me, looking let, at that property? Paul, let me try to help you with that response because there are a couple of pieces to that. Number one, I wanted to thank board member McMillian for coming up with some creative ideas. The second piece I wanted to share is that that's not, site acquisition is not part, part of the scope of work for Canon Design. So once their study is complete, the next phase will have to do with how to implement those recommendations. And site acquisition will be the very basic part in case where the new schools have to be built. We have to work with the state, with our school board, and with county to acquire a site. So all of that process will start after the implementation have been made and the report is completed. And at that time, we'll be more than glad to talk with Mr. McMillan and seek his guidance on the available land that is available there or any other part of the Baltimore County. But it, it seems to me that, you know, Baltimore County government owns that property now. We own that property one time and we turn that property over to the government when we stop using it as a school building. So if we wait until the report's done, the report's not going to address this at all. So why at, at the end of the report's it going to address it? It seems to me that it needs to be addressed now if it's going to have an impact on the report. You know, the property is there. It's not like we have to pay for this property. The property is there. It's trying to be, you know, it's trying to sell it to developers as we speak. But, okay. I don't, I, I don't have to add anything to it because I don't know any more than that. But before we use any site, there are processes that we have to use. We have to get a state's approval. We have to get county's approval, and we have to get a school board's approval. And we have to find funds to get that property and find another home for whatever that property is being used for. Mr. McMillian, are you still there? Yes, I'm, I'm still there. Okay. But I don't have anything else to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, board members, um, before we continue, if uh, you can give us just a moment, uh, Mr. Mills and your team. Uh, Dr. Williams and I are um, looking at the schedule and the things that uh, need to get processed for the evening, um, and we would uh, request of the board that we move item N, report on school climate and safety, uh, to the next board meeting, as well as uh, move board member comments. And I will remind the board that we have uh, committee updates, so there will be an opportunity for, um, you know, for that because there, there was important information. So if I don't hear any objections, we will move item, excuse me, I'll just make a motion. We'll move item N and item Q to the next board meeting. I have a mo I've made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Matt. Okay. C any discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. I'm sorry, could you tell me who's seconded? Yes. I like Mac. Miss Mac. Thank, Thank you. Making good on his campaign promise to bring troops home, in some cases, regardless of the <laughs> Somebody needs to put their phone on mute. <laughs> All right, Dr. Hayer? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Crosby? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. 
Mr. McMillian? I believe he dropped off. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, the motion carries. And Dr. Williams, thank you to you and your team and to those uh, staff that had prepared um, for us um, and that have been on the meeting. Uh, we thank them and um, the board needs to consider when we uh, add new things and take, um, take time for things that are not discussed in advance uh, to uh, extend the agenda. Okay, so um, we had additional um, people who had not yet spoken and we it's miss hen miss joe's and then mr mahamza thank you madam chair good evening mr mills mr dixit I'll be brief. Um, i had requested some additional information that i don't believe has been published to the website and mr mills you had mentioned that there was a detailed facility condition assessment report um, that the board would be receiving. I believe what was published was a summary report. And I was I wanted to ask you about the detailed report and if that's something you could speak to and if that could be made available to the board. Um, thank you, um, Board Member Joes, for the question. Um, Indeed, we provided detailed reports, and Kat can speak to specifics on them. We, um, just kind of an overall summary type report, but then there's the detailed one multi-page report per campus. Um, mm -hmm. You can probably fill the backseat of your car if you printed them all out. Um, and I believe all that's been provided. Kat, can you speak to that? I must have lost Kat Tinkler. Kat, are you on? Paul, I just want to add that all of the reports and details that were provided to us, they'll be posted on the website. Can you hear me, Paul? So, Mr. Dixit, the detailed reports will be posted to the website? To the best of my knowledge, the whole report has already been posted on the website. Um, it is not. There is a one-page summary per high school. And what I was looking for was the full report per high school that was discussed in the focus group on facility condition that Mr. Mills just had mentioned. I think Kat's trying to talk, but I'll, um, we'll confirm with staff and make sure that the proper documentation is in place um, for you. Apologies if it, it um, didn't fulfill what we had promised. Okay. I'm, I'm particularly interested in any um, narrative to go along with the data tables. Um, the data is very helpful. It's um, You did a great job presenting it. It's very clear. Um, I, I'm really interested in in the qualitative analysis as well, and any narrative to accompany the data. Um, and a lot of photographs too. Yeah, um, that's that's fantastic. And I know Towson High has been mentioned several times. And one of the questions that I asked in the focus group was specifically around the conditions at Towson. And I don't think the data tables tell that story. So what I'm looking to see there is the assessment particularly at Towson, it's in um, the district that I represent. So I'm um, curious and interested in to see um, what your assessment um, says as to that. And I'm also interested in the analyses on the other two pillars as well. So while we receive some data on that, and I I love data and you know can spend all night talking about that, I'm interested in the analysis as well. So, um, Again, if those detailed reports could be provided to the board, that would be great. And and as well published to the website, because I believe in making that information public for our stakeholders. So that's all I had. So Mr. Dixit, you'll facilitate 
making those reports available? Um, yes, we definitely will. It was my impression that that was already posted on the website. So obviously we didn't get it from uh, Kathy and, and we'll follow up on that. Thank you. And my last request had to do with the presentations. Again, they were very helpful, The at least the one that I saw in the focus group on facility condition. And I imagine similarly excellent presentations were given to the other two focus groups, if those could be made available. Um, I asked about that in my focus group, but um, those were terrific. And I wouldn't have the benefit of Mr. Mills um, delivering them live to everyone, um, the presentation. Um, decks would be helpful if those could be shared because they lend a lot of background and explanatory detail, I think, to the data and help users who did not um, get to experience them understand the data itself. And I think they, they accompany it and do a nice job um, explaining the data. Thank you. That's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dixit and Mr. Mills. I got to hear some portion of the discussion. As somebody that sits on the other side, um, first of all, I accept my apologies. I saw a lot of questions coming at you at, at how you picked up the data. And um, you answered them well. I understand where your data comes in from. The big non-granular data comes in from the Census Bureau. So people say they don't realize that. That's why you, it's important to do your fill out your census forms. The more local granular data comes from the local planning and zoning department. It comes from, i.e., your Baltimore County planning and zoning. So when people are conflating two different data and where these projections are coming from, that is disturbing to me because what it's saying is it's uh, questioning the credibility of a firm that is well known. And I honestly, um, you know, they're conflating two different kinds of data. So in 2008, for instance, we had an economic downturn. And yes, all the projections we did, they slowed down, but that was part of the economic downturn. And likewise, with COVID-19, there is gonna be some kind of repercussions we're gonna see down the road. And again, conflating student enrollment with uh, housing and everything is, is confusing. And we do not have the power to put a housing moratorium. That has to come from this county district, from the county council. And Harford County does have a building moratorium um, on buildings because of their school capacities. So there's a lot of other moving parts that need to be addressed. And what you're addressing is really the uh, schools that need to be built. And you're doing it a, uh, doing a good job. I looked at the report. Um, so again, thank you, Mr. Dixit, for facilitating this. And thank you, Mr. Mills. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, that is all of the board members that um, wanted to speak. So thank you very much. And um, the work will continue. The um, next item on the agenda is item O, school opening discussion. Ms. Clausey, I had a quick question. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, it was about uh, the agenda itself. I was wondering um, what under what section was Mr. McMillian's uh, resolution put under? His is under O2, so it's this, this. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, item O, school opening discussion. So, um, this is Daryl Williams. The board asked us to uh, provide an update um, and to have a discussion around the reopening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mahanza, for that reminder about the additional item under this item O. Um, and so I provided a lot of the context in my report uh, earlier today. And so the team is here to provide just a quick update um, uh, regarding the reopening of our schools. So I'll turn it over to the team. So good evening. Um, 
Dr. Williams and Chair Posse and members of the board. I will get started this evening. Um, we're here to provide an update on the reopening of schools, as Dr. Williams indicated for all of us. And I'm joined this evening by uh, Mr. Burke, Dr. Jones, Dr. Roberts, and Ms. Spires. Um, we hope that the board and the public will find tonight's report um, on the reopening of schools um, valuable. I'll be followed by Mr. Burke. Next slide, please. Just some uh, comments about the design team and the work groups uh, that we're involved with in order to get um, stakeholder input. Uh, so uh, currently right now, the BCS, BCPS and design team and the work groups, the roles are to make recommendations to the superintendent and cabinet. And the people involved are BCPS staff, TABCO, CASE, ESPBC, OPE, AFSCME, the Secondary Schools Administrators Association and the Association of Elementary School Administrators. The BCPS Stakeholder Recovery Group, uh, which is required by MSD, I meet with them every Friday and Monday. It's a large group, so I offer two times to meet with them. In those meetings, we provide updates from the design team. That's how we start that meeting, and then I ask for specific feedback on that update, and then we, we answer general questions. And who's involved in that meeting, again, is BCPS staff, teachers, principals, the area advisory leads, PTA and the NAACP, and most recently CCAC joined as a stakeholder group um, within that group. And then we also have the BCPS COVID-19 task force. Uh, their role is, uh, again, input feedback and guidance to the design team. And this is where our medical experts really um, uh, participate. And so who is, again, BCPS staff, Fabco Case, ESPBC, OPE, and AFSCME, and the health department doctor sit in that meeting as well. Next slide, please. We often get uh, questions about what metrics guide reopening. Um, these are the metrics that we get from the Baltimore County uh, Department of Health. And we review these each week in uh, design team and in the COVID-19 task force. The, the graphic to the left um, is a decision tree model that looks at uh, new, the new case rate, the percentage of uh, positivity rate, and the number of new cases per 100,000. And then based on those two numbers, you get um, recommendations as to how you should be operating. And they go from expanded in-person programs to limited in-person programs and a hybrid falls in between that. So those are the current metrics we use um, as we uh, look at what's possible in terms of student groups that we can bring back. And we've been hovering in the limited in-person programs group for quite a few weeks. Next slide, please. It's just some information uh, about the reopening feedback and supports. We did launch the reopening email. Uh, as of the 11th, there were 615 emails. I went on right before this meeting. There were another 60 emails so we're probably hovering close to 700 uh, emails. And we did offer this in other languages, uh, but currently we've just had uh, 15 responses in uh, other languages. The, the feedback has been very mixed. Um, I also sometimes receive your the emails you've received um, as a board and, uh, and from Dr. Williams, and I review those. And I would say it stays pretty consistent to what you heard in public comment tonight, uh, we get many requests to reopen. We get many requests to stay closed. Um, more students should be included. Fewer students should be included. Um, and we had a lot of input um, from parents with some emails from the separate public day schools because those were the first ones announced as impacted. And so we heard from those parents as well. Um, the um, the information that we see, received though was split uh, pretty evenly with parents that were wanted to make sure we had the right um, precautions in place, but also parents that um, recognized they were considering staying virtual. Um, and a little bit about the separate day school re-entry support. Um, we have implemented uh, school opening meetings 
they mirror meetings that we hold when we open a brand new school. The principal uh, lists um, concerns or questions they have around the reopening, and then staff with expertise from every area and within Baltimore County sit in those meetings and provide feedback to those principal requests and questions. In this iteration, all four principals are in, t in attendance. And again, staff from critical parts of the organization attend to provide directions and supports. Um, and the meetings are held with the facilities of each school by BCPS, TABCO, and ESPBC. We held those meetings last week in order to answer some uh, teacher and principal questions in person uh, and to, uh, to, to try to provide that in-person support. And again, those meetings were held uh, last Wednesday. Um, we started at about 11 in the morning and went till four in the afternoon. Each meeting lasted a, about an hour from the BCPS staff and then TABCO took over for an additional hour. Next slide, please. I think this is my final slide and just a little bit about the design team. Uh, because we've had many requests for more procedural documents to be published and uh, to be made available so that parents and teachers could make more informed decisions. The design team at this stage has um, broken off into work groups to create those protocols and uh, documents. And so the first one is around instructional delivery. And we really are just considering how can we best model and demonstrate how to instruct st students in school and those at home virtually. The pedagogy for teaching face-to-face uh, -face and for teaching virtually are slightly different, so we need to consider that as we try to best meet the needs for every child, no matter uh, what model their family picks. And then we have another group working on facilities and organization. That's about space planning and about um, the mediation um, and safety that's in place and uh, mitigation. And so they are working on those designs and protocols. And then we've heard quite a bit of feedback that we need to provide better and more communication. So there's a design team work group specifically uh, pro uh, working on that support. And I know Dr. Williams mentioned earlier, uh, specifically an update from a co-created -up co update from the design team and the COVID-19 task force in order to provide uh, the most up-to-date uh, information to our stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. And I believe I'm gonna turn this over. Yes, I'll take it from here, thank you. Uh, so good evening um, again. Um, as we discussed last uh, board meeting, our team was um, actively working to understand um, possibilities to um, open up for our uh, students who may need to take the SAT this year. Um, and we're pleased to say, as Ms. Causey shared earlier, that uh, we have um, worked through all of that, um, those details, and um, our facilities, a number of our facilities will be serving um, as national administration sites in partnership with the College Board. Um, it's important to uh, clarify registration is on the is through the College Board website, not the BCPS website. So this is a College Board administration, and all registration is managed through the College Board. So we're happy to, to share that news with you, as I know it's a priority. Um, if I could have next slide, please. Thank you. I'd also like to highlight two initiatives regarding uh, strengthening our programming and supports for. Uh, students um, receiving special education services. First, the Department of Special Education had developed a 30-day plan to provide guidance for special education teachers, related service providers, behavior support staff, and paraeducators um, in preparing for the supports and service provisions for our students with disabilities in this virtual setting. The 30-day plan provide recommendations for planning, preparation, and supports to assist with the return of students and families to schools. Many of the activities and strategies can be implemented throughout the school year. Information contained in the plan can be customized to meet the needs of our students or classes, and it provides information for the following professional groups, inclusion teachers, special education teachers, supporting students uh, in the general education setting, self-contained special education teachers, related service providers, um, and our behavior support um, um, 
professional, special education teachers, behavior support staff, paraeducators, and our birth to five service providers. Furthermore, to support this implementation of the support plan, we create job-alike communities of practice that meet weekly to provide just-in-time professional learning and to provide in-the-moment support via weekly Q&A sessions. This is a continuation extension of the supports we provide the staff since last spring, and feedback has been extremely positive so far from uh, professionals. In addition to the Department of Special Education, we've reorganized our supports to schools. Now, schools in each zone have a designated contact um, and staff to support the school with the implementation of special education programming in the domains noted on the slide, academics, related services, behavior, and social and emotional support. The behavioral and social and emotional supports will be provided in conjunction with staff from the Department of Social and Emotional Supports. We are thrilled to be poised to provide much needed and targeted support, needed support to our schools in order to enhance the quality of programming for students with disabilities. And if I could have the next slide, please. Um, as you're aware, BCPS is currently implementing our approved two semester plan that includes fall virtual coaching and engagement with a resumption of in-person competitive athletics during the second semester of the school year. Um, since the governor's announcement, um, 20, uh, approximately 22 um, out of 24 school systems um, have um, proposed um, a resumption of athletics earlier than um, February. And so uh, we wanted to share that we are one of the school systems that is supportive of that proposal. I want to um, just clarify that that is currently still in a proposal state that is being reviewed um, at the state level. So should that proposal be approved, uh, then we would adjust our timeline for the competitive season to be in alignment with that and the majority of the school systems. And you can see the adjustment would move the beginning of the um, competitive season up to December should it be approved, but it is not at this time approved. It's still in proposal um, state. Um, and that really concludes our update on athletics. And at this time, I will hand it over to, I believe, uh, Dr. Jones follows me. Thank you, Dr. Boswell McComas. This, e this evening, my community superintendent colleagues, Ms. Byers and Dr. Roberts and I will share information concerning school-based supports and work with staff in the community within our schools. We will begin with, the stu with student enrollment. Online and outdoor student enrollment and registration opportunities have been made available for BCPS families during the opening of schools. Virtually, parents and guardians have been able to access our BCPS website, which includes a homepage slider with information and access to our student registration and moving tips page. Student enrollment and registration information is also included online on the BCPS reopening page and parent university webpage. Registration information is available in 11 languages on our website and access to each language can be found on the homepage as well. Outdoor registration was a new option provided for BCPS families during the opening of schools and due to COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. Outdoor registration provided parents and caregivers with on-site school-based registration and enrollment supports. If community members would like to learn more about student registration or need to enroll a student, student please contact the school your child will be attending using our school directory or visit the About Us section of our BCPS website. Next, we'll look at student instructional materials. In preparation for the distribution of materials to students, the Division of Curriculum and Instruction provided principals with lists of materials that were required to be distributed to students. Those lists provided both elementary and secondary materials by subject and or grade level. Additionally, principals established between one and three dates for student instructional materials distribution. As leaders of their buildings, they were able to determine what was the best time and or time frame for their communities regarding when materials were distributed in accordance with CDC guidelines. A list of the dates and times of materials distribution was shared and communicated with families, and the dates were also shared with our Division of School Support and Achievement. Principals also have the flexibility to add distribution dates or schedule individual material pickup dates to align with the implementation of curriculum and the needs of students and families. 
Our Division of School Support and Achievement continues to collaborate with principals around the distribution of instructional materials in an effort to provide ongoing teaching and learning support to students, staff, and families within their school communities. I'll now turn it over to Ms. Byers. Can we go back one slide, please? Ms. Byers? Ms. Byers, if you're speaking, you're muted. So she may she may be having some technical um, difficulties. I can go ahead and pick this up as I have the the last section as well for support for seniors. So, good evening, board. Um, this section covers staff access. So, from the first day of school, schools have been open for staff on an as needed basis. Our administrative teams have provided coverage in our buildings in the event that a teacher, instructional staff member, or office staff need access to the building. Additionally, teachers have had the option to work from their classrooms. When staff teachers, no, excuse me, when staff teachers from or need access to the building, they work with our school leaders to ensure that all mitigation and social distancing practices are implemented when teaching from the classroom. Um, sorry. Social emotional supports. Our schools continue to ensure that our students and families have multiple levels of support to navigate virtual learning during an international pandemic. These supports are delivered in whole group, small group, and on an individual basis. And continuing with the theme of support, for support for our seniors, this year involves several components. As have already been shared by Dr. Boswell McCromas, staff are working on scheduling SAT test sites and have confirmed SAT test sites for the December administration to allow seniors the opportunity to take the exam as part of their college application process. In addition, our athletics program recommends the collaborative proposal for competitive seasons to begin in December to allow seniors an opportunity to conclude their high school careers by participating in their chosen sport. Virtual college fairs are being scheduled with many of our high schools participating and sharing registration information with all seniors through Schoology, School Messenger, and other school-to-home communication strategies. A particular highlight of our virtual college fair season is the virtual HBCU College Fair in November. This annual college fair is one of the largest HBCU college fairs in the area, which offers students on-the-spot admissions and scholarship opportunities for many of our BCPS seniors. Related to the college admissions process, each high school continues to utilize their counselors, and specifically their college counselors, to provide seniors with updated college materials, application information, deadlines, requirements, letters of recommendation, and other items to ensure seniors are as prepared as possible in this COVID area. Next slide, please. So at this time, this does conclude our uh, update on reopening. I hope tonight's presentation has provided board members with some answers to some of our frequently asked questions. And at this time, we'd be more than happy to take um, any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate that update. Ms. Mack? Yes, um, thank you very much for the update. Um, one of the themes that I keep hearing both when people knock on my door to tolerate me about their frustrations and when I'm walking is that people need a, a greater level of specificity in order to make decisions um, when decision time comes. For example, in the uh, re-entry plan, it says if schools are not able to provide consistent social distancing, personnel dividers, or countertop shields, will be purchased by the school from an approved vendor. In theory, that sounds like a reasonable accommodation, but so many of our schools are overcrowded. And in our elementary schools, many of our students don't even have individual desks. They sit at tables. So that's a that's type of specificity I'm being asked to ask you for. Like, how are we going to manage people walking in the hallways? Do we have an inventory of every one of our buildings and whether or not the HVAC filtration system meets the, the current guidelines? Um, I, I just think we need to take it down a level so that when the time comes and we're asking parents to commit to sending their kids back to school and then we're asking staff to come back to school, 
they have the information that they need to know that they're going to be safe. And I've looked through the plan. I don't see information that would give me that sense as a parent. And I'm wondering when we're going to get down to that level of specificity. Ms. Mack, thank you so much for that question. We hear the same kind of feedback that you're hearing. And I can tell you that uh, me and Dr. McComas and the three community superintendents met today twice in order to start um, creating those protocols and documents uh, that give that level of specificity. I wish I could give you an exact date that they'll be ready, but please know that we are working diligently on them and we are expediting as quickly as we can to finalize those documents so that we can get them before you and the community because we hear the same ask. Okay, and then um, I, just a very simple question. When will the board be provided with the survey results from the four separate day schools? I do not know the answer right. to that if there's someone else that on the line that does. So good evening, this is Dr. Weekly Phillip. Our team is in the process of collecting the data and analyzing the data and putting it together and we will share the information with Dr. Williams and he will make the determination. Okay, and then I have one final question. Um, I have a, a, not even a friend, a person that I see when I go to Sam's Club who happens to be a police officer and um, he stopped me last week and said, hey, I hear you guys are going back to school. And I said, yeah, our four day schools. And he said, no, all of your schools, our SROs have been told that school will start in November. Uh, obviously, I didn't know how to answer that, but he was very, I mean, he was, and I said, how would you know that? He said, because I work in headquarters. So I guess I'm asking, has any communication gone out to the police department to tell their SROs to be ready to go back to school in November. Ms. Mack, I'm, I'm unaware of any information like that that's been shared. I, I believe that that might be a rumor that's just gotten out of hand. Okay, and I, I mean, I even said that to him and he said, no, I know it. And I said, okay, well, I don't know it. So I just thought I'd ask here. Thank you very much. Okay, next up we have Dr. Hager, then Mr. Kuhn, and then Ms. Hen. Thank you for giving a presentation after midnight. I can't, I can't imagine how hard that was, but you guys did a great job. Um, could you go back to the flow chart uh, with the metrics guiding reopening that included the positivity rates? And th these slides are not available on board docs. It would be great to have, to have these. So this, um, I, we heard a lot in the public comment that it's really important to use science to guide the conversation, and I completely agree with that. And um, yet it was said that, you know, we've been hovering around this limited in-person limited in -person programming metric for weeks now, um, but it seems like the, the kind of, uh, the holdup is kind of what Ms. Mack was saying is around the facilities and the communication and the logistics. And so, um, I hear that you're working quickly to kind of identify these things, but is there a timeline? Because, you know, if we are there based on our scientific metrics that are predetermined and that's what we're using to guide our reopening, then all those other things really need to fall into place quickly in order to be able to, to use this metric to actually inform our reopening. So um, thank you, Dr. Hager, for that. Uh, so certainly it was used to guide the initial sub uh, um, student group that was identified, which was the four public separate day schools. Um, in our stakeholder meetings, we have been sharing uh, some information about additional uh, groups that would be brought back. And I don't think any of that's been a secret that it's uh, been focused on special education students because of their need. Um, an exact timeline I can't provide you with. Um, some of that is because it requires negotiation with uh, the bargaining units and the MOUs that were created. Some of it is related to the initial closing um, and the, the, the announced um, date of the end of the first term because that influenced the, the creation of the MOUs. And so those details all are being worked out with the bargaining units. Um, I, I'm hopeful that we will be able to share more explicit data with you the next time we meet with you. But 
Uh, right now, I don't have an exact timeline to share. Thank you. You're welcome. If I may just add to the questions, Dr. Hager, and, and also Ms. Matt, we, we still work and will continue to work with the Baltimore County Health Department. Um, when we are presenting plans, they're asking questions, mitigating, mitigating stra mitigation strategies, um, uh, messaging, uh, signage. Uh, it is after midnight, so I just yeah. lost the word signage and all just to ensure um, that we are prepared uh, when we do this gradual um, return of staff and, and, and students. And so what Mr. Burke was describing is that we use this metrics, but we also have to look at um, the actual facilities and in, in the presentation you heard him describe that they're they're using a process that the system has used related to opening up a new school to look at um, as we move to bringing back staff and students so not only do we work with the unions I want to go back we, we 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 first work with the health department to look at what are those um, strategies, feedback, questions that they may raise uh, for us to, to, to prepare for bringing back staff and students. Uh, so that collaboration is ongoing um, to develop some kind of plan as we're looking at small groups of students and staff returning. Um, so, and to the point, it is a, a quick turnaround um, we, we, as Mr. Burke said, we, it, it's no secret, we wanted to look at our students who are receiving special ed services. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And Mr. Kuhn, you're up. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Thank you for this presentation. Um, it's very appreciated. Um, Dr. Jones, uh, could we look at the slide that you were discussing? Uh, I believe it was like second to the last or? Sure. There you go. All right. Mm -hmm. So um, you talked about the process for uh, handing resources out and student instructional materials. And uh, you said that there were multiple days that each school was making it available. Um, I guess part of my question, or I'm just going to get right to it. Books are not being handed out at schools that I'm very um, closely acquainted with. So my question is, what was the guidance given to the principals and the teachers based on what physical books, not e-books? I don't want to hear about e-books. They're available. I understand that. But I would like to know what guidance was given regarding paper books to be handed out in secondary schools. So the, the guidance that was given out to elementary and secondary schools, but your question is around secondary, was provided by curriculum and instruction. A list was provided regarding the materials that should be that should be handed out. What school leaders did have the flexibility to do in service of their communities, and based on the um, based on the teachers of record, they had the opportunity to make school specific de decisions around the e-books versus the novels versus the textbooks. However, schools have been instructed and should be working with communities to provide whatever format or platform the student needs and or wants to best receive the instruction based on the, based on the materials. So I guess, my, I guess my response to you is that um, there was flexibility provided around the ebook versus the novel versus the textbook, however, We've had several parents and families ask for one over the other, and that's when schools have been directed to respond to those to those families those families' needs. 
All right, thank you. I appreciate that. I understand <laughs> flexibility. I I support flexibility, um, but I believe that resources and specifically um, paper textbooks and novels need to be distributed to students so that they can read them. Yes, um, and I and I agree with you too. And so I guess what I would say, Mr. Um, Kuhn, and I know we've um, we've reached out to the community superintendents and I have reached out to all of our schools in our areas to make sure that if that is something that has not been done um, in a specific school, we can kind of find out from you where we need to address those issues. But then also we did go back to make sure and or confirm that um, your concerns around novels and textbooks um, have been have been addressed to meet the needs of our our students and our communities. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, my next questions uh, are regarding uh, athletics. If we could go back to that slide, I think Ms. McComas, you spoke to that. Yes. So um, time is flying by. Um, the <laughs> the fall season is is getting uh, shorter and shorter. Um, if if there is even going to be a fall season, and um, based on what the governor said and the uh, superintendent of the state superintendent, uh, they discussed uh, October seventh is the first day that um, high schools in Maryland could have practice, and. Um, so that was about a week ago, and there's no practice underway. Um, so, so we know that we didn't hit that date. Um, and my question um, is: you, you mentioned that there was a plan that was being that was set up for review. And um, I guess my question is: is what does the plan say? Like, when would we? When would we possibly start? Um, at least practice for athletes. Um, and if there is no practice or anything that's going to happen in the fall, just, you know, state that at this point so we can just move on. Well, thank you, Mr. Kuhn, uh, for the opportunity to provide clarity. So um, first and foremost, the proposal was um, moved forward um, and supported by 22 out of the 24 school systems. Now, the proposal uh, proposes beginning the competitive season, so the winter sports season um, for students um, in December. And so the first practice under the proposal would begin December 7th. Um, and the last, um, the first play date um, would begin January 4th, and the last play date would be February 13th. Um, and then again, the fall competitive season would be run February through April. Um, and then the spring would run April through June. So that is um, a, a proposed adjustment to the original two semester plan. So that's part of my answer for you. Now I know your other part is during the fall semester where we are currently doing virtual coaching, you're looking for an opportunity for students to do in-person um, conditioning, if you will. That is um, something that the Return to Play Committee is continuing to examine in, in a back and forth process, getting feedback from the health department around how are we able to do that um, and make sure that we have all the detailed processes and protocols in place so that if we were able to provide in-person conditioning as part of the fall semester, um, having all those details, just as Ms. Mack asked earlier around, people really want the details and that we need to um, work in collaboration with the health department to ensure um, that all those um, processes, protocols would be in place and that families have opportunity to complete any physicals that they need to get um, completed in order to do um, any type of in-person conditioning. So I, I understand, Mr. Kuhn, that you're um, you know, um, advocating for us to get to the in-person conditioning as soon as possible. So the return to sports committee, is that, is that what it's The return called? to play committee, yes. The return to play committee. So the, re so the return to play committee 
is still pondering how to start practice in the fall. Um, and I, I, so we had this conversation at the last meeting and I was concerned then, and I discussed, you know, um, <laughs> the need to possibly pass a motion at that moment in time to set a time frame for decisioning. So there's, you know, this happens in sports. You, you run out the clock. So I, I guess my question is, this committee is just going to run the clock out on the fall season and the ability to do any training in the fall uh, while we have semi-decent weather to be outside where we have reduced um, uh, chance of um, uh, sharing uh, this this virus that's shut things down for us. So I guess my, my question is, and, and I'll ask it again, what is the deadline for the return to play committee to make a decision on fall training, in-person fall training, because we're rapidly losing time. Mr. Kuhn, let me let me just Daryl Williams, let me just jump in. So um, the return to play com committee is looking at some possibilities, um, but what we do know, this is what we do know. Um, Obviously, Baltimore County and other districts, other school systems would n were not prepared to meet that October 7th timeframe. What we do know is that um, we submitted our original plan that was approved for the two semester plan to MPSSAA, that's the Maryland Public Schools Sports Association. And I probably forgot another, act, another letter. Um, Based on the feedback from our athletic directors, based on the feedback from the majority of the Maryland school systems, there was an alternative, which actually several board members, including yourself, raised about the original plan was to start winter in January. And as you pointed out, there was some overlapping of the seasons. So based on the feedback, from the majority of the Maryland school systems, specifically our athletic supervisor and talking with the athletic directors. There was a second proposal made um, about looking at the window to begin earlier instead of January to begin in December. Um, and to continue what we have in place now with the fall virtual coaching and engagement program. So what you see on the screen is what we are currently doing on the left and what the right is the proposed uh, proposal made to Dr. Salmon and, and the MPSSAA. In addition, based on feedback, um, based on collaboration with other school systems, there's this desire to explore what might we do um, be before the December timeframe, if approved, we're still waiting to hear if that is going to be approved. Um, and so that's what, just like everything else, as we're trying to bring back students, small groups of students uh, for instruction, um, the committee, along with the health departments, looking at those mitigation strategies, talking about cohorting kids coming together and staying together and all the, all the safety precautionary measures to see if, if we can start some kind of conditioning in person um, once we hear from MPSSA about the approval of, of the approval of this proposal starting in December. And so uh, at this point, no one's trying to run out the clock, um, but what we have to do and will constantly do is all plans are being vetted, all ideas are being vetted uh, with the health department to get that feedback um, to, to look at what we can do. And then we have to work with our coaches and our administrators. We got to communicate. We got to work with our students and families. So that's where we are at this point when it comes to athletics. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, I, I don't want you to think that I believe your team is trying to run out the clock. I, I, I was just pointing out the fact that we are running out of time and we need to set a deadline and then just focus on other things. 
um, if the decision is already made um, or if you'll have a decision by Friday to say yay or nay on any fall in-person, you know, uh, activity, um, even if it's just, you know, any kind of conditioning with the team, um, I suggest the sooner we make that decision and then put it to bed, the better. And then we move on with everything else we have on our plate because I know that there's a lot outstanding and and um, uh, we're rapidly um, going to be out of time to do anything at this point, especially with the weather turning. So my next question has to do with SAT day or not even SAT day, but SATs. Uh, could we please go to that slide? Um, I understand that it's December 5th, um, and I have a few questions around that because I know that um, we're, we're making our sites available to have testing. Hopefully, um, our students will be taking advantage of that. And um, unfortunately, stakeholder um, people that are applying to college, uh, there's a lot of early action deadlines. Uh, the first one that I know of, which is Thursday, uh, now, oh, it, it's a day away since it's now the 14th, um, uh, is, is already upon us. So seniors uh, that are in a situation where they are applying early action for multiple reasons um, are, are not gonna be able to take advantage of, of these SAT tests. Um, I believe there might be some time you know, still available for seniors if they um, have applications due in uh, January, um, maybe February is the latest. I, I don't think it goes too far beyond that. So I would like to say thank you for making um, SATs available in our facilities um, for, for students. Uh, the question that I would have to, to your staff is, um, are we going to be able to prioritize uh, segments of our students that really need to take the SAT uh, in December um, over other students? So for instance, I know that, um, that seniors uh, still have a shot to take this before and, and have at least a score before uh, applying regular decision. I'm hopeful that that's the timing we're looking at here. It's cutting it close, but I'm hopeful that it's the timing. But those seniors are the ones that should have um, um, access to these tests, especially because we're, we're hopefully involved in the planning of them. Is that, and, and I know that you said that the college board is running them because they, they run the whole thing. Um, are we going to be able to provide that support for our seniors that still want to take the SAT? So for the national, thank you, Mr. Kuhn, for that question. Um, for the national administrations, we do not have any gatekeeping um, um, opportunity. Uh, all of that in its entirety is managed through the college board. All right, thanks. Mm-hmm. Unfortunate, but thank you. You're welcome. So um, before we move to uh, Ms. Hen, I wanted to dovetail uh, with Mr. Kuhn's comments and questions, and, and um, I believe it was uh, Dr. Wheatley Phillips around <clears throat> textbooks being distributed, or actually, was that uh, Dr. Jones? Is Dr. Jones yes. still available? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right here. Thank you. So we, we've heard parents very, very concerned about screen time. And we've heard um, that you're saying that you're giving the student, the schools new advice. So I, I just wanna be clear, how will parents know that textbooks are available when they have not previously been available? And how does the principals and uh, know that they will have funding to purchase additional books if they need them? So um, thank you, Ms. Causey, for that question. I, I can answer the first question, I think, in terms of just what we discussed as a division of school support and achievement based on information we've received regarding the distribution of student instructional materials. What we have asked um, schools to, again, confirm is um, 
what type of flexibility they did provide to their schools. And then in cases where the actual novels and or textbooks were um, flexibly provided or provided in a way based on uh, based on choice, we've asked schools to go back and um, rethink those plans and propose additional dates where their communities will be informed about distribution around those um, items of needs for students. So just as was done previously when they submitted their one or two or three dates, and I think you had an opportunity to even visit one of the schools either doing materials distribution or something like that in our West Zone, that same process will be applied now that we are hearing back from um, you all members of the board and the community who are concerned about not receiving materials, we'll just follow that same process of communicating either through school messenger, through newsletters, through things like that, so that parents will be aware of the availability of those items in the schools that actually have that concern, because some of our schools um, are not presented with that concern at this time. In terms of the second question in textbooks, um, our Division of School Support and Achievement, um, we're not able to answer that question. So I don't know if someone else from the team wants to speak to um, textbooks and funding around those items. Sure, I can um, I can contribute here. So in working with the DSSA team and principals, if there is a case where a principal um, needs support, they would work with us and we would try to coordinate that support. Uh, so we would work through that. So here's an example. Uh, let's say a high school sends out an email in August when not everyone's paying attention and says, we have limited number of math textbooks. If you think your student needs a math textbook in addition to what's uh, digital on the laptop, then email back as soon as you can. So what is the process for parents who never knew that was an opportunity, who tried to get it, but they there weren't enough to go around, and, and how does the principal know that he's gonna have funding and support for procurement? Because, you know, we th this is not, it's a, it's a very important issue. People don't know to ask for what they don't know is available to them. And how can the principals try and provide something that they don't know if they can have funding for? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to end a sentence on a preposition for all of our um, literacy folks out there. <laughs> We forgive many things at quarter to one in the morning. Um, so I will share, Ms. Causey, thank you for the question, because really in that uh, example that you shared, uh, what we would ask is that if the principal has exhausted their supply, um, then they need to reach out to our content offices for that particular content. And then we will work to, to understand what is the, the need, what is the volume? Um, is it such that perhaps we have um, some access to books perhaps in a school that um, we can use them temporarily and then we as the office can perhaps help uh, by replenishments um, or we as an office um, may be able to help support that in the process. Um, I think it's important just to assure you that the principal needs to, um, the principal does have a network of support within the school system um, and that network of support of course always can begin with their a DSSA team and or our content teams as well. So the principals are not left alone in that process. Uh, typically what happens across the system, just so that you understand sort of the uh, typical process, let's take bridges for example, I know that's an elementary example. Um, when we as a system adopt a new textbook series, we in the central office do that initial purchase as you're aware because we've been walking through that process we do that initial purchase for the system and then typically principals budgets um, by replenishment um, so if you know, you have some books that don't come back for whatever reason and you need to buy a, a few each year to replenish that uh, that's typically where those budgets get married to provide uh, the supports but uh, the content offices always stand in reserve, ready to work and support um, in in a multitude of ways to help principals. So I hope I answered your question and also provide you sort of some larger context of what the typical yes. process so, is. So for instance, the bulletins that go out to the principals. So there will be a bulletin that goes out to principals. It says, even if you've run out of textbooks, we've heard from parents, and so here's a new process. That, that That's what we as the board want to know. 
We want to know that the people that so need Ms. information Causey, to provide Ms. services to students yes. are going to get that. Yes, thank you, Ms. Causey. The community superintendents send out weekly updates to principals, and we appreciate that feedback. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Um, I'd say good evening, but good morning <laughs> at this late hour, and, and thank you for sticking with us. Um, I wanted to, to comment. My, my biggest concern since schools closed in March has been our students' mental health, um, and I've been most pleased with our commitment to school-based social-emotional supports and the work that's gone into providing that. It's something I hear about quite regularly, um, anecdotally, it's something I hear about as a mom from my own daughter, and it's something I appreciate. So I first wanted to express my appreciation for the work that's gone into that and in supporting our students. Um, I, I did want to ask, however, and what I was concerned to learn recently is that some of our school's allocations for a very important social-emotional support, and that is our student activities and clubs, that our school's funding allocations for these clubs um, was recently reduced. And I'd like to know when were the affected schools notified? And more importantly, when were parents notified that their students would not have access to these opportunities, which are so um, vitally important, especially during virtual learning? So, Ms. Hen, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, attempt to address that for you. So, good evening, Ms. Hen and, and board members. Um, so, and with respect to it, I'm, and please, you may have to restate part of the question. I think I heard two or three parts to the question, Mrs. Hen. So, principals were notified if we're into October, approximately uh, about a month, month and a half ago, that um, in order to adhere to our budget, so certainly in in, in these times of, of uh, what COVID has done to fiscal realities. To adhere to our budget, we needed to make sure that um, that schools had resources to support their EDA. But in these times, we had to make sure we adhere to our budget. So schools were provided an, an allocation within the budget that is built within the FY21 budget. So because of that, um, I think what you may be hearing is not a cut but a prioritization that schools have to and have been going through. So every year a school does go through prioritization of their EDAs based on the school, the system vision, the school's vision, the SPP. Um, I certainly want to address that part about not being able to offer certain um, EDA. So what we're doing, um, Dr. Jones and Mrs. Byers and I, is as schools are in the process now of submitting their EDA, um, we are already receiving schools that have unallocated funds. Um, so based on that, what we're going to do is once we receive all of our schools submitted EDA, um, what we are seeing early on with the early submission of those is that we are going to have unallocated funds that within our zones, we're going to go back um, to schools, to our small schools, to um, our, in my case, the special schools or, or alternative schools or um, um, other schools similar to that, and go back to that principal to backfill those EDAs. So we agree with you 100% that EDAs, particularly many of our EDAs and ones that are tied to our curriculum program to, our, to within CNI, are important and are valuable. So that is part of the process. So I think that is something that we will continue to reinforce with our principals. And as they submit their EDAs, we're going to continually look at that and manage those funds. So then we can go back and make sure that we maximize the allocation in the approved in the approved budget. Um, so that's that's where we stand right now with with EDA. So thank you, Dr. Roberts. And it's my understanding that some schools allocations were reduced initially, and I understand what you're saying about backfilling, but initially were reduced as much as 50%, which can be substantial. So do you estimate that you'll be able to come close to backfilling that and making them whole? Um, or can you comment on that? Right. So I, I, again, I, I don't want to, I, I wouldn't phrase it as a re as a reduction, okay, we're adhering to our budget. We have to adhere to our budget at all times. So it's a matter of if a school has met their allocation um, to stay within our larger budget, within our zone and within the entire system, then yes, we're going to go back and do, the, do our level best to make sure that we can backfill um, with principals 
Um, again, starting with, and this was shared with principals, starting with our smaller schools, our small elementary, small middle, small high schools, our special programs, um, and then move from there. Can you comment on the rationale for um, why that allocation was, and it was in fact reduced at the school level, although I understand it was not reduced um, in the budget overall, why that was reduced this year? That, I don't think I can speak to again. We're just, we're adhering to within our budget. So again, it's, a, it, it's not a matter of reduction. It's a matter of staying within our allocated budget. Um, and I think that part of the information that was shared with the board in terms of where that lives within the FY21 budget um, was shared. So I, I certainly can defer to Mr. Saris if he had any other information to offer. But again, we're, we're looking at it from a perspective and working with principals as working within the approved budget, um, not the necessarily reduction of. So is, is Mr. Saris available? Or maybe this is a question for Dr. Williams then. Uh, this is George Saris. Um, the, so I believe the communication that we provided indicated that in FY20, the system went significantly over budget. And so there's no way to correct that without some schools uh, having uh, to to reduce the amount of assignment of EDAs that they can assign. Yes, but it's my understanding that they were reduced significantly more than the um, than we went over budget. In fact, no. the well, reporting that their allocations were reduced fifty percent, which was not. Um, we well, we'd have to look at a specific example, but the way that this was done was we uh, we created a uh, an average for a small school and a large school at each level, and we apportioned the available budget accordingly. So it was as equitable as we could make it with the underlying assumption that there will be fewer EDAs because we are going to adhere to the budget. Okay, thank you for that information, Mr. Saris. Sure. Um, and this question is for Dr. Roberts then. Um, do we have any idea of the student impact and what communication was sent to families to let them know that they may need to provide their own opportunities for students who would not have access to these opportunities as a result of this reallocation. Right. So at this point, Ms. Hennett, as I mentioned, we're still in the process. Principals have a deadline, I believe, of next week. I want to say October 22nd, October 23rd. To We wanted to give them ample time to have these discussions with their staff. Um, again, with their aligned to their SPP. So they're going to be, we're in the, almost in the middle of the process of them submitting. So we're not at a point where that can be, uh, that question could be addressed. I, once we receive EDAs and once we see where principals have um, chosen to allocate in working with their staff of those EDAs, I, I don't know if I'm in a position to say we're necessarily agree with that students wouldn't be able to offer because obviously every school has different offerings, right? So um, what's offered in one school just may not be offered in a school because student interest isn't there for that particular EDA or that particular club. So again, without knowing a specific example or a specific school, certainly we'll work with principals. And, and, and if that question is raised by a parent of a particular school, then certainly we'll work with our team works with the principal um, in order to to address that. And we also have another part is our non-negotiated EDAs, um, which come from our school-based budget. So anything that's not already apportioned in regular EDAs that are supported by the school system, what Mr. Saris was referring to, schools have for non-negotiated items or clubs that aren't listed in the TAPCO master agreement. Um, schools certainly continue to have that option to fund those from their respective budgets. So again, depending on the activity, depending on the club, depending if it's negotiated, non-negotiated, there's certainly many nuances to the EDA process and the non-negotiated EDA process that principals manage um, on a yearly basis. 
And I know that school budgets are stretched thin as is. And so I'm sorry, um, Ms. Let me just I'll, 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 I'll finish. I'll wrap up um, to Dr. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to add to what Dr. Roberts was saying. I just want to just highlight what he just shared. Schools are just in the process as um, in finalizing the EDAs, and and again, we're we're in a unique situation. So, you know, I just want to emphasize that you know we just started this process. We're starting to look at what schools are requesting, and as Dr. Roberts shared, as well as the other community superintendents, they will be monitoring and see what's not being used, what can be reallocated. So we're we're kind of early in this process. Which is um, um, which is expected during the circumstances. So, Ms. Hen, if you're finished, we can uh, move on to Ms. Scott, and then Ms. Joes and Ms. Pasteur. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Um, and I apologize for speaking slow because it is. Um, quite late. I'm sorry, um, Scott, I was muted. Uh, but I wanted to um, speak basically in regards to um, some things that were brought up, which I think are pertinent. Um, I know I spoke about this at the last board meeting, but I was, I wanted to know again, the device ratio currently right now is um, five to one for grades K through eight. And we're talking about schools reopening and kids going back into schools. And I wanted to know, this board uh, 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 made a motion or directed the previous superintendent um, to, to put the device ratio to where it is now, but right now, excuse me, to where it is five to one um, for certain grades. But right now, because of the emergency situation, um, most of our, if not all of our students are one to one. And I want to know what that is going to look like or is that something, because I didn't see it as we go into our reentry plan, the students go back, will the students that are now being acclimated and, and, and using their devices and becoming accustomed to one-to-one, -one, will that then be reduced to five-to-one? Hello? Ms. Scott. Um... <laughs> Oh, okay. I don't, I don't know what happened, but um, right now that is n not the plan. Um, when you say go back, um, it we could still we could be still virtual. We could be hybrid um, model, or we could be all back into the school building. So um, we would be adjusting, but I don't. In terms of what we're doing now and what we provided our students, I don't see us then taking something back or, just, or allow, just simply allowing our students to use it as a resource. Well, I guess my question is, is that, I mean, it was a motion and it was something that's currently that this board put in place. Actually, and excuse me, Ms. Scott, I think I, I need to clarify again I need to clarify this because um, this has been stated multiple times and it's it's just not accurate. In February of 2019, mm -hmm. this board voted and approved the budget that was recommended by the interim superintendent. And the county executive cut additional funding, which cut the device ratio. And then in February of 2019, our new superintendent, Dr. Williams, set forward a recommendation for a device ratio. And this board supported Dr. Williams in that device ratio, and the county funded that. So that's how we got where we are today. And in the interest of time, we are talking about reopening of school, things that are happening right now for our students. And um, I can understand your concern about wanting to make sure that all of our children have resources as we move into the recovery phase. Um, and certainly, Dr. Williams and his team will evaluate that as we had discussed before. So if yes. you can move to a new item, then that no, would be- No, excuse me, excuse me, um, Ms. Causey, I do have to take issue with that because 
Um, I didn't hear you come in and interrupt anyone else in a multitude of questions that went on for 30 minutes. I'm a member of this board, as is everyone else. And, yes, you are, Ms. Um, Scott, I do and not I just need to correct. I do not interrupt members, and I do not I just appreciate to being interrupted. That but I do not hear you correcting because... anyone else. I do not hear you correcting anyone else. I do not interrupt you. I do not interrupt members, and I do not expect to be interrupted, as I am a member of this board, as are all other members of this board. And I will take the appropriate time necessary to ask any question and to require clarification on any question of which I have. I asked this at a previous board meeting, and I asked it again at this board meeting. And I will ask it as many times as necessary. And I do not expect to be interrupted as other members who asked a multitude of questions were not interrupted. So I find it very offensive that I am interrupted and that I am reminded in the interest of time when we are at a board meeting at 104 in the morning and I am doing my duty and my due diligence to ask questions to get clarification. So I do recognize that I did ask it before and I wanted to ask it again. And I wanna make sure that our students have the proper resources that they need so that they can succeed. But I do not expect to be interrupted. Excuse me, Ms. Scott, and I'm sorry for, excuse me, Ms. Scott. You take you the time to me again. I just said I do I'm, not expect to be interrupted. Now I'm finished. Thank you. Next up, we have Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Pastor, I didn't know if you were going to talk to this, mo to this, but I was going to make a motion to move item P2 to the next board meeting in interest of time. It's past 1 o'clock. All of us have to work tomorrow. And I am even... speaking to this. Okay. Okay. So um, do you mind? Okay, I'll make the motion after you're done. Thank you. Uh, I would like to um, thank you, Ms. Joes. I, I believe I was after Ms. Joes. Um, yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so thank you, Ms. Joes, for ceding your time to me. Um, I just want to reiterate the the conversation about EDA. I need to put it out there because I've received so many emails um, from people in my area and other areas, just as I'm sure some of you have, but I've received a number um, from people on this side of the county. And I just want to say for the record and make sure that as we are moving along that uh, the EDAs are given the kind of, of respect, if you will, because our children have already lost so much. And if we're talking about social welfare, they certainly need this. And as two of my constituents have pointed out, their children who never participated in anything because they never they just didn't feel welcomed in one case and in the other it was a matter of transportation while we're on a virtual mode they were looking forward to some of the activities in their schools and i have heard also from two schools um where they felt they were going to have to take a look at um uh it's one thing about uh, the amount of time i just want to make sure that Staff members understand that you are not cutting EDAs, that these opportunities are still out there for children because, again, they've lost so much. And those some children who have not ever participated now feel more need and more comfortable to do it. And we must give them, we must give them this. Thank you. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ms. Pester, for that comment. Um, I was in the middle of or about to make a motion when I was muted previously. So I would like to finish um, on that note. And in order to ensure that no student 
loses the opportunity to safely participate in activities during virtual learning due to lack of funding. I move that the board direct the superintendent to restore each school's funding allocations for extra duty activities for the 2020-2021 school year to the school's prior year's allocated amounts or greater. Second so moved. Uh, I, excuse me, who was the second? Lily Rowe. Lily Rowe. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hen, I think you've spoken to your motion. Uh, do you just have anything quickly to say? No, I've spoken to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other board members, in the interest of time, um, if you have discussion, uh, just please make it brief. Miss oh. um, Causey? Yes. I would just like to call everybody's attention to one of the public comments um, that is attached to board documents that speaks very eloquently to the impact of not having fully funded EDAs. It's there for people to read. I don't need to spend time going over it, but it is very eloquent and it, I think it encapsulates all of the conversation we've had here tonight. Okay, any other discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Um, can I hear it repeated, please? Sure. To ensure that no student loses the opportunity to safely participate in activities during virtual learning due to lack of funding, I move that the board direct the superintendent to restore each school's funding allocations for extra duty activities for the 2020-2021 school year to the school's prior year's allocated amounts or greater. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Rao? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for um, having that important discussion. Um, we're going to move to item 02, which was added earlier, which is the board's consideration of the amended resolution on COVID-19. And it's uh, a minor mo modification of the resolution on COVID-19 that was passed by this board in March of 2020. And what the changes does is it allows for the board uh, through the board chair, the vice chair, and the superintendent uh, to call hybrid meetings so that board members that are uh, able to meet in person uh, can and that board members that have um, issues or concerns where they want to remain uh, attending virtually that they can. And again, this is a measure related solely to COVID-19. The Board of Education, through the Policy Review Committee, is revising policies 8314 and 8311. And given our experience with the pandemic, um, we are revising it to um, potentially have, not potentially, but to have board members able uh, in, in specific cases to attend remotely. So again, um, this, uh, document was attached to board docs. Um, so I'm going to ask for a motion for the board to approve the amended resolution on COVID-19. Ms. Causey, I had my, I had a motion prior to this. I, I gave my time to Ms. Pasture. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that you like gave it away to her. Um, so I have a motion. If I have a second, we can just process this and then we will come right back to you. Is 
Mr. McMillian still on? Okay. So I'll make the motion. And is there a second? Second. That. Second. I'm sorry, who is that? I, I said it first, Rod McMillian, I think. Oh, we didn't hear you. Okay, you're the motion. And then who's the second? This is Aaron Hager, I'll second. Thank you. Uh, board member, are there any questions or discussion before we take the roll call vote? Hearing none, Ms. Gover. Ms. Causey, I do have questions. This resolution was sent to us today around two. I didn't get a chance to look at it until um, at six. So because of, of the lack of time I've had to look into it and it's gonna have long-term repercussions, I'm gonna abstain on this motion. My motion was going to be to postpone this item and the other item for next board meeting. Um, okay, well, we have a motion and we have a second and certainly each board member needs to vote according to their uh, comfort with their preparation. So thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, uh, please? I, I still have. Can you hear me? Mr. Mahamza? Yeah, um, Did, there's one thing I'm not, I'm still not sure about was the fact, um, would the board individual, would the board re receive the plan that Dr. William, Williams comes up with, with all the safety precautions, uh, all the safety precautions put in place, or uh, we, do we not get to see that plan before? Yes, so uh, part of the consideration is Dr. Williams working with the health department and with his staff to develop the safety protocols that are necessary. And so board members would see those safety protocols uh, before they made a decision of whether they wanted to attend in person. Okay, and that answers my question from earlier. Yes, so in that regard, we're very similar to the teachers and the parents. We're, we're doing the same thing, moving side by side. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Anyone else? All right, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Q? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Of Spain. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion. Thank you. The motion carries. And uh, Ms. Joes, you had your uh, hand up. Do you still have your hand up? Yes, I do. I have a motion. I move in interest of time. I move um, items P to the next board meeting. Second, Mac. Is there a next session? <laughs> well, I'm conducting. Um, is there any discussion? Okay, then. Tomorrow. We, we did have one item, um, Miss Hen, uh, consideration of budget committee. It's very so, brief. If so, I, I would I time. would make an amendment to Miss Joe's motion that we would um, accept for P2, which we would hear. Not yet. Is there a um, second for my amendment to the motion? Wait. I don't accept that amendment. I have a question, sorry. Starting a committee is not just something you do at 1.30 at night. So I made a motion to amend. Is second. there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Um, My comment is that we've discussed it previously, so it shouldn't require further discussion. Okay, thank you. And then, Mr. Mahamza, you had a question? Wait, so is your amendment to override so, this, uh, is this Joseph's a motion or amend? No, my amendment is that her motion is to move item P to the next meeting. Okay. My amendment to her motion is except for item P2, which we would hear tonight. Okay. I thought it was P2. 
Yeah. Is the board council still here? I'd like legal advice because I do not accept this motion. So how does that get, oh, does that so have Mr. to be voted Mercedes, on first? Would you like to um, answer Ms. Joe's question? Yes. yes. Good morning, Ms. Joe's. Uh, Good morning to you. Uh, it, it doesn't strike me as improper for there to be an amendment to, to the motion that relates to your motion. Okay, thank you. So, so we'll continue we'll processing. The um, vote now is to motion the amendment, but not on my motion, correct? Correct. We're going to take a motion. We're going to take. Okay. No. Uh, if there's no discussion, no further discussion, Ms. Gover, can you take a roll call vote on amending my amendment to the motion, which would allow consideration of a budget committee item P2 to move forward this evening? Dr. Hager? No. Yes. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Mr. Mahamza? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Ms. Rowe? I think Ms. Rowe's trying to get in. It looks like her number showed up as trying to call in. Ms. Gober, what is the vote tally? Seven against. Um, currently, it's four in favor. Ms. Rowe would be five if she voted in favor. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that, that motion fails. So uh, the motion on the floor is to move item P, board committee updates to the next meeting. Is there any further discussion? Ms. Causey, wouldn't we be moving? One and two. One and two? Correct. It's the, it's the entire item P1 and P2. Yes. Yes. Can we vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Past Chair? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is item Q, board member comments. And um, Ms. Causey, so you, you had already postponed that item. Oh, thank you. Okay, so the last item on the agenda is five minutes of going around the dais and people can take uh, less than 30 seconds each if we're gonna be equitable to um, recommend an agenda item to be considered by the superintendent and the board chair and the vice chair. So um, this is Aaron. If I'm first, I do not have anything to add. Thank you. We can just go around the dais, please. Hi, this is Russ Kuhn. Uh, two things I'd like to talk about. I would like to talk about purchasing of physical textbooks. And the other thing I would like to talk about is sustainability. What is it in BCPS? What does our sustainability group do? And what plans do we have to move uh, our organization in a sustainable direction? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pasture? Mr. Offerman? Yes, I'd like to uh, discuss that there are potentially alternate ways to handle 
uh, to handle uh, all these board matters because it seems like when we do two meetings a month, we end up going past 12 o'clock, or in this case, we're going past uh, we're going past one uh, one 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 thirty, and I don't think that's appropriate. We expect the public, if they're following this, to, to, to be able to stay up the uh, all, all to stay up all this time. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, um, I look forward to seeing uh, or hearing uh, the presentation from the chief of school and climate safety, uh, uh, especially on uh, things related to mental health and um, just uh, safety in general. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Thank you. Um, a reopening update slash discussion and the National Schools COVID dashboard. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Yeah, so I'd like to add um, a brief presentation by the Office of Internal Audit on what the Office of Internal Audit does to the full board by the Chief Auditor. Mr. McMillian? No, thank you. Ms. Mack? I'd like to add an overview of the student counts process, uh, the timeline, the changes in data due to post 930 registrations, ECPS constraints, ECPS and county interactions by process, and by exception, and any planned improvements in the process. Okay. Uh, Ms. Scott? Uh, yes. Um, I believe mine was already. Um, uh, spoken to earlier, but that uh, the report um, from Dr. Williams on the plan to address the higher rate of black students with disabilities and IEPs being suspended or expelled at a higher suspension rate. So I look forward to, to that being added to the agenda. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Uh, is Ms. Rowe still with us? She seemed to try to call back in, but I don't know what happened. Okay. Well, Ms. Um, Causey. Yes, Ms. Pesture. I'm sorry. Um, a little fried brain. Uh, but I do want to reiterate what Ms. Joe's asked. Um, I did ask for it earlier after Ms. Barr's presentation. I too would like to know more about what the Office of Internal Auditing does. Thank you. Certainly. And I know Ms. Rowe had um, quite a bit to say about in her committee update, but we'll hear that. Uh, we'll hear that the next time. Okay. So all of those Ms. items. Causey. Oh, there she is. Sorry. Yes. It, it let me back in finally. I would just like to add to the um, agenda consideration, the prospect of having more than two meetings a month, because some of us have been here since 3.30 in the afternoon without even a full 15 minute break. So we haven't had like the half hour dinner break we usually have. And I just think that it's it's not appropriate to ask everyone to come in and sit on full attention mode from 3.30 in the afternoon until 1.30 in the morning. And if we're gonna do this every two weeks, we need to do half of this every week. So I, wholeheartedly agree that there needs to be an evaluation of how the board meetings are conducted. We have um, Robert's rules and not everyone wants to comply and we have a set agenda and people want to make changes uh, without enough information and it takes a while to do that. So yes, that would be great. So um, Ms. Gover, if you've um, tracked all of those items, they can be considered when uh, Dr. Williams has his next agenda planning uh, meeting. So the next uh, item is information. The Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting minutes are attached to board docs. And the uh, final thing is the announcements. The next board meeting is Tuesday, October 27th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you very much, everybody. Very important topics to cover. Everybody take care and stay safe. This